Well, the first day of our new studio, which is located in the affectionately named Eve TV Wood, I said it would have a wood in it, so there you go. I'm sitting here uh, joined by three player commentators that flew all the way to Iceland to talk about spaceships with us uh, for you. And uh, let's just go from closest to furthest to introduce you guys. Apothni, welcome. Sir Squeebles, Hello. first time for many people to see you. Yes. And returning to us is Bacchanalian. Hello. Welcome <laughs> back, everybody, uh, from your tiny little uh, Skype screen that we decided <laughs> to let you out of. Right. And I mean, how do you like it so far? What do you think about our new studio? It's uh, awesome. Yeah, it is very, very cool, very high tech. I, I like it. I think I like it better than last year. So yeah. definitely. Yeah. 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 As, yeah. A veteran, as, as a veteran, as an upgrade. Yeah. As yeah. a veteran for these <laughs> newer people here, you can tell them about the horrific oh, circumstances. The terrible conditions of last year. Terrible conditions. <laughs> <still. laughs> it's all you talked about in Skype forever, and yes. now we don't have it. Yes. yes. Think about it. I was dreading the heat. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's nice and cool here. There's air circulation. It's wonderful. We have a lot of things. <laughs> we have a lot of wonderful things. And it's mm -hmm. pretty. I mean. Yeah. We're sitting here in space. Yeah. Let's be honest. I haven't even discussed the desk, so uh, mm. we decided to go with mirror black so that we can look at ourselves. It's, this is all we need, oh. really. <laughs> we only want our faces and our voices to keep everything going. And uh, as you can see, we're also, we have colors. We well, do. One. We do have colors. One color. What one color, color are we on? Are we on blue? We're on blue. We're on blue. Ooh, very good. Oh, yeah. Matching my shirt. Yeah. You're wearing purple. Purple. Already, <laughs> we are in <laughs> fights. So there was a bit of a delay due to the setup of the studio and sound issues and everything. We heard that people like sound in their Eve and things about Eve, so we decided to install it. We took <laughs> care of that problem promptly, and uh, now we're all ready to go. And I think we should just try uh, and get into the match as quickly as possible. So the first match of the day is uh, in loser's bracket, so we're still watching p teams go home, uh, or well, back to the station, right. with their tails between their legs, or uh, their engine trails. The first match of the day is Razor Alliance versus the Initiative. Yeah. Initiative Dot. Mm -hmm. Have to Dot. Have to, ha have to remember, yeah. <laughs> So uh, we already have the bands. Razor Alliance banned out the EOS and the Armageddon, and the Initiative banned out the, the Gila and the Rattlesnake. Pretty something that we should like uh, suspect is going to be the theme of today and tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. I mean, these are. Probably would be the most used ships if the bands didn't exist in the tournament. We have even with the bands, we've seen a lot of them, so it makes sense. Maybe we're going to start seeing getting away from the drone meta this weekend, and it's going to start by just banning them out. People are going to have to think outside the box. So, I really hope uh, a lot of people take on uh, hydro reloads approach and bring Arties. I love <laughs> that I was love really impressive. Yeah, yeah. yeah I like yeah. artillery. The headshotting is, is good. The headshot is real. <laughs> that is for sure. I'm also looking forward to some of the teams taking my pro tip and just bringing smart bombs. Yes. Yeah, All I smart mean, bombs? Oh, yes. Like, uh, That's the way I would oh, hey, disco. Yeah. disco. Like, that would be good. Send okay. your two lucky frigates out of the boundary immediately. Right. And then just go <laughs> smart bombing. It's going right. to be Rancer in the Alliance tournament. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Isn't Old that school what we want? Rancer, yeah. yeah. That would be great. But yeah, so uh, I think we're in for a pretty, pretty good first match. I, I, think, oh, yeah. well. I think so. I think it is interesting. Razor actually fielded again in their last match, and they banned again this time. So clearly, they're not going to run the same comp. Um, I wonder if they're still going to go with the battleship. I, I want to see the State Raven. I got to be honest. They they oh, said so. that was their mm. flagship, and I'm saying Razor, bring it out. Show us show us that you mean it. They're not going to. No, I, they're, <laughs> they're not. But like, yeah. if I believe really hard, mm, it might hope. be the biggest bait. Uh, state driven in history. That is possible. Like, like they yeah. just want to kill it, the kill man. They just alternatively, bait out of it. they could make it look like a bait state driven. I'm not sure how you act baity, but then fit all e war in the. Next. I don't think oh. you need to act baity <laughs> or <laughs> a state driven. Everybody yes. wants to kill you. Right. For the bragging rights. They could put smart bombs on it. To your point. Oh, I mean, mm. just throwing it out there. Yep. I remember you talked about how uh, fielding a Gila will make you your smart bombs sort of not affect your. Uh, your drones that much, but now it's banned. Smart bombs, guys. Maybe, yeah. Mm. I mean, you're still looking at other drone holes that do have EHP bonuses, so they're still they're still quite tanky. A lot of the drones. Yeah. yeah. I wonder if we'll continue the like the we saw a bunch of like old school dummy setups in the losers bracket last weekend. I wonder if the teams in the losers bracket are gonna continue that, or they've realized that dummies aren't that great. 
Well, they might still be good, but they're certainly more expensive last year yeah. from a points mm -hmm. perspective. So. Yes, the dummy uh, garnered a lot of attention as the, the last tournament being like Dominic's tournament number Dominic's. <laughs> Everybody <laughs> brought one. Yeah. yeah. But uh, we've been seeing a lot of variety, I feel, for the last two week, oh, yeah. weeks. Yeah, we really have. Some have gone great, others not so much. Yeah. We've I mean, the typhoons. I, I, I had to mention mm -hmm. typhoons. I'm obsessed you know. with the typhoons. I'm absolutely obsessed with them. In what yeah. way? Because I, just, I too I just, am obsessed I just with typhoons. I can't believe that they were not only brought, but won. Mm. Yeah, so. that is true. Okay, we'll I talk about that one more later when we see yeah. that. Yeah. So, <laughs> I just got word that the match is ready. Uh, so, yes. we're ready to go. Here we go. What Excellent. do you guys think? I'm going with the initiative because I like those guys. Mm. Yeah. Uh, I'm going with initiative because, well, I just don't have much confidence in Razor. Uh, That's the nicest way I can I'm, say that. I'm going with initiative because they're not Razor. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll go Razor, partly out of obligation, but, yeah. Uh, yeah. There always has to be one. Yeah, yeah. I, I'll yeah, yeah. be that guy. And when they win, you will lord it over us. Right, That's exactly. Yes. Pretty much. So, let's uh, go into cyberspace space and watch some shit. Cyberspace space. We've got Razor in red and Initiative in blue, and Apothne's gonna have to, like, clip his heels a little bit few times because there is no State Raven. There is a golem, which is almost like a state raven, but a little bit less blingy. So Razor, well, there's a pretty <laughs> Stratios, actually. <laughs> Showing you guys some random stuff. Our face is first. I'm CCP Rise. I'm with uh, Elise Randolph, and uh, we'll be with you for the first start of the day today. And yes, so you'll see setups in just a second. But we have uh, Razor bringing uh, Tengu along with a Marauder, uh, Tinker along with a Marauder. So they have a golem and then this small uh, triple Ishtar Tengu Vulture uh, Tinker. And they're going to be up against uh, a drone setup with Frig Lodgy. Some Ishtars, Myrmidons, that Stratios you saw, Vexers, and a couple Inquisitors. By the way, I have no, no idea if you guys can hear me. Uh, if you can kind of hear me and it's really frustrating, don't worry. We're working on it, and hopefully before long we'll have it sorted out. We'll be good. And the match is starting right now. Initiative is in a very high DPS setup. They've got the Frigate Logistics and the Inquisitors. And it's going up against a Tinker, which is very resilient to a lot of these things. The Tinker that Razor chose to field is kind of immune to damps. So they just assign their Ishtar drones to the Golem. Golem goes into Bastion. But of course, it doesn't look like uh, either team has much control. So it doesn't really matter for them on this one. Those executioners, super brave, heading like straight across into the center of the Tinker. And uh, one thing definitely worth knowing, both teams dropping sentries. We, uh, you were talking before the match about how it would be really important for the Golem to have smart bombs, but um, actually not going to be needing them or not going to be able to use them because there's just bouncers uh, from every single ship, basically, on the initiative side. Yeah, so that's, that's something that the Razor did not want to see, is the bouncers. But, I mean, the bouncers recently got, or the Ishtars recently got patched. Uh, earlier this week, so their track a little bit worse. Bouncers, probably not the drone they wanted to choose, but they're going to work on it anyways. Razor looks like they're going after uh, a Myrmidon for the initiative side. Initiative is just kind of trying to break the Tinker Tengu right now. They're just putting all their DPS while they're losing a Merlin, or Myrmidon rather. And I don't know, I think this early on, wow, Razor's got the edge. Everyone who like poo pooed they're on Razor. That's a really big deal. It looks like the initiative didn't have the DPS, or at least wasn't having an easy time breaking a tank to begin with. And if they're losing ships as well, um, even with their reps active, the Inquisitors didn't get to rep him immediately. But once they made it into range, they, they weren't disrupted in any way. And still, Razor has enough damage to break those Myrmidon tanks. So that's a, a really, really good sign for Razor. So interesting to point out, um, the bouncers don't track all that well, especially after the patch on the Ishtar. But they don't care because the Golem gets bonus target painters. And they're just zonking this Myrmidon straight down. Second Myrmidon going down. Maybe... I don't know if you want to shoot the Myrmidons first, but it's obviously working for them. Yeah, it seems to be working and out fine. This Razor Tengu's holding fine. I mean, he's ASB fit, so the cap pressure might start getting to him in a little bit when uh, he has to use his XLASB on cap. But none of the initiative team has any cap pressure at all, so as long as they don't get bumped from away from each other or anything like that, they should be golden in Razor. Just nice, kind of nice target switch here by Razor. That Myrmidon started to recover, and it looks like they've swapped over to a Vexor really quickly to try to challenge those reps. And the Vexor just, wow, just totally disappears. They they did manage to get maybe one rep cycle on there, but it wasn't enough to save it. So down a cruiser now as well. And and as is always the case with these uh, uh, kind of permanent tank based teams, 
it's really bad news if you lose DPS before you break anything. Like it just gets harder and harder for them. So yeah, I think the Razor switch from the Myrmidon to the Vexor was a really wise choice. Yeah. The Inquisitors don't have that much range, so if they're spread out a little bit, they can really test them that way. Yeah. The Inquisitors are really efficient for the points in terms of repping that you get. It's like two thirds or something as effective as a Tech One Logi for less than half the points. So it's really really good. But they have limited range, and they have to kind of not fly out of the arena sometimes. It's actually really surprising how split up the initiative is. Uh, it's, it's often the case with a drone setup like this that you would want to spread up, spread out so that if you were being chased, uh, it takes a lot more time for the drones or the enemy uh, turret ships or whatever to move to the next target. Uh, but in this case, all the damage is just sitting still, so they don't gain all that much by uh, spreading themselves out. Although now, uh, Razor has actually switched to Geckos and Infiltrators, so, so I take that back somewhat. But I would think they would want to group up a bit more to make it easier on their Logi during those target switches. Yeah, probably. The kiting around doesn't do too much for them. But as you see, Razor is now swapping between this Vexor and this Myrmidon. They figure the Inquisitor can't keep both of them up, and yep. they are absolutely right. And... Well, the Inquisitors are trying, but not trying hard enough. Yep, moving on down. Vexor probably following shortly. They're also putting a little pressure on those Executioners that are in close to the team. Uh, at this point, I mean, Razors just looks like they're in really good shape. I, I can't imagine Initiative will be able to challenge the tank. Um, I, I wonder, do you think in this in this type of matchup, it's usually best for Initiative to go for the Tengu? I don't know. I think they had a lot of DPS early on that they could have probably just blap through some of these Ishtars. Like, the Ishtar is kind of flimsy, or at least of what you have here, it, it's the flimsiest. Mm -hmm. And they they were just barely tanking with their two little Inquisitors with what they had. So maybe if you eliminate one of the Razor Ishtars, then you can kind of cruise right, and right. Like poke and see what the weak hole is. Definitely. But they don't get a chance to find out <laughs> at this point. Uh, looks like this is going to be pretty bad news. Also, to let you guys know, we are um, mostly in the loser's bracket today, so uh, most of the matches you're watching are elimination matches. If Initiative uh, loses this, which it looks like they will, they will be knocked out of the tournament. Uh, Razor will keep trying to make their way through that loser's bracket, and we will be in loser's bracket today up until uh, the Exodus match, which happens pretty close to the end. We'll have six matches or so that are in the winner's bracket, but a lot of elimination matches today, which is always fun. Yep, so Razor is, when you see Razor and Initiative, like, you generally expect to see the Initiative go a little bit further. They did last year, at least. Mm -hmm. Do you think this is just, like, they rolled the dice and got wrong, or, or what happened here? Maybe. I think, it. yeah, like, the I, I, I do feel like the compositions favored Razor, um, but I don't know. I, I'm not sure. There's some weird decisions here as well. I think, you know, it, going into the match, I felt like, this kind of could go either way. I feel like Razor's always kind of a middling team. Like, yeah. It's hard to say exactly where they'll kind of run out of gas, but they, they usually do all right. So I don't know. I, I think it was hard to say going in, even after we saw the setups, kind yeah. of how this would go. And their Sister Bliss goes down in the initiative Ishtar. This Razor attack bar is super tiny, but it is effective, <laughs> I guess. Yeah, it is surprising. I guess the, the Painter's doing a lot of work. What do you think about uh, one thing kind of surprising to me in this match is there's so little disruption on either side. Basically, I have uh, yeah, the control target bars are non-existent. Yeah, you basically have target painters and some webs maybe um, for both teams, but there's really no damps going on. There's no ECM, and I wonder if maybe that's sort of part of the mistake initiative made is not having a good way to disrupt um, kind of anything the other team was doing. Yeah, we saw these very high DPS teams with uh, um, like uh, Shadow Cartel had one, PL had one as well. They have lots of damps in the mid slots. Lots of they use yeah. their things for utility and stuff. And they, it was very effective. Like, dams are very strong in the tournament. It, I think it's the strongest form of evil war you can bring. And Initiative was clearly, like, they banned the Rattlesnake Hila, two ships that don't really care about dams too much. So you figure maybe when you see that, you bring some dams with you mm -hmm. uh, to take advantage of that. But nope, uh, not so much. Tinker, I guess the Tinker teams are pretty resilient to dams anyway, so... It wouldn't have been too much of an they, issue. Uh, They've got the Ishtars, especially this setup itself. That's kind of what I would have thought, too, that maybe maybe it is fine to just go for, for pure damage against the Tinker setups because they're fairly resilient to, to damps, at least. But yeah. we actually saw, I think it was the Hydra match last week where um, just scan resolution damps on the uh, Tengu, yeah. caused the Tengu to take 30 seconds to lock his cruisers, and so they had lost two by the time he even yeah, that's had his thing, first lock. That's the thing with the Tinker. When one piece falls, the entire setup, it's it's like uh, it's yeah. no good. It's, it's not Gucci. <laughs> um, we see one Inquisitor already died. I'm actually pretty surprised that Razor didn't shoot these Inquisitor Inquisitors first. The Inquisitor mm -hmm. died like super fast. So. Yeah. 
Yeah, wow. it's it is interesting they went for Myrmidons first. Maybe just going for something that they knew they'd be able to apply DBS to. Yeah, they're a big uh, fat. Didn't have a tech two tank. Are. Wasn't afraid. Just kind of a kind of middle of the road target that they knew they could at least apply damage to to test where they're at. But yep. and this Stradios melted as well. So Razor is still in cleanup mode. Um, it looked it could have gone either way at the start, maybe. But when Initiative chose to shoot the Tengu, I think Razor were very happy with that decision, and they were just winning from there on out. And because the spam has stopped in chat, I'm hoping sound is fixed and you guys are all hearing everything all right. We are sorry about that. Um, but hopefully we get it taken care of. And just a couple more ships here. These executioners, they were right down there at zero orbiting. Not hopefully going to use up tons of our time running around the arena for no reason. Yeah, probably not. The executioner is right up in the middle of the uh, Razor's grill. And Razor is not even trying to loot or anything. They're staying in the little tinker ball. Um, the Tinker Logistics, the Tengu, is really, really effective, but it only has like a six or seven kilometer range, so you can't really move around. So they're just they're just sitting together holding hands, and yeah. uh, the match is now over. Yeah, nice job by Razor. That'll uh, do it for this one. Initiative knocked out of AT12. We're going to send it back to uh, the other nerds in the studio and see you guys in a minute. Align, align. The clock is bomb. Via, ragazzi, tutto, tutto, tutto. E via il jump age. Do you like spaceships? Do you like explosions? Airwalk Media. We make your preparation look good. Welcome back to the studio. Uh, of matches to start the day, I think that was a pretty good one. I'm CCP Gargant, your host for the tournament, uh, for the rest of the tournament. I forgot to say my name, which is terrible. I like saying my name, CCP Gargant. It rolls up, it rolls off the tongue. Sorry. <laughs> so with me here are Apathni, Sir Squeebles, and Back an Alien uh, once again. And uh, what did you gentlemen think? Um, I, a mandatory I hate Tinker comment. I, I knew I, that was coming. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't like him. I mean, Razor did a really good job with it. I think initiative setup was perhaps uh, just a suboptimal way to handle the Tinker. And uh, the way they executed was also suboptimal. But at the same time, I'm not sure that... I mean, again, I don't think Razor made any mistakes there. So, you know. They, right. Yeah, it was well piloted by Razor. Um, like they said in the commentary booth, there's not a whole lot you can do when you're up against the tanker. You have to all in on one ship, and if it doesn't break, um, you're probably not going to break the secondary because you've already lost DPS. So. Yeah, that's exactly what I was about to say. There you go. Like, uh, that's the thing about tanker setup is you need the whole team's worth of DPS, and then the moment you lose that part of DPS, and I think that's one of the reasons why they had the Myrmidon primary, it has the potential to be links. It's got that T1 resist profile. The cruise missiles are going to apply beautifully to it. If the Myrmidon goes down, you are golden. You are Gucci, as Elise would say. <laughs> yeah, and, he, and he did say, I, I think, he busted that out on the first match. He, he did. didn't even he, he's didn't save not it, yeah. saving the bookends. Mm. <laughs> so just to explain to people that don't know, a tinker setup is... You're the most passionate about it. Yeah. yeah. I would feel wrong taking it from you. Okay, so, I mean, as we saw, you, you have a setup that isn't using the max number of ships. You bring very few ships. Um, generally kind of beefy ships, and you have logistics that is extremely uh, tanky, generally because it's being fed capacitor by the other ships and uh, results in it allowing it to actively tank really, really well. Um, they stay very close together, generally a prop modless setup, and they use range to do their damage. And it's not a very high DPS setup, but it's extremely resilient to damage. It's very hard to break through the, the, um, the reps of the logistics ship and Generally speaking, unless you're able to uh, bump the logistics away and out of range of the other ships, or somehow, like we said, power through the first target right away, it's it's just a slow death by paper cut after that. Mm. We've seen a fair few of these uh, tinker setups in the, in the in the earlier weekends, 
Uh, and we've also seen some ways to beat it, like like you say, overpowering DPS. One team managed to beat one by because they the Tinker forgot to fit ECM or ECCM. ECCM. I'm sorry. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And then Hydra did successfully. Or Pandemic Legion successfully bumped the Tinker yeah. out of yeah. working as well. So. Yeah. No, that's easy, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh, your your solutions are bring brute force and big ships. Right. Yeah. 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 Generally, the solution to everything, if we're honest. Just more power. Uh, that's exactly. Yes. I live by simple philosophies. Bigger is better. Yeah, and more smart bombs. Because, yes. Because drones. More apparently, smart bombs, right. apparently, yes. Yeah, drones are the bane of everyone's existence. Right. Actually, Ishtars are the bane of everyone's existence. So yeah. I'm told. Pretty that's much. what I've heard. Yeah. Mm. Or they right. were previously. Don't really hate on the Ishtar that much. I don't either, actually. Have you ever fought Ishtars? No, I've flown them though. Uh, there, there he we go. He <laughs> logs in from uh, from time to time. Don't. <laughs> don't, don't be every now and then, three or four a year, he logs in. Yeah, you know. skill changes. Yeah. So, <laughs> do you know about anyone on the commentary team this year that likes Tinkers? Perhaps Elise. Well, he's not here, so let's just say he loves Tinkers. <laughs> yeah. Elise is uh, the biggest Tinker fan in the history of the yeah. online. I believe. Yeah. I think he said specifically before the tournament started. Tinker is the best comp, and it's going to win the tournament. If a match doesn't have a Tinker in it, I'm fairly sure Elise just refuses to watch it. Yeah, you could hear the bitterness in his voice <laughs> that somebody else took their private comp, so I think he's pretty upset and about it. this is what happens when you're not on the commentary right. desk. Yeah, this is, this what, happens. is what happens. <laughs> this is good. This is really good. I think he's worrying for it when we switch around, though. So, yeah. Uh, the initiative of going home, they uh, lost me my first prediction of the day. I'm not happy with you guys. Tacker Master, you're no longer the captain of my heart. I'm sorry. But it wasn't just you, actually. It lost everybody except for me the first time. Here it goes. Smug. Here it goes. There was a famous poet that once said, all I do is win no matter what. And Did I think that applies here. Not even know what famous poet it was? No, I don't know. If you're going to post out a quote, for, you need to have the source. For licensing Come on, reasons, man. I'm not sure I know. <laughs> the the philosophy who it's, palette is it's, who you're referring it's to. It's a good thing oh, that you whoa. didn't manage to remember that name because we might have had to wipe off the uh, yeah, cameras yeah, because of yeah. the smug fog. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, custom. I'm starting with it early because I don't think the rest of my predictions are going to pan out, so I've really got to milk this I don't one. know, you agree with me on the next one, so you're going to be right. That's what worries so me. So the next <laughs> match the next match we're going into is uh, Choke Point versus Solar Fleet. And I respect the team, so I'm pronouncing it correctly. A lot of people think it's a silent L, but uh, I'm not. I'm not in for that. So choke Wait. point have banned out uh, the Gaila and the Vaxer Navy issue, mm. and uh, Solar Fleet have banned out the Scimitar and the Rattlesnake. Hmm. So both teams banned what the other team brought in their previous match, yeah. basically, because Solar did feel mm. Gila's choke point brought Rattlesnake. Yeah. Yeah. It looks like people don't want to uh, let face rolling happen where you just bring the same comp again and again and again. Exactly. Yeah. Although, Even though know they lost with both, which begs the question, yeah. if they lost with it, maybe you do want to fight it again. Even though it's a funny coincidence when you bring the same stuff again and you forgot to repair your ship. <laughs> that happens. No, that's style points. That's so, not forgetful. Uh, the control room says that the match is ready, so let's not delay any further, even though we like the sound of our own voices. Mm. Uh, I'm going with choke point because solar fleet, uh, I'm not a fan of feet. I'm I'm going with Solar. I think they've got you know good long history in the AT. I think they 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 usually do pretty pretty good, and I think that Choke Point is definitely a team that they can win against. Uh, I am also going to go with Choke Point. I think they looked pretty strong, and even though they don't have the Rattlesnake, I think they'll be fine. Yeah, I'm predicting Solar Fleet to go home. Uh, Choke Point, I think, is going to take this match. So, is it my turn to be winning Smug? Yes. 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 <laughs> Make sure to milk and it for all can. And with that. We exit this beautiful, beautiful stage and go back into space.
Hey guys, welcome back. I'm CCP Rise here with Elise Randolph, and we're about to watch Choke Point fight Solar Fleet. Um, some standard things going on here, especially on Choke Point side. We have Eos's, Ishtar's, uh, Aniros, and then quite a bit of support actually. Merlin, three Merlins and three Punishers. A lot of like small tech one support. And then uh, what's Solar Fleet got going on? Solar Fleet's going with something sort of different from what they brought before. They're bringing a Geddon with uh, an Eos core. He's, they've got a Celestis. The Navy Vexor was banned out by Choke Point, so they're replacing it with just Vexors and Arbitrators. And they're going with, I assume they're Tackle Maulers. Uh, so Durable Tackle there. And a um, whole bunch of it. Yeah. They've got quite a bit of tackle going Go on. Go get those Ishtars. <laughs> uh, and we're underway now. As you can see, uh, Solar's kind of all over the place, uh, depending on which ship you're talking about. Those Maulers are going to be leading the charge from, from at zero on the beacon. They've got uh, the support of those Vexors in the Geddon right behind them, and then the rest of the, the um, Eoses and stuff farther in the back. And uh, I'll have to see how, how this goes. Geckos and uh, other, actually some Curators mixed in there as well, being dropped for Choke. And um, looking for sentries on the other side. I see some Augmented Berserkers, some Armament and Spots, some Valkyrie, so not a lot of sentry action on that side. Yeah, Solar Fleet's actually got a very huge attack bar, or control bar, rather. And um, they... I don't know. I, I think they're winning the damp war right now, shockingly enough. I mean, uh, this yeah. uh, Celestis damped out these Merlins and things. But Choke Point is making a good decision, I think. They've tackled the Guardian. He's not damped or anything. But we presume that they'll eventually move all their DPS onto Ivan in Solar's Guardian. And he is not long for the world. Uh, this world. Solar is doing a very similar maneuver. They don't have tackle on the Choke Point Onerios. But that is their first target. Yeah, but for now, both Lodgy holding okay. The the bulk of the drones haven't made it onto either of those targets. It's still kind of initial tackle and some light damage there, although now the Guardian's starting to take quite a bit of pain. His uh, tank's starting to break a bit, and he, he looks like he's going to be going down on the solar side well before the choke point on Eros does. Yeah, Ivan's going down hard right now, and that is not good for the solar fleet. Uh, whew, they are not really making any trades either. They were kind of plinking away at Hainsey and a Punisher, but... Man, this is this is gonna go really, really bad for them as this guardian dies. Yeah. They've got nothing to show for it. Yeah, that's pretty awesome for choke point. Uh, as you said, control bar is huge. You can see tracking disruptors and dams being traded all the way across uh, both teams. A lot of support on on both sides in this match. And uh, in case you guys aren't uh, super aware of the, how these bars work, they kind of just combine um, all the all the um, damage, uh, both potential and actual, and then all the uh, tank, both potential and actual, like active. And for control, it's kind of a consolidation of a whole bunch of different effects, webs, um, nos and newts, damps, etc. So you get some kind of uh, high level sense of what the compositions uh, kind of depend on for their, their function. Sorry about my voice. I yelled at squeebles a lot last night at the bar, but hopefully it won't be too bad as a Muller goes down for Solar Fleet. Understandably so. Yeah, Choke Point looks to be running over this. They're all damped down, but they don't care. Their Ishtars are just assigning to one of these Eoses, and yeah. these Merlins also, do, they don't really care about being damped down. They're probably damp Merlins because they're armor Merlins, but I mean, whatever. This, this Geddon is now who Solar Fleet are going for, or Choke Point are going for. And I mean, this game has been completely ineffective. It's it right now has its newts on the Onerios, it looks like, but too little, too late for this solar uh, again. And he's he's going down slow, but there's nothing to save him, so he's going to be gone. Hopefully, uh, like Solar was able to trade back in Ishtar. I have to think the, the Oneros did a really good job of uh, getting himself away from all the damage, kind of kiting around all those drones. He is actually finally tackled, which he never was before. One of the Maulers caught up to him and got yeah. a web, and he's going down really quick now that that's the case. Um, also because of those newts, I assume. But uh, And actually, this match is still really close. I mean, they're working on the Armageddon, uh, trying to take that guy out, um, and that's going fine. But there's still a lot of damage left on the Solar side, and... Uh, um, still a pretty close match, actually. Yeah, this is actually going a little bit better than I thought it would be. I, I thought for sure Choke Point had this, but uh, they're living up to their namesake. Solar are coming back into this. They've killed the Onerios, so now we're on even footing. Basically, it's... Actually, I think Solar might be slightly ahead if their Geddon can stay alive a little bit longer, but it looks like he's not doing too good now. No, he's struggling. And even though he is damped, he does have uh, newts onto both of those Eoses you can see. Um, just trying to, to wear down whatever um, cap they have so that they're easier to break. I think just because that's all that's in range, actually. He he doesn't have a whole lot of options right now. You can see he's webbed, and he's actually going to go down as well. So yeah, another nice kill for Choke Point, putting them probably into a pretty good position again. But I think we still have a pretty close match here. Yeah, this getting lived a lot longer than Choke Point wanted them to, or wanted it to. Um, they traded what was left of the Geddon, like the slivers of that Geddon, for 
basically all of the cap of both EOS is and half of the HP of one EOS, um, SGX. So SGX, if he starts eating it now, which he's doing, he's webbed by these maulers. The drone swarm is hitting him in the face now. Um, I don't know. If this EOS goes down, Solar might be able to, to kite around and win. Yeah, he's breaking pretty fast. It doesn't look like he's going to recover at all. And uh, that's that's a really big kill for Solar. They lost to Celestis. One of their models are about to lose a Vexor as well. So Ooh. that's more damage off the field. They are going to start getting a little light on damage on the on the Solar side. But actually, Choke Point really only has the uh, the Eos and the two Ishtars, too. I mean, this is really just staying very even all the way through. Um, yeah, it looks like Choke Point might be kind of steadying themselves a little bit. They've got another Vexor tackled. That one Vexor melted super fast. So Bender is not long for this world either. Solar Fleet aren't really applying much damage. <laughs> it seems like they're having a hard time. They're, uh, I can Maybe see the, the solar, solar drones making their way over to that second EOS. It yeah. uh, looks like they were going to switch to him. And yeah, there are most of those drones stacking up on top of that EOS Oh, they now. got G Genetics. So the Ishtar of Choke Point taking damage. I think that's the absolute right call. Like, okay, you got that first EOS because he was a target of opportunity and he was nuded and stuff. But now you have to take out the Ishtars. Wow. The Ishtars are a lot of points. Interesting decision. Actually, a lot of those drones made their way up to the EOS. And then, like you say, they got the tackle on the Ishtar, decided to switch. So now a lot of the drones that were on the... Uh, the choke point EOS are moving over towards that Ishtar instead. It's it costing like them time, and in the meantime, the Solar has lost another Vexor. Yeah, Solar have a little bit of uh, uh, split fire issues here. They're shooting the Ishtar and the EOS at the same time. Yeah. Uh, if they were just focusing on the Ishtar, he would have been dead by now, but at least they've got half an Ishtar and half an EOS, but they've traded it for Vexor. Probably a lot of this is the result of now the uh, damp pressure coming from the choke point side is really significant, so there may have been uh, you know, lack of options for Solar in terms of where their DPS goes, but despite that, they just take out an Ishtar. So now there's just Eos Ishtar and those six frigates and uh, a lot of cruisers left on the solar side. They actually have quite a bit of damage potential still left on the field. Yeah, if you um, look at the attack bar, solar actually has a bigger attack bar. They're not applying it nearly as well, but they they still got a lot of uh, attack left in them. And they've shooting Cassie's Eos, who is now tackled by one of these tackle maulers. I mean, wow, this, kinda is, <laughs> this is incredibly close. Third Vaxxer just goes down for solar fleet. Um, That's a good trade, though, yeah. uh, a Vexor for an EOS, basically. Yeah. So now we've got two Arbitrators and two Maulers and the EOS <laughs> versus a lone Ishtar and then a whole bunch of Tackle Merlins. So I think Solar actually are bringing this back? Is yeah, this I, I can't tell. It's really close. I'm really curious how the Frigs will do uh, like in the very late stages of this match. If Solar is still able to get damage onto them and kill them easily, like if they go to Switch and, and the Frigs just start dying, um, then fine, but like it's possible they'll have a really hard time and the choke can kind of kite them around with the damps and pick things off that get stranded. But uh, it looks like it looks like Punishers kind of are the next target for Solar and they're starting to to whittle down to very little armor HP left. Uh, in the meantime, Choke's got DPS on two of the on both the Maulers for the Solar side. Yeah, it looks like the Maulers are actually the ones shooting the Punishers and the Eos and Arbitrator is trying to shoot the remaining Ishtar who is kind of speeding around the arena trying to not die. But uh, he's the drones are killing him slowly but surely, and nothing else on the solar fleet side is taking that much damage. I mean, the maulers are getting shot by these punishers, but they're maulers. They don't really care. <laughs> Choke point proving, oh, a mauler got a web on Omni in the Ishtar. So those drones are going to be hitting him really hard. Yeah, Choke point's going to get hit right in the face again, and they're going to be left with just six frigates and... Getting, getting that tackle is huge. Those, you know, hammerheads chasing the Ishtar, getting some damage here and there, but with the web, uh, everything will catch up right away, and I, I imagine that Ishtar will drop pretty quick. Still no frigs down on the choke point side, even though they've been taking damage this entire time. They still have all six left, but like you said, the Maulers don't care too much about the damage that they're putting onto, uh, onto them. So Is this Ishtar actually tackled by, or was he tackled by one of the Maulers? Or, yeah, he was. Uh, so that Mahler was actually pretty... He was actually tackled by the Eos. Oh, wow. Okay, well, that's a little bit more embarrassing. E <laughs> and uh, choke point showing that like even without MJDs, they can still throw a match pretty uh, pretty effectively. Two Punishers down. This yeah. is now well in the hands of Solar Fleet. Oh, what Lord. an awesome match. <laughs> this was really back and forth. I thought for sure Solar lost it as they lost their Guardian so early on. But then they kept their composure. They came back. They killed the Onerios. And then they just made really good trades. I mean... I have a feeling Choke Point kind of forgot that Arbitrators and Vexers are pretty decent uh, drone boats. And they definitely were caught uh, by these Maulers. Like, these Maulers, you don't really expect to say this often, and I don't think I'm going to say it very much, but these Maulers were really good tackle. It worked out really well for them. Nice job, Solar Fleet. Really cool match there. That's it for this one. Uh, Choke Point will be knocked out, uh, of course. And uh, with that, we'll go back uh, to the studio.
after that uh, rather nice showing of a choke. I, I call yeah. that a choke. Yeah. Definitely a choke. And and this, is, this, this is what I like about this job is I get the first take on all the puns. Yeah. All the obvious puns are mine. I think, I think during, the, during the matches I need to just keep my mouth shut and not give them away to you. So I can, yeah. Oh yeah, you're, this is not going to become a pun war. Yeah. <laughs> Let's just keep that he would sure. lose, for sure. That, yeah, probably. That might be really cool. Like, it's really close back and forth, like we used to say. Uh, so it looks like Guardian can manage to shake it off and like, come back and take point, then kind of lost a few ships and kind of display that web and the Eos on the car, which never really happened. Like, that match was, like, really, really good. A great second match of the day. I feel like an Eos is a really expensive tackle ship, but they used it effectively. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you use yeah. what you have. Yeah. I also like the Maulers. Like, uh, we don't see a lot of them no. for some reason. Yeah, and it's sort of a strange choice because you, you can fit them with something like Smart Bombs, and they're a great tanky platform that can mm. follow drone blobs around. But I didn't see Smart Bombs. No, me neither. Um, so I kind of wonder, I mean, it is nice because they're not things that are going to get instantly destroyed. We've seen several teams that have lost the match basically to Alpha on their frigates. Yep. And they didn't really present that opportunity. Um, but what they did present was just sort of a strange set of tackle that worked when Choke choked. Yeah, I mean, yeah. the, the Muller has, what, three mids. It's really tanky, not that much room for utility. Yeah. Its projection with lasers isn't particularly fantastic. They've got a, you know, the damage bonus, but not really a tracking or, like, mm -hmm. optimal bonus. So they are a weird choice. But in the way they were used, just, like, really super heavy tackle that would just grab something and hold it forever, that was that was quite nice. Yeah. No, I think, probably this is where you get to be smug. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was not going to let him... Uh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Just, yeah. have his moment. Okay. <laughs> Yes. We're all we're all one and one though, right? Everybody gets one. Yes. No, I'm no, I'm, I'm all and two. Oh. And then I believe he is. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm not even like uh, a lot of other commentators will talk about some sort of curse to hide their incompetence, but mm. uh, I'm just really bad at predictions, so <laughs> <laughs> I won't hide behind some superpower. Mm. Oh, this is beyond my control, guys. I'm just not selecting. Mm. This is just a curse. It's not even beyond your control. It's the opposite. It's like you. Guess a team, so they throw. But now, uh, choke point is gone, mm -hmm. and solar fleet advance. This is uh, yeah. this is turning out to be uh, an upset day for me, at least. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> next up, we have Castabout versus Clockwork Pineapple, and I am fairly certain that Castabouts will win this. Really? I have no basis for that judgment. <laughs> it's just a wild they, swing well, of my judgment. Based on I the think first two, yeah. if they bring more than six pilots. I think they, they will have a lot more chance to win. How do you, you, you worded it pretty nicely uh, earlier, I believe. Yes. I believe. What about you guys? What do you think? Uh, I mean, they did run a tinker in their previous match, castabouts that is. Um, so I'm excited to hear Bacchanelian's thoughts on that if it comes back out. Um, I somewhat expect the bands might try and take the rattlesnake from them uh, since it was used fairly effectively, even though they didn't win. But I think Clockwork Pineapple's approach was a little more seasoned even yeah. with the slept mm -hmm. so I, I think they should have a pretty easy time of this to be honest i have the bands uh cast about banned the eos and the dominics apparently they're going to last year's tournament as you do and <laughs> clockwork pineapple banned the gila and the rattlesnake ah. mm. so of course you were right. right yeah congratulations i say i think we will probably see slept from clockwork pineapple again yeah. i feel like even though it didn't work out for him last time that's a ship that you practice a lot you use it as a core. I mean, when you come into the tournament, you're going to fly a Slepnir at some point, whether you want to field it or not. Um, so the fact they came out with it last week, the bands sort of take away a lot of the drone potential. I think they're going to run Slepnirs. Yeah, it is a very versatile ship. Yeah, I can yeah. see it. And Grun, uh, Clockwork Pineapple, have a lot of experience flying it, uh, having been their neighbors for quite some time. I actually, I'm going to go with Clockwork Pineapple as my as my prediction, even though I also see Squeebles has done the same. So that which it's doesn't bode well. Wrong, <laughs> but, uh, well. This leaves me the odd man out. Yeah. yeah. So again, you get to be right. Yeah, that's right. Because we had Squeebles being the one, and he was yeah. right. I was the only one. Uh, I was right. And now you, it's your turn to get one right. We'll see. One. We'll see. Uh, I like I say, I do not trust in supernatural powers when it comes to incompetence. <laughs> mm. uh, but t uh, talking about like what these teams have brought before uh, earlier mm. in the tournament. I'd like to point out that both of them are in the loser's bracket, so it has obviously not been that right. impressive, but no, uh, no, no. But um, Sorry, I mean, sorry. To the <laughs> to, I mean, to be fair, some of the, some of the first matchups, I mean, somebody had to start off against Hydra, right? I mean, I'm not saying, I don't, I don't remember if it was one of these, but like, there are a lot of really good teams in the tournament, and you're going to 
just be unlucky and draw them sometimes. Yep. So some of the teams that are in the losers bracket, uh, maybe you know they're not the worst teams. They just happen to get a really hard match right out, and mm -hmm. maybe they're not the team that's going to win the tournament, but they're a team that could place pretty high if they get a little bit easier bracket. So. And I think that is the case actually with both of these teams. I don't know who Castabouts faced, but. Uh, they're a really strong team. I don't even remember the match specifically. I do know they ran that Rattlesnake Tinker, but these are two really competent teams, and I think it'll be a really good match no matter what they bring, but I really, really hope it's a Tinker so that you can talk about it. <laughs> yeah, we loved seeing uh, you talk about the things you hate. That's, it gives us a certain... He's the grumpy old man of the cast. Yeah. It gives us a certain Schattenfreude. Yeah, is, there is you go. Yeah. Wow, the that's... The German pronunciation. Well, it's wow. sort of in the Yes, well, this is, yeah. this is Europe. Yeah. yeah. Just, well, we, we are in Europe. Barely. Sort of. barely, barely yeah. Europe, yes. More like the North Pole. Right. <laughs> uh, alternatives to... I see that the, 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 the drone boats get targeted a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, alternatives, alter, alternatives to that... Well, your, your language is hard, I'm sorry. <laughs> alternatives to uh, these drone boats uh, exist, but of course these are the best ones, but... What do you think they're going to bring? Like... Um. I'm, I always love watching Typhoon teams. Mm. Like I think that <laughs> even though there was only one team, Quebec, that brought that uh, have a flagship Foon, I, I really just enjoy watching them. They are kind of drone boats. They've got a hundred bandwidth, but you kind of don't consider them overt drone boats. They're kind of like cloak and dagger drone boats. You don't realize they have them, then suddenly cloak they drop them. Cloak and dagger drone boats. Yes. yes. Suddenly drones. <laughs> yeah. um, drones out of nowhere. I, I think it, it is worth mentioning. Um, We've seen Ishtars in both matches, which mm. is still a viable option. And quite frankly, those are really comfortable. Um, I know that uh, CCP Rise has completely ruined the Ishtar, but it still can <laughs> be used. Um, and even though we don't see the sentries used very often, because a lot of the meta or a lot of the, the team comps have used drones, mm -hmm. there are a lot of teams that are fielding smart bombs. And mm. the benefit of the Ishtar is you have that seal uh, that sentry. Um, option that you don't really have, you certainly don't have from a Gila, but even a VNI, you don't see it used all that often. So, but we can also like hope that these teams have brought something else and will go for a direct slugfest. And I, I hope so. We yeah. will see because the match is ready. So let's just stop yammering and uh, go straight out. Towers, free for all. Of Tower Wars. Welcome back. I am CCB Rise here with Elise Randolph, and we now have Castabouts versus Clockwork Pineapple. Uh, some exciting stuff going on here. We have a flagship in this match. Tell us a little about what's on the field. Yep, you guys didn't want too many drones, so Cla Castabouts and Clockwork Pineapple kind of obliged. Uh, Castabouts did bring some uh, Vexers and Ishkers, but they also have a Vindy and a Geddon on the beacon at zero. And uh, a few incursus is for tackle, so this is going to be good. Meanwhile, Clockwork Pineapple brought even more blasters. They brought their flagship Geddon, uh, three Astardes, some Heretics for anti-tackle, Crewer for tackle, just a single Griffin, because why not, and a Kestrel. Should mention, it could be rails. That looks like blasters, though. Yeah, I think they're I think they're in your face, uh, Astardes, which is even cooler. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the interesting thing is, both these teams, I mean, Castabouts brought their battleships to the beacon at zero, as you can see. Um, but... The other teams brought their support in at 50, but because the angle they chose, they're right next to each other. Like, they did not really expect to be this close to each other. As we see this Vindicator just charging balls outrageous. <laughs> and uh, you can see uh, neutralizers from the flagship Clockwork Pineapple Geddon heading over to both battleships on the castabout side. And those damps doing work as well, coming out of, uh, I don't even know what the start is, I guess. There's not a lot of room for uh, the Kestrels, I guess. Some, uh, Kestrels, too, but... Yeah. Um, 
So far, it looks like flat flagship Geddon is going to get its tank tested, but I imagine he'll be all right. Uh, we'll see how far away that Oniros is since it's under damp pressure and some frigs starting to take a lot of damage. Clockwork going for the support on the cast about side. Yeah, that's uh, an interesting call by them. Um, both teams actually have a fair amount of control. Clockwork has it in the form of newts, it seems. Uh, newts and dams, castabouts. They have, well, they have newts, but they're not as good as the uh, Clockwork Pineapple newts because Clockwork Pineapple have their flagship getting. And right now, they're, he's just focusing on that Vindy. He wants that Vindy to have no cap whatsoever. And they're just slowly but surely chewing through these incursuses. Um, you didn't really, I mean, these are star days. Of course, we'll dunk these incursuses through reps and everything, but you would assume this Vindicator would be able to do stuff uh, once it gets a web on someone. It's got a web maybe on the Onerios right now. Yeah, it could be. I'm trying to figure that yeah, out. Yeah, it, like it looks like a super web on that Onerios. It looks and so, and there's uh, a lot of other ships there too. It, it took quite a while, but those Ashimus did finally close and get their neutralizers uh, going on the Onerios. Uh, I don't know. So far, really nothing too important breaking. Both sides losing a little bit of frig support. Um, looks like Castabout's just having a hard time getting their damage anywhere. Uh, see if they can take down this Oniros. That would, of course, be a really big kill. And now some damage starting to go towards Castabout's onto some of their cruisers. Um, still anyone's match right now. Yeah, Castabout's making absolutely the right call going for this Clockwork Pineapple Oniros. Um, the longer this match goes on, the worse Castabout's will be in, or worse position Castabout's will be in because of these nudes. Um, in a long, drawn-out match, these newts really, really are bad for you. Uh, but Castabouts, I mean, they're doing it. They're doing it. They're killing the Sonerios. He's entering structure. He's about to die. He's gone. Now they can kill pretty much anything on the field that they get close to. And all this Vindigator has to do is hope he's got uh, cap charges. But at the same time, Castabouts lost their Oneros too. So, okay. Wow, went down so fast. Uh, yeah, or that was not paying attention. It I think like we just, just were kind of snoozing at the wheel here. Uh, wow. That that actually uh, no yeah I, I thought maybe boundary violation actually I just wanted to check but no he just went down really quick. Astartes must have just caught up to him. Uh, wish I could go back and look. <laughs> uh, Vex are going down for castabouts now without of course both sides now without logistics should start losing stuff a lot faster. There's uh, a Starte on the Clockwork Pineapple side going down pretty quick. I wonder why they were shooting at the Clockwork Pineapple Geddon originally and why they decided to switch. Um, maybe um, just a range thing, but yeah, it was probably a just to see that maybe they could like uh, get a really really good shots in on him with the uh, Lodgy being damaged, but the Lodgy was able to rep him. Right now, they're just slugging it out right now. And yeah. Astarte is dying for castabouts, but a Vexer uh, went down for castabouts. They have some tackle left alive of these in Ishkers, but the Ishkers are now kind of tackled. Um, it, it's, a, it's a bloodbath it's, out here. It's still pretty close right now, but it, it has to be a really good sign for Clockwork Pineapple that their flagship Geddon has newts on both battleships on the castabout side, but you don't yeah. see any neutralizers. Just now, neutralizers getting active on an Astarte uh, on the Clockwork Pineapple side. But it seems like the flagship Geddon is kind of winning this uh, cap war at the moment, and that's, that's of course, really, really good news for them. Yeah, the, uh, the Clockwork uh, dams are actually being incredibly effective. These, mm -hmm. uh, this Vindicator and Geddon, they're not be able to do that much, or as much as they want to do. Another Vexer's down on Castabout side. Losing damage hurts them a lot. I mean, they still have the Vindy, but the Vindy is a ship that, that really gets abused by uh, by having his cap. Uh, yeah, you can kite the Vindy. On it. You can kite the Vindy and the Geddon yep. to some extent. The Geddon's got drones, but the Saying Vindy that though, the Vindy is now closed on this uh, Astarte, and he's going down pretty fast now. The Vindy and the Geddon are both right there on top of him. See how far they have to go to get to that third Astarte. Yeah, Clockwork's not making the best of trades. They traded an Astarte for half of an Ashimu. Uh, probably want to wow, step they, up their uh, game a little bit. The, the last Clockwork Pineapple Astarte is actually basically just bailed. He's <laughs> like, he's really far away. Those do look like rails, actually, now that I look at it. So maybe that's why. But he's he's quite a ways off. So it's going to take a little time for this Vindy and Geddon to get caught up uh, to, to him. But if those... Yeah, this is a loser's chart, bracket. Find out if they're rails for sure. But they are battling for the pride of Syndicate. Both these teams live in Syndicate, and it looks like, man, I don't know. This Clockwork is going after this Vindicator, I guess, trying to test its tank. I mean, they're also like kind of shooting both <laughs> Ashimus. It's funny, people. Well, I guess it's not as relevant for this match, but we've had a like several matches now where there's like the match is spread all over the field, and there's kind of mini fights going on all over the place. You see heretics. Uh, taking damage too. Uh, they lost one already. We might have missed that, but uh, actually, it'll be really important as well if they can get these kestrels down. That'll take a lot of the damp pressure. Yeah, these uh, iskers the are actually the these iskers are Vindy. just kind of going out to these kestrels and this heretic and just murdering the uh, support wing. Wow, yeah, heretics all dead. down, kestrel down. There's only one kestrel left. Nice so job by the iskers there. 
Castabout's looking pretty strong right now. They went, like, it seemed like just a minute ago they, they kind of looked like they were in control, but things yeah. fell apart really quick. These Ishkers are doing a real good work, and Clockwork kind of just didn't really pay much attention to them. At the end of the match is when, like, uh, your tackle frigates and your tackle wing is really, really crucial. Um, Clockwork are losing their final star date. It's going to be down pretty soon. Lost an Ashmu, though. They did trade it for an Ashmu, but... I mean, when you only have two DPS ships, trading it for an Ashmu yeah. is probably not what you want. No, definitely not. It's a really interesting match. The Ashmu's is kind of a new thing. We haven't seen tons of those, maybe one here and there, but uh, just so much cap war on this cast about side. It almost seems like their plan is kind of um, use cap war to clear away for the Vindicator to just run around and kill everything. It, it's stra strange how it looked like it wasn't working, how the dams were kind of punishing them too much, and then suddenly they, they flipped things around. There goes the last to start day, so... Now basically just that flagship getting left on the Clockwork Pineapple side, and I yep. assume they'll have no problem taking him out. Castabouts are going to do it. They get to plant their flag in the only named solar system in Syndicate. <laughs> and uh, yeah, this getting I mean, they're going to have to catch up to him. They're going to have to use injectors and stuff. Maybe the Vindicator is going to look for some cap charges in some of these wrecks. But um, he's, he's eventually going to die. We've got three minutes. Like, he can't run forever. Yeah, yeah, he, he definitely will. Uh, if you're not familiar with the flagship rules, if you guys are just tuning in, we, we have a lot of restrictions about which modules are actually allowed in the tournament. Uh, for the most part, just Tech 2, uh, up to Tech 2 when it comes to meta uh, um, like level on the ships. In uh, this tournament, you can have one flagship, uh, which can fit a whole range of much more powerful modules, officer yeah. modules and faction modules. Uh, but if you lose that ship, you cannot bring another one. So uh, that doesn't matter uh, for most of these teams because it is a loser's bracket match. So the team actually just goes out anyway, dropping jet cans for some reason. Yeah, well, they got to make space for the loot because <laughs> yeah. this game might have some shiny loot in it. Yeah. Uh, another cool thing about the flagship is you can circumvent bans with it. So yes. if they, uh, if Castabouts had banned out the Geddon, Clockwork could be like, YOLO, I'm bringing my Geddon anyway. Um, but not, not anymore. They're not going to bring anything ever again until next year. <laughs> Uh, and then they just have to, to go and catch up with this Kestrel, and that will, yeah, be a win for them. Really nice job. It's fun to see the, uh, the Vindicator win. Uh, it's also, yeah, I was going to say earlier, like, uh, the anti-drone thing is funny. I feel like um, people, you know, they really like the idea of guns, but the drone matches are actually really interesting, especially as we moved away from sentries, and this year have a lot more of the mobile yeah. drones. It seems like the match, like, the field has just opened up a lot more. Rather than everybody crashing into each other early on, there's a lot of strategy yeah, and how the team spreads and out. Around. And exactly, and, and I think that's actually is very important, uh, really fun to watch, even though uh, it doesn't maybe feel quite as uh, nice as, as, like, autocannons all the time does. Yeah. Not that I don't hate drones, I do hate drones, <laughs> but I just, you know, I've actually, it's been a nice thing that's developed out of the drone meta in the tournament. Yeah, there's a little bit of hatred. So, um, <laughs> just waiting for Duck Slayer to finally die. He's probably just gonna, he's way off on his own. Uh, cast routes are just kind of taking this time to, to loot the field, make sure nothing really good dropped. Can take uh, the opportunity also to let you guys know if you didn't tune in for the last two weekends. Um, this is the third weekend of four, by the way. And uh, one other kind of new rule thing we have going on this year uh, for the first time is we have micro jump drive beacons placed in a cube uh, in the arena. So um, we've had a lot of funny boundary violations already as people yep. try to move themselves across and get aligned a little incorrectly. I am personally the grateful arena. for the, uh, the micro jump beacons because they did save PL. Uh, in their last match. They're really cool. But anyway, match is over. Uh, congratulations, Castabouts. We'll go back to the studio and see you guys in a minute. You want to stay up to date on the market? You spend most of your time blowing stuff up, but you want to know why Plex are so damn high? Then watch Eve Talk, your weekly look at the market in EVE Online. Eve Talk with me, the Lone Wolf, every Saturday, only on YouTube. Test uh, has sort of a poisonous leadership. Poisonous leadership. Poisonous leadership. Poisonous leadership. Poisonous leadership.
Welcome back to the studio. Uh, I'm CCP Gargant, joined here by Apophne, Sir Squeeples and Bacchanalian. And I'd like to say that YOLO indeed, and now uh, Clockwork Pineapple, no longer. No. No longer with us. I feel like we cursed them. Three yes. of us chose Grun and one of us did not. And no, you're just bad at predicting. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Uh, I'm very happy for my uh, castabout friends. Uh, that they made it through the tournament. And uh, it seems that we're sort of looking at when the uh, core drone ships are banned, we're sort of looking at people, instead of just bringing something that has drones, they're bringing mm. like other setups with other themes that do other things. I like that. I, I like that I, a lot. I do like that as well. Yeah. And we didn't see a tinker. Uh, yeah, cool. that's that was a pleasant surprise. I don't get to hear you whine about it. <laughs> <laughs> he still can't. One of the, one of the <laughs> things we bad. see a lot, I think, is um, my favorite thing in the game, which is like a big Galente heavy like blaster in your face setups. So they're, they're always really, really fun to watch. You know, you don't just kind of have a match where both sides logic are holding, they're trying to switch targets, and it can be very kind of boring to look at sometimes. Whereas when you have these big Galente Vindi Astarte setups, like each team mashes into each other, ships are dying all over the place, and it's massive, massive bloodbath. Just pour a waterfall of damage. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's a think, crucial amount yeah. of damage, even. Crucial amount. I, uh, I think the, my favorite ship there was the Ashmu. I think that's a really interesting yeah. pick. Um, it's worth noting that the Ashmu, now that it's been rebalanced some months ago, or uh, fairly recently, but uh, it has infinite NOS properties now. So even if that Armageddon wanted to limit their effectiveness by capping them out, they could NOS from the Armageddon all day long. Um, mm. And while that probably wouldn't pressure the Armageddon too much, it's just an interesting mechanic that both sides really relied on heavy nuke pressure. And I think the, even though the Armageddon was a flagship for Clockwork, I think the Geddon plus two Ashmu combo for Castabouts was like the perfect choice in, in that match. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the, they obviously learned from Roque Capel, who liked the, like their cat. Obviously. Obviously, obviously. Yeah, obviously. Yeah. obviously, they're taking notes. That's good. Yeah. Uh, that's a good strategy. Um, <laughs> Best way to learn. Right? But yeah, it's, it's like the old school NOS from back in the day. When right. they, that's how they worked, and it was way overpowered. Back in the days of NOS dummies, and we're happy to be done with those. But uh, <laughs> but let's uh, let's move on to the next yeah, match yeah, to talk sure. about the bands at least. So we have to keep this. Yeah. Have to keep this going. Uh, the Devil's Warrior Alliance versus Quebec United Legions is next, and the Devil's Warrior Alliance banned out the Eos and the Ishtar. And the Quebec United Legion spent out the Oneros. Are you listening, mm -hmm. <laughs> Elise? Uh, and Rattlesnake. Yeah. So now we have a, a spot for healers open. Well, the great thing if you're Quebec is that you don't really care about bands because they seem to just pick a random hodgepodge of ships to bring in. Mm. Um, they're very kitchen sink friendly. They're very fun to watch. Um, but they had materials and a host of shiny frigate support in the last match. So. I think they probably have some unconventional metas based on what they've done. Um, Devil's Warriors, I'm surprised they didn't go with more armor stuff earlier. I expected them to be an armor group. Um, but they did fly Gila's, and those were banned in this match? No, maybe? Yes? No, they were not. Nope. Okay, well, they might fly Gila's again. They actually did it pretty successfully. Um, they did lose, but uh, yeah. Well, I'm going to be the odd man out who's going to be right this time. I'm going to get to be smug next time. I'm going with Quebec United Legions. I, I want to see the flag phone. Did it? Didn't die? No, it lived. It was lived. the only one that yeah. lived. Right. Oh, so wow. the flag phone, typhoons. This is going to be fantastic. Yeah. yeah. I'm bring, hoping. Bring out the big guns. I'm going to ruin his lone man out scenario. <sighs> Killing and I'm I'm also going to pick Quebec because win or lose, I, don't think, I am I don't think you can about. change like that. I see Devil's Warriors underlined. You well, the line, to Twitter. the line doesn't mean that's who I'm choosing. It's a complex <laughs> system. We don't have time to explain it. On the fly adjustments are allowed. Right, yes. There are no rules about that. Yeah. Right. I won't disqualify you, I promise. You're ruining the superstition and my shot at being right. Apothne? Yeah, I mean, um, like, uh, like Bax said, I really want to see another Foon team. As I said before, Foon team is my favorite. I think the Devil's Warrior Alliance is, is, a, is, is a team that brings interesting setups. Like, they, they, ha they make some interesting choices, just like in the, in the support wing sometimes, and I'm really interested to see what they bring. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm going with the Devil's Warrior Alliance as well, because um, I bet on Quebec the first uh, round, and they <laughs> failed me then. Mm. You only fail me once. <laughs> <laughs> For the last time. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing some, uh, some Gilas on the field, because there probably will be. If yeah. there won't be, uh, I'll be very, very, uh, I'll look really stupid, but I want to echo Rice's words that uh, we're seeing mobile drones this mm -hmm. tournament. Mm -hmm. And that makes a lot of, lot of difference when you see people burning around to try to get away from drones, uh, sort of somehow, I don't know, tanking or kiting them. Mm -hmm. In some way, uh, the typhoons. Maybe they're gonna run nano perhaps. Old school, <laughs> yeah. That would 
probably not work, but yeah. yeah. The smart bomb phones, those are popular in, in Rancer, aren't they, the Typhoon? I, I don't know, I don't go to Rancer. No? No. You've never been potted Rancer? No, I take my haulers full of Plex <laughs> elsewhere. I some nanofoons before the warp speed changes, and then the warp speed changes happened, and I stopped running right. battleship. Right, mm -hmm. that's, that's true. I used to fly, yeah, Nano Tempest, Macarials, well, yeah. Nano you, Panther even. You must all remember that there are two things to win in this uh, tournament. It's victory itself and uh, our respect. And you don't win our respect by doing something predictable and boring. That's yeah, that is. Right. So right. nanofoons. Right. So it's all about the style points. Yeah. That, that's why we don't, we're not going to respect drones or tankers and anything else. <laughs> You're not going to respect tankers, that's <laughs> yeah, for yeah. sure. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I, like I said, I, I'm really interested to see what the setups are going to be. This is going to be fantastic. Yeah, Quebec is always exciting. That's the great thing. Yeah. Like, this is not going to be boring, even if it's a complete wash. It's going to be exciting. Yeah. No, all the boring. Sometimes cold, though. All the boring matches happened on the first day when teams didn't know what they were doing, but everybody's an expert yes, now. Yes, yes. Right. Everyone has gone pro on this one. Well, yeah. to some, some extent, I mean, they get to see the meta, right? You get to watch all the matches. You get to watch the, the good, you know, better whatever teams you want to say and what they're bringing and watch the way they're piloting. So, it, it, you know, it's kind of, you're, you're joking, but it, in reality, it does, it does help the teams along. Um, they may not have the practice in the setups, but the setups tend to improve as the tournament goes on. So, mm. yeah. Well, I just got word that the match is ready, so we are uh, bang on time and getting this <laughs> back back together. But um, I think we'll just send it over to Rice, Rice and Elise in the commentator corner. Welcome back to the Alliance Tournament. Have a look at that awesome pizza sheet in front of you. About to do some serious work here in the Devil's Warrior Alliance versus Quebec United Legions. I'm CCB Rise here with Elise Randolph. A lot of fun stuff to tell you in this match. First of all, in the last match, we saw the uh, Armageddon flagship die. It did have five officer newts running up a bill of about 12 billion isk. And we may get a little more of that in this match because we have the uh, Typhoon flagship for Quebec United Legions. Yep, you guys wanted to... Uh some interesting stuff and you got it so quebec might not be going for a traditional win but they will definitely win respect they've got a bargus typhoon core with um, some core axes a missile kite team versus devil's warrior alliance and a more traditional slept near uh, claymore gila uh, comp with some worms and molluses as support um, they both came in at 50 but they were actually very close to each other again on the warp in so you see devil's warrior alliance is right now charging Zerging into the uh, Quebec United Legions team, and Quebec are just, they're just trying to blap down a Gila. Just a <laughs> whole bunch of missile kiting along. Uh, uh, it's actually really interesting, the Scimitar is taking quite a bit of damage as well, even though the target painters are on uh, one of the Gilas, so... Uh, kind of weird spreading damage out already. The Scimitar for Quebec United Legion just got webbed. That's bad news. Um, we'll have to see where this is going. There is quite a bit of damage uh, coming into the Devil's Warrior team, so uh, I really, really want these Bargas to win. Uh, uh, they're going to get the first kill. They're going to take down this Gila. Yeah, Gila down, and that's a lot of DPS gone for the Devil's Warrior Alliances. Um, they've caught the Quebec United Legion Scimitar, but they're not doing too much. Okay, now, now it's sort of uh, dying horribly right now. But at the same time, Quebec are, are shooting, I guess, the Scimitar? Oh, no, they're just going straight for another Gila based on where the uh, Painters are. Oh, Scimitar going really low. He just took a whole bunch of damage. And Jones he's gone. Him. Out he goes. So now one for one. Lodge getting lost on the Quebec United Legion side. That's bad news. The flagship Typhoon getting tackled immediately is also bad news. Yeah, he was kind of a little bit too close to that Simi because the Simi did have damps on it. Um, let's see. It looks like Quebec United Legion are just trying to kill off some of these tackle. Um, body uh, shock and the worm. Kestrel just went down. Worm, why, that's, I guess, yeah, they're trying to, they want to go for the long game kiting here and just take out the tackle so that they're uh, less vulnerable in those kiting battleships. But 
Uh, that's going to take some time. They were able to take Worm out. That's good. I mean, the, it's yeah, a good the worms sign they were able to do it that quickly. But uh, The Worms like the Ishka are really nice because they can apply their damage and, and from quite far away because their damage is all drone-based. Uh, it's not a huge amount, but it's still a good amount. Uh, Devil's Warrior Alliances are now focusing right on the Quebec United Legion's Typhoon flagship. Another uh, Gila taking a whole lot of damage. Yeah, Quebec wow. returning a lot of damage here. They, they've taken out two of the Molluses as well. Just lost both Ooh. their Kestrels. That's, this that's Typhoon not good. is melting fast, though. Yeah, he's got the Claymore and Scimitar right on top of him now, along with the Gila drones, and he's going down quick. He is boosting, of course. Has an ASP, oh, but it doesn't gone. matter. Down he goes. Morale flagship down. The <laughs> only flag foon of the tournament, and it's gone forever. Gila going into armor, though. They are going to take him out to get another kill there. That's that's pretty good. They they could potentially get themselves in a in a kind of end match here where they're able to do a lot of kiting with the two bar guys. Yeah, exactly. If they can like just escape and just keep kiting, and um, they might be able to pull this one out, but I don't know. Quebec United Legions got a little bit lucky in some of their other matches, and right now one of their Bargus is, is sort of eating it. He's got a... <laughs> Bit of an active tank going on. He's not tackled, which is a really good sign. Uh, if he's like the Typhoons, he should have... Whoa. Why did my lock break? He didn't... I don't know. I thought he'd bounce your but he didn't. That's good. <laughs> now one of the Bargus is webbed. That's that's definitely very bad news. Yeah, but this... Uh, it looks like the Merlin's doing the webbing, and... maybe Oh, another Bargus is taking a lot of damage. The webbed one. And this... Uh, and now damage going back onto the Devil's Warrior team is slowing down a lot. You can see yeah. them still trying to chip away at the frigates to keep keep themselves clear of tackle, but you see right here Claymore sitting right on top of that first Bargast. And uh, so he's not going anywhere. Taking out the tackle isn't going to do them any good. I, I'm a little surprised. I mean, maybe it's just the core axes and the flycatcher, and that's that's fine. I can't tell what the Bargasts are actually shooting at, but... Um, Putting so much energy into killing that those tackle ships really cost them as they trade Typhoons and Bargasts. Uh, back, but yeah, it could have just been the Corax and Flycatcher, which are really, really good anti-tackle platforms. The missiles really shred through the tackle. Uh, they got the molluses down in short order, and yeah. but right now this is this is not the trade Quebec United League want. <laughs> no, Vargas they number have one, one down. Vargas against pretty much the world. Uh, and now that they left the the Scimitar until the end, they have no hope of breaking anything right. except for the Scimitar. Um, Quebec United Legion actually do have a good amount of damps, and they're spreading them out. Pretty effectively, to be honest. Yeah. So I think your best bet is probably just to throw them all on the scimitar right now and just try and kill something. It could be, but also the scimitar isn't like there. He has no uh, incentive to not be right on top of, yeah. of his buddies. Like yeah. he he can go anywhere in the arena, and he's equally exposed to the damage coming from the Quebec team. So it doesn't hurt him at all to follow them around really close. And you can see he's able to rep. He has reps active on his entire team right now, yeah, uh, despite those damps. So he's actually trying to. Uh, Trying to loot the Vulture Wreck, it seems like, this Scimitar. He's right next to it. There's no Vulture Wreck. Uh, well, there's there's going to be a, there's gonna ah, be a Vulture see, Wreck. See, see, like, he wants all the loot, so he's hanging right next okay. to the Vulture. <laughs> um, Quebec United Legion losing their Vulture, but they also have their final Bargast webbed. He was quite far away from everything, but he ended up getting caught by this one worm. And uh, well, Now the bigger ship's caught up, the command ships as well. You can see, going to take him out. Ah, I think, are these the first Bargast we've seen? They are, they are. We've seen some Orthrus. We've yeah. seen some Garmers, but this yeah. is the only time we've seen a Bargast. I have a strange feeling this might be the only time we will <laughs> see the Bargast. Um, Quebec United Legion's clearly having fun with this thing. They brought Macarials in a really fun setup last time. Then they had three Foons that won in glorious faction, uh, fashion against uh, Choke Point in the first uh, match. But yeah, it looks like this. we're going to have to wait till next year to see uh, what other zany things they can bring. Potentially a really expensive match here for Quebec United Legions, depending on how that Typhoon is fit. Those bar guests aren't cheap either. They're looking at losing, I mean, uh, you know, four or five bill or something just just in the ships they brought to the match. Yeah. Maybe, I mean, you don't, three, but you don't choose a flag food just to get around bans. Like, you want to put some cool stuff on yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Because no one's what, ever going to ban a food, <laughs> but... Uh, anyway, last Bargast did go down. They're going to start chipping away at this Vulture that they stopped shooting earlier when they switched to the Bargast. He should go down pretty quick, and then it'll just be some of the support. Um, how come people are bringing... We've seen uh, already today, I know the question came up some last couple weeks, What Flycatchers and uh, Heretics. Um, we've seen a lot of them, which uh, strikes some folks as strange because, of course, there's no warp disrupting in the tournament, no need for bubbles. Yeah, exactly. I mean, they're very cheap on points, and you get a lot of slots for those points. Uh -huh. And they go pretty fast. And especially the Flycatcher and Heretic, they're very, very good at killing like these small frigate wings. Mm -hmm. And small frigate wings do actually win championships. So like they're very vital to deal with. But uh, Quebec pretty much out of stuff now. Almost only that one Flycatcher left. They just caught up to one of the Coraxes. 
Uh, pretty nice fight here. I am sad Quebec United Legions is going to be leaving us. This is uh, <laughs> one of the most fun setups we've seen just in terms of silliness. And uh, It looks like Nelly might be trying to make a break for the arena edge. I'm not sure. He's going pretty fast. <laughs> Nelly. Uh, Nelly in the flycatcher. QC Brawley got caught and went down. Too bad for him. Just the one flycatcher Yeah, this left. is it. So Quebec United Legions eliminated. Devil's Warrior Alliance move on. Um, but, I mean, Quebec United Legions may be losing the match, but they definitely won the respect. They've got the, I mean, until <laughs> the we flag see food in the bar guests. Yeah, exactly. Until we see some more bar guests. Or, uh, this is the only flag food in the term tournament, is that right? Yep, yeah, the only so one. I think the only one that's ever. It'll be, it'll be hard for tournament. someone else to live up to it. What are the most popular flagships in the tournament this year? What are people um, People really using? like uh, Balgorns and uh -huh. Geddens. I think those are the most popular among some of the top, uh, top tier teams. Rattlesnakes are also very popular uh, because they have so much utility. Mm hmm. Um, there actually were a few Vindicators, which were throwbacks mm -hmm. to sort of last year's Alliance tournament. Mm -hmm. Again, if you can throw like a Tobias Webb on a Vindicator, it's got a super web at 50 kilometers. It's really nice. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it seems people are going for the Geddon Balgorn sort of thing. So much utility, so much new pressure. The way the micro jump beacons work is, uh, since there's like a cube of a hundred kilometer blinks, you can almost always be in newt range if you're in a flag Balgorn mm -hmm. and a flag Geddon. Yeah, that's true. That it does help uh, those cat warships, which can be kited. They're very, usually very slow. Both Balgorn and Geddon have a hard yeah. time actually moving around the arena. So um, if they can't reach with the newts, they're pretty useless. But the the MGD things help a lot with that. Although they are, of course, risky. We've seen uh, they are very dangerous. But you do have to risk it to, to get the biscuit, as they say. <laughs> as they say. So flycatcher. Uh, really turning the uh, morale victory around for Quebec United <laughs> Legions by flying around for no reason. The most dishonorable thing to do in the tournament. Yeah, yeah. Well, he just wants his uh, moment of glory. Well, he got it when they brought a flag foon <laughs> and some bar guests. And he's yeah, really but he got stuck in the flycatcher, which is kind of like a, a that normal is, ship. That like, is true. That is true. Normal people bring flycatchers, but... Yeah, yeah, so we got a few minutes left. Um, what did Devil's you Warrior Alliance bringing healers. Uh, not banned yeah. out. We usually see them banned out. Yeah, is this something that like people you think should be banning out? Or? I wonder. I wonder if. Um, I mean, you can see. Yeah, Oniros Rattlesnake is a little strange for Quebec United Legions. Uh, I would. I'm surprised they didn't want armor since armor should be a little easier to kite. But yeah, I would have thought Hilo would have been good. I mean, obviously Hilos are just fine against kiting teams. So yeah, it, those drones can just zoom zoom around. We know and they're catch. one of the most kind of generally powerful ships in the tournament format this year. So mm -hmm. it seems like it would have been sensible to knock those out. Uh, I was going to say that if they had banned something like Ishtars and maybe something like Dominix's first, just that sentries are a little more threatening to the kiting setup and maybe they were okay with medium drones being on the field. But Yeah, and they uh, had to make their bans okay. before we saw the matches today, so they didn't get to see how the uh, Ishtars exploded. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, oh, they caught up to the flycatcher. Oh. With only 10 seconds left. Such an intense moment. Really <laughs> kill him in time. Yes, he does. Boom, headshot. All right. Match over. Congratulations, Devil's Warrior Alliance. We'll go back to the studio and see you guys in a few minutes for Nesta Vipers and Sleeper Social Club. Nope. Dead Terrace in 4th District. Kill the thingy. A thingy just landed. Okay, align to that territorial thingy. Kill the kill the na uh, kill the na uh, thingy. That snow get thingy. Starburst, starburst, starburst. Kill the uh, kill the thingies. Welcome back to the studio. Uh, I am super saddened that the flattle ships didn't win. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, God. But, uh, oh my God. <laughs> they brought the kitchen sink and the... Ah, the... Uh, th that's not a spatula. It's uh, more of a... Frying pan. Yeah. He said a pizza tray. What, 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 I forgot what he uh, said yeah, specifically, pizza, but... Something. It's obvious what people eat around this office. Right? Yeah? <laughs> yeah. What, what do you see in the bar guest? <laughs> I'm super happy to have seen uh, the bar guest in the tournament, though. These yes. are the first ones we see. They did well. Uh, I feel it was because they targeted the wrong thing initially. 
Mm. Yeah, especially, I mean, th their entire comp is something that we've seen in previous tournaments where all you emphasize is projection. You give up some DPS by going with cruise missiles, but you can't run from that damage. Uh, so uh, target painters can amplify it, tackle obviously amplifies it, but the entire idea is that you pick something early and you say, hey, guess what, you can't run from us, and you melt it. They didn't execute on that. I mean, they had a tough set of ships to break. The Gila with the resist bonus is not the greatest one to pick, in my opinion. Um, but they tried. And not only did, did they try, they looked good doing it. Yeah. That, that was what was <laughs> really important. This, important. Yeah. Absolutely. They had their priorities straight. This is yeah. what I was talking about, earning yeah. respect, mm -hmm. winning respect. Oh, yeah. they've got mine, for sure. Yeah. Um, I'm disappointed. I think I cursed them again by choosing them. So You're just bad at predictions. <laughs> I'll continue to say this. There is no such thing as a commentator curse, just incompetence. Uh, I, don't, I don't know. I am, very I sad am going to make a happy check. <laughs> yeah. Two for two. I mean, this is, this is you know, the Quebec United Legion. This is the region that, you know, puts gravy and cheese on their fries, and it's fantastic. You figure that you just have to go with them, but uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's good. Does that not sound really good right now? I'm mentioning that I'm hungry. He, he's been talking about being hungry <laughs> for the past five minutes quietly while I'm trying to watch PvP. It's Can I get a change seat assignment or something after that? <laughs> I, no. I think actually that's coming up soon. So. No, very good. Oh. Very good. But yeah, that was, that was a good match, and uh, it was well flown by doubles. I mean, they were yes. up kind of against a, a, a weird setup. I don't really understand the Bargast. I mean, it does have mid slots for utility, but as we mentioned... Uh, the point is not really that big of a deal, the tackle bonus. Uh, defensive scram on a battleship is a little bit hard to sell. It could be so, a tackle battleship. A, a tackle ship? A well, no, like that didn't play. That didn't play. Yeah, I take that back. Oh. I take that back. That went down like a lead balloon. It, yeah, well. <laughs> That's what we do here. <laughs> <laughs> we are a board of nerds that can't pronounce stuff, apparently. Mm. Apparently not. But uh, I think the Devil's Warrior Alliance uh, won in the fact that the way they called their targets. Mm -hmm. uh, going for a going for a healer first is not how you win a match. I think you should. Even I know you yeah. should go for something else than those guys. Unless you can get it tackled super well, you know it's it's got great speed. It's got that tank bonus. You can have such a hard time applying DPS to it, and then when you do get some DPS on it, you've got to burn through that tank. Yeah, yeah, exactly. This comes back to the point that you should just bring smart bombs to take care of drones. I mean, you're not wrong. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best right? kind of is. Yeah. Oh. Maybe we'll see it. I don't know, but you know, well, I think we, we we saw smart bombs earlier on, and what resulted was they smart bomb their own rep drones off the field. So, yeah. See, that is somebody I would not uh, take in my fleets of smart bombs. <laughs> mm. But we can't all be heroes. Mm, nope. The next match that we have coming up is uh, uh, the Dead Terrorist versus the Fourth District. I am very interested to see how this goes because uh, I've been telling you this story and a lot of other people. For those of you who watched uh, FanFest this year, 4th uh, District were reputably having a very uninteresting Alliance panel uh, presentation and were war attacked by five or six different entities because of it. I wouldn't know anything about that whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you held the talk for waffles. It went, it went great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm. Um, but no, to, going back to the match, I think that this is going to be a really cool match in that both teams have a very history in the Alliance tournament. Mm -hmm. Both teams have uh, put on a lot of performance. Neither of them have gotten really, really far before, but both of them are very well respected in the tournament community as right. teams that you know can really you know put on a good show at the very I, least. I think you just said both these teams have a very long history of not doing well in the tournament. Yeah, and based that on was the a fact you're wording, yeah, yeah, you're, you're gonna. You're I gonna was get trying to now. be nice. You that. <laughs> yeah. Waffles. I'm sorry. There's gonna be a war deck coming. Oh, like they would care. <laughs> The, uh, I, I think the fact that 4th District brought a really strange armor tinker that relied on a rapier that died almost instantly, they're showing their intent to continue on this, this path of storied mediocrity. Um, so I, I hope they, they don't make a meta mistake like they did last time. Um, they, uh, this should be another good match, actually, because yeah. uh, Dead Terrorist is kind of a wild card. I, I give them a really hard time all the time, uh, and I'm going to continue regardless of how this match turns out. Um, but it's another one that both teams have access to, I think, a lot of friends and a lot of uh, experienced pilots who could help them set stuff up. Um, and I think it could be good. It could be terrible, but 80% <laughs> chance I think that it's going to be good. Well, judging from the bans, uh, you're still right. Uh, that terrorists have banned the Scimitar and the Ishtar, uh, and 4th District banned the Eos and the... The Larry, the Gila. Yes, ah, I'm going Larry, with, yeah. going with Karkar's pronunciation of this, yeah. the Larry. Right. I like it. So, uh, what do you think? What are they bringing? I, I think uh, I think you know that that's kind of uh, fairly consistent with what we've seen tournament through. All you know, really popular ships. 
Um, I think that there is a possibility of a tinker back. I'm sorry. I think mm. I think we may see one. Um, but but yeah, I think that there's nothing really out of place, anything unusual with those bands. Is there a place to get like t-shirts made in Reykjavik? I can go get an I Hate Tinkers t-shirt to wear? Uh, we have weekend? an entire week. The, you uh, can tell. I think there's time for this. No, the answer to that is you get it as a tattoo. <laughs> <laughs> and then you don't have to worry about so, yeah, forgetting your t-shirt. Yeah, Kribble will have nothing on me if I <laughs> yeah. 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 So you can just like go along and just go, boing! You never I mind Tinkers. Tinkers. Bar. I Hate Tinkers. Yeah. Yeah. The, ma the match is ready, so uh, your predictions, gentlemen. Well, I'm going to doom dead terrorists by predicting that they're going to win. Oh. And I'm happy you've done it. I'll go fourth district. <laughs> I too have picked dead terrorists. Thanks, Mac. I'm going with dead terrorists because um, they uh, are a wild card. I like wild cards. That means that Squeebles is going to be right. Fourth district will win. I think in this one, I'm, I, unless there's a gate now on field that they can camp, I'm pretty sure dead terrorists is going to fold. And with that, fighting words, we go <laughs> to the commentary booth. I Take trees and smoke in them trees. This Avoda Lions, represented by Pandora Spear and Viper Fleet Inc. Hello again, and thanks for watching the EVE Online Alliance Tournament. I'm CCP Rice here with Elise Randolph. This is Dead Terrace versus the Force District, and awesome stuff on the field for both teams once again. Today's been uh, pretty cool in terms of setup so far. Yeah, it seems like the meta is shifting a little bit away from the drones. Of course, many of the drone platforms were banned in this particular match. No EOS, no Gila, no Ishtar. Um, so Dead Terrorist is just going throwback missile kite team. They've got Nighthawk, Claymore, a few Serbs, a Bellicose for some painting. Flycatcher and Caracals, and they came in at range to the beacon. Yeah, uh, and some of you may have noticed, but there's no Lodgy on that team. Pretty yeah. interesting choice there. And then 4th District, uh, going with Armageddon, Astartes, which we've seen once today already, maybe twice. And these are real Astartes, which the last ones were as well. Both yep. of them choosing to go with rails rather than blasters. So that's a good thing for them up against a kite team like this. And of course, both teams bringing plenty of damps. Flycatcher down already, wow. Yeah, but the Dead Terrors definitely won the damp war. Look at all these damps applied to everything. Whoa. They completely wrecked the 4th District in that thing. They're now going to be shooting some, I guess, a Merlin to get rid of more damps. I, wow. I think Dead Terrors <laughs> probably want to be shooting this Guardian, but yeah, nothing really is dying. Maybe we... Maybe it's a lot of posturing, like they're trying to get separated a little bit. It's really interesting that the Guardian is the one thing on the team that doesn't have any <laughs> damp supplied to it. Yeah, you, you figure you'd probably want to damp everything else and kill the Guardian, but no, they are damping everything and killing a Merlin. Yeah, it looks like uh, all of the damage from the Dead Terrorist team is actually going to that Merlin, uh, and he just doesn't care one bit. Uh, yep. But this is another thing of <laughs> applying your control, because you see Dead Terrace have a smaller control bar than 4th District, but it's all filled up. Dead 4th um, District have, well now they're getting a little bit higher up, but they have a pretty big control bar, but they're not able to apply anything. Right now they're just uh, damping a Claymore and painting it, but they, they can't shoot it. These Astartes need lock, this Ged needs lock. I'm a little surprised the 4th District isn't trying to move aggressively at least towards uh, the dead terrorist team. They really don't mind uh, being super close. I mean, the Astartes might have some more trouble kiting. I guess they don't want to leave maybe the Geddon behind, and so they're kind of limited by that. But um, the dead terrorist damage is going to hit them no matter what because it's all missile based. Yeah. So I would think they would try to close range a little bit to, to mitigate the damn pressure. But for now, it's still a pretty long range standoff, probably 40 or 50k between both teams. Okay, that was some pretty slow reps on the. Uh the Merlin there, he might actually go down. Nope, he got caught. Wow, it's crazy. Chains word is going to get caught. He yeah, can completely rips. keep the Merlins up, but it looks like, yeah, if they if they target swap uh, like really well, I mean, if they if they keep trying that, they might actually be able to get through one of the Merlins. Well, an issue here is that 4th District has a lot of rep drones as well, which, I mean, you can just leave the rep drones on one Merlin yeah. and throw the reps on another. 
Um, but it looks like Dead Terrors are definitely trying to poke and prod through these Merlins. I have no idea why. Okay, now they're painting the Guardian. It looks like the Bellicos finally got the lock it wanted, and they're going for him now. But they're going to trade, like, the shields of a Guardian for the shields of their Claymore. That's horrible. Yeah, the Claymore going down is obviously a disaster. One one reason, you know, I, I was just talking about them closing range. I guess the reason they don't need to is even though their stamps across the entire team, the Astartes are guns active. Like, they've been they've been able, they're at a range where they can lock, so they're happy to just be here, yeah. keep putting pressure on that Claymore, and with no Lodgy, I mean, he's really going to struggle. It's possible that he was in reload and has gotten the ASB active again, and that's why he's starting to level out, or that he's actually pulling some range as well. He's flying away from the Astartes trying to get those damps too. It's not going that fast, though. You figure, like, a Kiting Claymore... Yeah. That's that's kind of leaking into armor. Maybe he's just bait tanking. Maybe it's this is some like <laughs> next level piloting. Uh, but you know, in the meantime, Dead Terror is not making any progress against that Guardian. Really, he's having no trouble with the Rep drones, just keeping his armor topped off for the most part. Yeah, and you can see all the Rep drones. Some of the drones are coming back, and it looks like they might be swapping some of their drones around. I don't know why Dead Terrorists are swapping their drones, but whatever. That's what they're doing. <laughs> uh, this. This, yeah, there's it's no kind of rep bots there. <laughs> I don't know if they had them before, but Dead Terrace is all Valkyries and Warriors. Although, yeah, none of them are on the other side of the field. They're just pulling them back. Maybe yeah. maybe the Fourth District support the Merlins were starting to kill them, and so they just decided to, to save to save, save their them. drones for later. Yeah, yeah, until after the support's not there. And it looks like they've now given up on the Guardian. They've gone back to trying to switch the Merlins into to getting one down. I'm sure that. Um, getting that structure damage on the one was uh, made it feel like that's possible for them. So fourth district are doing the right thing tactically at least. When you're up against the kite team, they're balling up, they're forming a battle ball and saying, "Okay, you can't just pick us off. Yeah, you have to sit a range, and we're going to be all right next to each other." It's uh, especially with the dams. It'll really help out in case someone swaps the dams to the guardian at some point. Uh, so. Good tactics. I mean, 4th District have obviously practiced against some sort of kiting team, or, or they know mm -hmm. what to do. And we should see the damage pick up again now. It looks like the, uh, the uh, probably uh, majority of the ships on the Terrace team are rapid light fit, and the uh, reload just finished. So yeah. I saw volleys take off across the field, and we'll see if that uh, kind of helps them make any progress. But it doesn't really look like it, and now the Claymore is breaking. So... Bad news for Dead Terrorists. Yeah, he stopped uh, bait tanking, and uh, <laughs> maybe he's like super, super bait tanking in structure, but I'm pretty sure that Claymore's going to go down. That's going to take off a significant amount of their links as well. Yeah. The Nighthawk obviously can fit too as well, but I don't know. This this Claymore going down, now he's moving really fast. He picked up speed. He kind of lit a fire under, under himself, but he is going to go down? Probably. I mean, it's, it's totally possible that he can get out of lock range of everything, and there isn't a... Uh, there isn't any fourth district drones on that side of the match. You can, you can, well, I can see he's 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 actually gotten far enough away to break all the locks. It looks like, and he's <laughs> not taking he's any damage again. He's doing it. He is definitely bait tanking instruction now. Wow, that's pretty next level. <laughs> this is really good bait tanking. Uh, look at this swarm of rep bots around this guardian. They are not able to do anything. No. At some point, these serves and caracals are going to have to kill uh, the rep drops for for fourth district. Yep. Did we just see one explode, or is that just? Uh, me having a stroke. <laughs> okay, no, it was the Merlin taking damage, or the Mollus taking damage. So yeah, dead terrorists are not focusing on these rep drones at all. They really need to right now. I can't believe the Claymore is still alive. <laughs> it's pretty awesome. Well, he's, he's next level. He's, he's got to be, I mean, one thing that uh, I can try to confirm, but if... Uh, fourth district keeps inching them. Wow, which they're not. They're actually flying away from the dead terrorist team. But if they keep inching towards the arena edge, mm -hmm. eventually they could get back in range of that claymore. But it looks like since they're headed kind of away from the dead terrorist team, he uh, he might last a while still. Of course, he's not contributing anything other than the links. But that's still a lot better than having him die. Yeah, I mean, I think we're maybe right now fourth district are saying, okay, we've got the lead. Yeah, we're not a tinker by any means, but let's just kind of their DPS is abysmal. Yeah. Uh, dead terrorist DPS is they can't apply it very well. So fourth district might just say, we're just gonna take a four point win, cut yeah. it out. Why not? Uh, you're absolutely right. The the pressure is all on dead terrorist to make something happen, and the only thing they've gotten anywhere close to is getting uh, damage onto a frigate, which they would have to kill several of to uh, pull the match back. And it doesn't even look like they're capable of that. So fourth district kind of turning their team into a tinker. <laughs> I'm just saying, like, you have to find a way to break us or we're just going to win uh, so off your flycatcher loss. The neat thing about these Astartes is they have a pretty big drone bay for a battle cruiser, and yeah. they can fit five medium rep bots each. So, And the Geddon can fit five heavy ones. Mm -hmm. So that is a lot of repping power. Like, a lot yeah. of people just, obviously, like, people like that terrorist just say, whatever, we don't, we don't really need to kill these things, but... Yep. That's it's why they're uh, losing a match. Really interesting. I, I think... Um, 
it's really cool to see the turret ships get rewarded. Like this is the only DPS we've had in several <laughs> matches that isn't delayed in some way. Yeah. Like they alf they didn't get to kill anything after the damps got applied, but because the Astartes could volley him on the first lock, they uh, they're actually ahead in this match. So turret ships getting rewarded pretty heavily in a meta that's. Uh, basically drone, drone dominant for the most part. Though at the same time they are being saved by drones. So yeah, their own drones are saving them. But they rep drones at least. They rep drones at least. And um, yeah, two you know minutes you said, left. I was looking by the way, you said you know there's a lot of a lot of room for rep drones, which there is, but there's actually not a lot of heavy, there's mostly light rep drones on this Guardian. There's there's really um, so a couple the, mediums. Maybe dead terrorists have been actually killing them. Yeah, maybe having a so, stroke. maybe so. If that happens, okay, this Guardian is now taking quite a bit of damage. Yeah, maybe so they're switching back now. Wow, you can see, uh, now that I've, I've kind of looked close, the Guardian is actually almost out of range of the missiles. I saw some missiles uh, like actually expire before they hit him, so Ooh. he's he's probably trying to push that as much as possible. But he's you're right, he's, he's taking some damage. Another Flycatcher down for Dead Terrorist. Um, so a little DPS off the field, but actually that doesn't matter all that much. If, I mean, if they yeah, have the if DPS if to break the Guardian, they can actually pull the match back. He, the Guardian's going down so slow, though. Like he, he's gone down about ten percent, and now you can see he's, he's creeping back up. Now that he's out of the missile range. Uh, okay, this is this is, I guess, progress for Dead Terrace. But is it too little, too late? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Now it's it might be too late. Now the uh, Bellicose, Bellicose just gets slapped. Wow. By these Astartes. Probably this happening now is a result of Dead Terrace. Uh, getting too close, despite the dams. Like yeah. they lost some dams when the flycatcher went down, most likely, and also they're probably a little more desperate to get in range so that all their damage hits, and that's putting their ships at risk a little bit more. So the bellicose for the dead terrorist team is the one that had the target painter, and yeah. the target painter is something yeah. you really need against a small sig ship like a guardian uh, and, for these uh, missiles. Kara so. called down now. That damp pressure is falling apart. You can see Merlin's now without damps on them, so that'll mean more damps headed back the other way to dead terrorists, and uh, fourth district now actually kind of snowballing this into their favor. Yeah, they're they're now winning easy just by battle balling and keeping their composure. Yeah, I mean they did at least a smart thing, which a lot of teams or some teams we see like kind of screw this up. They battle ball and get really conservative before they actually have the points victory. <laughs> right. So fourth district got the points victory and said, "Okay, your move, yeah. right, team." And I think they flew this win. really really well. Yeah, they, it, like the logic pilot did extremely well. Also, uh, keeping keeping those Merlins and Molluses alive early in the match, and yeah. I think their positioning in general is just really smart and. Um, I don't think Dead Terrors did a bad job, but uh, fourth that definitely deserves this one. Um, well played. It's it's cool to see uh, the Astartes doing well again. Yep, this uh, Gen really couldn't get its newts applied to anything, but no, nope, but still had some drones. Still yeah. did some good stuff. It's also uh, cap transferring the Guardian. It looks like nice. Is that true? Uh, There's cap transfer going one direction. It might be from the crew or to the Gedden. I don't know, I can't tell what's going on there. Anyway, the match weird, is over, who cares? Thing. Yeah. <laughs> Fourth District winning this one over Dead Terrorists in a uh, pretty interesting kind of long stalemate there where uh, there was a lot of good piloting on both sides actually, I think. So we'll send it back to the studio and see you guys in a few. Day four, uh, that means that pretty much only the good teams and test alliance are left. Uh, test alliance, please ignore. Worst of the best. Delicious spaghetti you eat while waiting for an prey to put its shiny port into a history. Some always let them jump and let the body hit the floor and that is how the boom come from. Welcome back to the studio. Uh, I'm CCP Gargant and joined here by Apothne, Suscreeples and Bacchanalian. Uh, I want to say that everybody in that match wasn't just damp, they were so... Really? Oh. Yes. Oh. Really? Okay, we're, we're going to that route. We've taken low-hanging fruit to a new level. You're no, just, no, this was... Just I'm raising the, the bar. No. I'm literally physically <laughs> raising the bar. Bring it. Woo. I am super sad. Why? Because uh, they lost. The terrorists lost, and I thought that this was sort of a, this was sort of a caravan wagon kind of tactic to just ball up and take it. Like, mm. yeah, it was a defensive uh, tactic. If I've ever seen one, the fourth district's team 
was really nice. I yeah. really, really liked it. Um, the Geddon offers sort of this 40 kilometer sphere of protection from anything that values its capacitor. Um, and those star days were projecting really well. They did a great job prioritizing support right off the start, and it paid off with those first four points that looked like they were going to be the only four points. Um, so it was really well piloted on their part, and for dead terrorists, I think they were all RLMO, but I'm not 100% certain. I would have to wonder why didn't they go for the frigates if they were RLMO. They had some, some low-hanging fruit, which you're obviously a fan of. Um, and, and instead, it seemed like they primaried the bigger things until too late in the match. Mm. How, how are we yet to mention the Claymore? My god, did that thing survive it was, forever! Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, was pretty, it was pretty impressive. That pilot was just flying by the seat of his pants, like desperately getting out of range. He had all those rep bots on him. I really want to know like, what percentage of structure he was in, because that looked scary. Yeah, but it definitely was. It was good piloting on his part to get mm. out of range of the damage, to stay alive for as long as he did. Um, I think the dead terrorists just kind of didn't bring the ECM goo, and that's what that's what doomed them. They mm. needed that ECM I mean, goo. Dead terrorists did show that kind of uh, trademark sign of a very strong AT team in that those damps were spread beautifully. They, yeah. I mean, their EOR coverage yeah. was mm. fantastic. But it's worth mentioning, uh, is they were spread equally, but there's really not a way to tell if they were spread effectively. Mm. Even if they had been, though, I will say the 4th District did exactly what they should have, and they grouped up, they completely mitigated that, um, the Guardian did really well. He piloted well. I don't necessarily understand the pick of a Guardian over an Oneros, yeah. if anybody has We've any idea. We've seen that a couple times now. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it must be a style choice. Uh, it, is be. A, it's, it's, it, it is a, a better ship. looking ship. Yes, yeah. for sure. Um, but yeah, I, I just wonder, it seems like Dead Tears brought a comp that was designed to kill support and then decided, on the other hand, let's not go for the support. <laughs> Um, and maybe they weren't RLML and that could have been the problem, but I really do think they were and I, I, I just don't understand that target calling. It l almost sounds like they took my advice on always bashing the Lottie first. Oh. <laughs> uh, I'm not an expert, so listening to my yeah, advice is not... Yeah. Uh, these are the experts. I'm just here to sort of rein them well, in. Uh, <laughs> yeah, some of us. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, the, uh, to the victor go the spoils. And I think it was obvious that the, the fourth district were the better team. Uh, yeah. They just yeah. knew exactly how to react mm -hmm. to what they were facing. Mm -hmm. like it, it's and, one and of those battle ball. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. battle ball. That was a great term, yeah. yeah. It's one of those fights where it kind of, you look at the teams and I, I don't think there was an obvious winner as soon as you saw the grid, mm. but it, it was the decisions made by both teams that really, really impacted the match. Like uh, a lot of times you can see scenes well, that team is obviously going to win and then it's kind of a done match before the first ship flies. But it's, it's those decisions and you know, the FCing and the target calling and the individual piloting, those, that's what really makes the AT for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. That individual kind of hero tanks and the, and the just the way teams can take a, a great setup in that you think is over. You know, the match is over before it starts and they just manage to not have it be over or a team responds well to what they see and, and win an unlikely match. So, mm. I like to think that whenever we see a, 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 a structured tanking ship like this, an honor tank, uh, the guy mm. that's flying, the pilot is just, this ain't no deal. And then yeah. he just goes offline. No, like, we, we should probably raise some, any danger. We should probably raise some money from him because I'm sure he crushed his mouse as he was getting out there toward <laughs> the edge. So um, maybe we can put together some change and, and help him out. Moving on, we have the next match is uh, a nest of vipers versus sleeper social club. And a nest of vipers banned out the guardian and the oneros, mm -hmm. uh, while the sleeper social club banned out the the gila and the armageddon. Hmm. So. What do you make of that? Uh, my first reaction, based on what we've seen so far today, is that Ishtars are still open. Mm. Um, yeah. Banning the Armor Lodgy... I don't know, that's, that's kind of interesting. You don't see that many teams who ban both Lodgy of a, of a single type. Mm. I mean, but maybe they're, they're really convinced that the other team is bringing uh, an armor setup and they don't want to see that. You know, sometimes the mm. metagaming could be going on here that they know something that we don't. They, maybe they right. have a spy or they've seen practices or whatever it may be. Mm. So there could be something and like that. And it is worth noting, Sleeper Social Club is a wormhole group, a yes. long-standing and successful wormhole group. Um, pretty much all they fly is armor uh, in, in terms of TQ, which doesn't tell the whole tale in terms of the tournament, but um, they did fly Stratios and Eos before, so mm. it's yeah. a pretty likely conclusion that we they're also armor. can't forget that uh, unless the Vipers had the pi Paladin pilot who boundary violated <laughs> yes. so yes. gloriously and made yeah. me the happiest person. 
But it wasn't a flagship, was it? No. No, no it was no, just no, a no, Paladin. No. Okay. But it, it definitely threw the match spectacular mm. fashion, too. Yeah, but he waited until the last minute so yes. that we were all comfortable with the victory. Right. And then uh, he decided, let's zest this up. And uh, he <laughs> comfort, zest, comfort. zested their way to the loser's bracket, yeah. Comfort breeds some sort of uh, lack of awareness. I, I think what happens is the teams secure the victory, and then they're like, wait, there's mobile micro jump drives. I've not used one. Let's try this out. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, and they're probably really expensive. Let's just use them here, yeah. uh, unfortunately. In his case, he decided to use it straight out of Bastion mode, and so he had no idea which direction he was yeah. going to go in, and he's and not moving, and just... <laughs> yeah, so if you're, if you're sitting still, if I'm not mistaken, and you activate the, the mobile micro jump drive, you don't know where you're going to go. It's not where the nose of your ship was necessarily pointed. Right. The only thing you know is you're going to go somewhere. Okay. Yeah. Well, I've got a uh, sleeper social club packed for this one. I do too, which means you're going to be wrong. Same. <laughs> which means no, we're no, all going to be wrong. I've got a, a lot of friends from my uni days in the social sleeper sleeper social club team. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I really have to win. sleeper club. <laughs> <laughs> like and that with actually that, uh, we should go into the match because it's ready. Welcome back to day five of the Twelfth Alliance tournament. I'm Elise Randolph in the commentary booth, joined with CCP Rise, and we've got a nest of vipers versus C Sleeper Social Club. Yeah, and you see another Mortis Legion ship there. The Garmer, not quite as crazy as the Bargus we saw earlier, but uh, still cool to see it. Uh, again, uh, some new stuff going on here, or at least some unusual stuff. We have uh, Paladin on the Nesta Viper side. Uh, always interesting to see what people bring with Marauders. In this case, they've got three Ishtars, a Scimitar, that Garmer, some Worms, and a Crow. And then uh, Sleeper Social Club have gone with a more tinkery setup based on a Tengu and three Rattlesnakes. Yeah, this Sleeper Social Club team is going to be a tough nut for Nesta Vipers to crack. These Rattlesnakes have a bunch of EHP. Maybe they can kill a Hawk, but I, I don't think so. Uh, Nesta Vipers came in at range, as did Sleeper Social Club, but because they came in at oblique angles, they're pretty close to one another. And this Paladin, he hasn't gone into Bastion mode yet, he's moving around. Maybe he'll go into Bastion in a second. Um, but yes, uh, Nesta Vipers is currently trying to break a Hawk, I guess, of James. Yeah, I mean, those maybe are going to be the easiest targets for them to start with. Try to get those frigs out of the way. Uh, everything else is pretty pretty darn tanky. Oh, wow, there, there it goes. To do okay. it right James Arjet going down, team captain for Sleeper Social Club, right out of the gate. And he was uh, challenging people to one billion -esque bets on this <laughs> match in local before it started. So uh, I'm sure that feels good for Nesta Vipers. <laughs> yeah, what sort of drones did the uh, Ishtars drop? Let me have a look for you. Because it least. looks like they might have dropped some sentries and they're sort of volleying these frigates with... Um yeah, yeah they've right. got curators yep. from the paladin or from the Ishtars and EM from the paladin, so they're hitting a pretty weak resist for these hawks. And there, it looks like at least for James's hawk, the sleepers or the nest of vipers team actually like synchronized their firing to just blap it through everything. Mm -hmm. uh, curators dropped by the rattlesnakes as well, and. Uh um, so both teams pretty comfortable to just kind of sit pretty far away from each other. Sleeper Social Club will probably stay in their little ball. Oops. Um, that Tengu of Sleeper Social Club drops really low there. He is... Wow. That's a lot of damage coming from so a nest of Vipers right there. These Ishtars are like pure damage fit. They're shield Ishtars, so they probably got like three drone damage yep. amps in the lows. And oh no, this Ishtar is taking a little bit of damage itself from a nest of Vipers team. Sleeper Social Club. I mean, if they can kill uh, a nest of really Vipers close. Ishtar, then they're going to be really, really oh, happy. So close. It is just teetering right there in structure. Oh, he's bleeding structure now. If they can get one or two more good shots on it, it's going to be gone. And there it goes. A nest of vipers now behind the eight ball. Um, they yeah, were winning on points for a while by doing that like tricky play with the uh, with the sinking their 
their damage. Yep. There you can see the cap transfer going into that Tengu, kind of the base yeah. of this team. Man, they're still putting a lot of pressure on this tank. They actually have newts on him now as well, which is really good news. I mean, I don't know uh, if they'll be all that significant. I'll have to yeah, see where they're coming from. Yeah, you generally don't want to newt the Tinker Logistics and shoot at the same time because he's getting a lot of cap transfers from these rattlesnakes. Uh, but they're, they're going to keep trying. I mean, they were getting close when they had three Ishtars, but... I, I think like there's no chance. I now. like the decision by Nesta Vipers here. They've actually put the Ishtars right on top of the Sleeper Social Club team, which lets them run those newts and actually probably mitigates a lot of that sentry damage as well. If they're still using curators, uh, which I'm gonna try and find out, the, the curator damage will actually, you know, be mitigated pretty heavily by them moving around so close to the drones and them having a hard time yeah. tracking. And Kuzla and the Ishtar is actually tanking a little bit better than uh, Bernardo did. So maybe that, like, getting really close is what did it for them. Yep. And, of course, the Ishtars probably have all their high slots filled with uh, utility newts, or at least some of them. Mm -hmm. And it's working out. But these Rattlesnakes, they can carry a lot of dro uh, drones with them, because they, they can, only need two. They can, and some of them have uh, switched to geckos now, so uh, that tracking issue won't be as big. But uh, that's still, I think, a good switch for the Ishtars to force on them with no tackle on the Sleeper Social Club team. Yeah. Um, they have the one painter, but they don't have any webs. They don't really have any way to make it... Um, hard for those Ishtars to mitigate damage. So I, I think that's a really nice play by Nesta Vipers. Uh, they're still struggling to get enough damage onto the Tengu to break it, but maybe over time the Newts will will play, uh, kind of uh, take enough of a toll on him that they'll make progress. Do but you think we're going to see these Ishtars trying to do some bumps or something? Because they're that's sort of... always they're an not, option. They're not going for like a ramming pattern or anything, but they could very well start doing it. No, I think I think you're right. For now, they look more like they're just uh, think that the place they're going to take the least damage is right next to them and where mm -hmm. they can put on cap pressure. But uh, the big one of the big limitations, um, of course, from these Tengu based or uh, T3 based Tinker teams is the rep range is really short uh, and the cap transfer range is short. So that that is uh, definitely a potential option. It's just really hard to pull off. <laughs> yeah, and you can it is. see also that Nesta Vipers don't have any tackle, at least no tackle close either. Uh, which means um, even if they did manage to bump something out, it probably wouldn't be there for very long. All right, so... Ishtar going into Kuzla, armor now. He's, he's slipping a little bit. Those That sustained pressure from the Tinker team is sort of wearing down a nest of Vipers right now. And uh, the Sleeper Social Tinker Tengu, like the Tengu Logistics, he's, doing he's well. been the primary, but he's... I mean, we can't really see... I'm, I'm sure on the other side of the screen, this guy's having like really really rough time with life but yeah and there's a lot of stuff cool i mean here. he's yeah he's doing good he keeps he keeps boosting back uh, in huge chunks after he goes low there is things that can happen like over the long term in a fight that we can't see like you say like hardener overheating and yeah. uh the cap situation which we can't see either so it, it could change at any moment but he's doing well for now and it looks like they are uh, yeah. going to take down another ishtar so that's a really really big kill this for is a sleeper strong social club. strong victory for sleeper social club uh, maybe James was just a little bit too hubris and he just got volleyed without paying attention, but the rest of the team is doing really well. <laughs> James, in, in too spite hubris. Of that. Yeah, super uh, hubris. Ishtar number three, uh, taking damage now. Interesting that they never went for, it seemed like they never even tried the scimitar, I guess, uh, without any ability to control range, just thinking that maybe it'll be easier for them to Yeah, to the curators the against the scimitar is really tricky. Mm -hmm. A scimitar has a huge EM resist, sure. and the curators do EM damage. Third now, Ishtar down. Yep, Nesta Vipers has nothing left in the tank. It's just a matter of time to see how much of the rest of the team they'll lose. Looking at the attack bar uh, of both teams, Sleeper Social Club actually has a pretty big attack bar, but they've never really applied it. So I have a feeling this Paladin is going to be fine for the next four minutes. Yeah, probably so. They'll they'll probably take out some of the side support, but um, Nesta Vipers, I mean... Who knows if it's luck, but I feel like this is a really bad uh, type of setup for them to run into. Yeah. Um, splitting your team in half with the Paladin means that uh, the side team often is kind of weak enough that, like, they don't have uh, links here, for instance. So Yeah, that's a huge, um, huge lack of the Nesta They're a little more team. exposed to uh, a team like this, which usually um, struggles to come up with quite as much damage as the full teams. Yeah. And so that's nice for Sleeper Social Club to, to kind of have an easier time breaking through. So this setup from Anesta Viper is, the one thing it can do very well is it's really resistant against dams because the, yeah. the Paladin, when it goes into Bastion mode, yeah. cannot be damped. Uh, it cannot have any EOR applied to it at all. So these ish charges drop drones, assign it to the Paladin, and the Paladin can go blap, right. blap city. But, uh, yeah, well, I would think the Nesta Vipers team would have a much better shot against um, teams like the the Caracol and Cerberus team we saw a few matches yeah, ago. Exactly. Really relied on Ewar and didn't have a lot of Lodgy and wanted to kite. It does really well against that. But yep. Strangely uh, enough, I think they wanted to see an armor team here, even though they banned all of the armor Lodgies. <laughs> 
Um, but their scimitar is now sort of eating it. These rattlesnakes apparently could have killed the, <laughs> the scimitar anytime they wanted. It is very optimistic to have <laughs> Guardian and Eros and hope for an armor team. Yeah, yeah. I don't I mean, know. I think I think they would have been pretty happy. It would have been really good for an armor team. Like that's what they wanted to see. But I don't know. I think I think they would have been happy to see a kiting shield team rather than a tinker shield team. If they would have gotten uh, like a shield Tila kite team, mm -hmm. I think with a full lineup, they would have been a lot a lot happier because they could have picked it apart a little bit at a time instead of having to crack this really really tough tank. But do you think maybe it was just sort of like a mind game that they tried to do with the bands, or do you think they had something in mind that they wanted to see? I, I really don't know. I mean, it's it's really hard to think that they could ban Guardian and Neros and not really want to face shields. <laughs> yeah. I, I think that, that that's the only thing that says, uh, obviously, and yeah. there could be some other reason, some specific setup or something, but um, I have to think that they just thought shields would be good for them, that uh, uh, that would lead people into a slightly lighter tanked, more uh, skirmishy type team mm. that they would... Or a finesse team or something like yeah. that. Yeah, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I mean... Well, either way, it's hard, hard to read the bands uh, the, all the time. They're they're not going to have to. Uh, <laughs> they're not going to have to worry about bands much longer because this is their last match. They will be eliminated. Sleepers Social Club with their Rattlesnake Tinker will move on. Yeah, um, pretty good showing actually. I mean, yeah. we've seen Tinkers fail horribly in the first uh, two weeks. Um, earlier today, it did okay, but like these guys, yeah. you think it's a, a risky move to bring a Tinker or? I mean. A bit, but we I think overall in this in this format we've seen we've seen them perform pretty strong, I think, mm -hmm. actually. I mean uh any any like setup archetype we've seen has definitely had its ups and downs and I'd say uh Tinker teams have been fine. It it's not it hasn't been a an archetype that tends to do worse. So um I mean I think everything I think the idea of riskiness is kind of uh hard to apply like um there's uh, if there was something not risky, that's what everybody would bring, and they yeah, would win. Yeah. Like it's hard to win always, so <laughs> I don't know if there's something more risky than something else. But either way, I'm sleepers wow, the club. Oh, oh wow, they actually might never be killing other stuff. They killed the worm, but I don't think they're going to break this they, paladin. They killed in the scimitar, yeah, and they yeah. killed they killed the worm. But actually, this paladin is is MJD. dying horribly. Interesting. He turned Bastion off. <laughs> oh my gosh! If that doesn't <laughs> activate, he's going to try an MJD. Oh, he just oh, made it. he got it right this time. Let's see if. He <laughs> He's one Barely. for two. Why did he do it? He's, but the drones are going to chase him, and he's probably going to die anyway, unless he bastions uh, right now and starts he's, repping. He's repping, but he, I think he, he, <laughs> he messed it up by not being in Bastion. Like, yeah. why, why does he need to move? Uh, yeah. well, got, like, I mean, maybe seconds. he just wanted to prove to the world that he can MJD in a Paladin and live. I'm sad that we're losing him in general from the tournament because <laughs> he's done good stuff in every match. So, yeah. so that is over. Nesta Viper is eliminated. Sleeper Social Club move on. And I guess that's it. Back to the uh, desk. Thing worth more than Isk is trust. This October 4th in Amsterdam, Eve is real. Welcome back to the desk, the best desk of all. Uh, I want to congratulate that Paladin pilot. He is a hero. He managed he, to successfully MGD? Yeah. He did? He, he won my respect. That's all that matters <laughs> in this tournament is my respect, I think. Uh, do I have your respect? Yes, you do, CCP Rice. Uh, we've had a bit of a change here at the desk because uh, Sir Squeeples had to be put somewhere else, uh, ready <laughs> for the commentator booth. Uh. And uh, instead, we got CCP Rice hot off the commentator booth. Hello. I was also going to ask, who is everyone else? Chat always seems confused about who people are. We're joined here by Apothne and uh, back an alien. Mm. I was half expecting you to say Matani. <laughs> I'm waiting. For, I'm, I'm saving a few jokes. Okay. There are a few <laughs> jokes that I'm not going to just whisk out there. Mm. But what did you guys think of this match? Uh, I thought it was great. Uh, we saw your favorite. Yeah. Yeah, I don't even, I, don't, I just 
and yeah. it won. It's obviously a pretty good composition. Uh, <sighs> like, I actually think that this is the most uh, uh, interesting kind of environment for tinkers we've had. I feel like there's been tournament formats in the past where they do feel a little uh, kind of abusive or more boring, but I feel like most of the matches we've had them in this tournament have actually been pretty tense, where it's right on the line where you can mm -hmm. almost depend on being able to tank a full team of, of people, but like half the time it doesn't work out, and it's I, I, I like the tension there. I think it's cool how it's a completely different kind mm -hmm. of thing, which is mm -hmm. actually something you said the other day uh, as well. But um, yeah, I, I feel pretty good about it, and this match was a good example. Yeah, I'm just dreading the inevitable tinker versus tinker. That is yeah, going to be yet, painful. Mm -hmm. We had one last year that was awful. So hopefully we don't have one of those this year, or if, if we do, maybe they actually do manage to kill something or someone MJD's out. That, that would that would make me happy. But yeah. I think it's really a credit to a team that feels confident in their Tinker and runs their Tinker mm -hmm. well, because piloting the T3 logistics in a Tinker is possibly one of the hardest Definitely. things to do in all of New Eden. I mean, it, running a good Tinker and winning against good teams with that Tinker means that your T3 pilot is absolutely exceptional. There are very, very few players in the entire game that can pull that off well. Right, and well, that, according to Elise Randolph is where the name came from. Tinker mm -hmm. is a character in another game that will not be mentioned that requires a lot of micromanagement, mm -hmm. and that does require an awful lot of micromanagement, cat management, and those sort of things, so. And then when you get that alpha damage uh, and your uh, <laughs> structure, no, your armor suddenly goes to half, mm -hmm. uh, then you, I, I think you sweat a little bit. A little bit, yeah. for sure. You have a little, uh, I'm not going to finish that joke. So, <laughs> on to the next match, uh, now yeah. that I'm going to put a, a happy little mark here again. Because yeah, I finally got one right. Yes. I'm, Congratulations. Well I'm, well I'm one for six now. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. That's good enough. It's <laughs> good enough. I forgot my sheet in the other room. I guess <laughs> I don't get to participate. You can just call us nerds or whatever. Uh, also, where'd my class go? This will, will all be him. fixed. All right. This will all be fixed. Patience. <laughs> next up, we have Losek Naya Sholopin versus Easily Excited. Yeah, uh, both of these teams have surprised in the the last two weekends. I feel yeah. both of them got knocked off. I think in the first weekend. I think that was. I remember easily excited versus moist being the first day. Mm. Yeah, which was an amazing match, name wise. Name wise, it was fantastic. Best match of the day. Also, the best naming pairing ever. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I think uh, Losek Nina Shalupin is, is a very difficult team for us because it kind of forces you to do a Sean Connery impression when you say the name. Losek Nina Shalupin. I just be <laughs> Shaloop the Whoop. I can't. I, yeah, I, I saw it on Fell Heap and I can't not call whoop, it yes. that. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh. sorry, sorry, team, you have a new name. Uh, they uh, have banned the Getten and the Ishtar while easily excited have gotten rid of the Orthrus and the Scimitar. The Orthrus? Ooh, yes. Wow. That's interesting. It's a very pointed ban that uh, indicates they know something. Yeah, they know? don't want missiles, I guess. Elise will be very sad. He loves that Orthrus. Mm. It's a pretty ship. I a like lot of people do. It's extremely well designed. Yeah, yes. it is. Yeah. And it's yes. named beautifully. I wonder who made it. <laughs> I wonder about that too, but we'll never know. So, uh, <laughs> what would, you, would be your predictions for this match? I think, like, both the Rattlesnake and the the Gaila are left open. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So, so what we'll do we think? See some of those. I yeah. think that's a good bet. Yeah. 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 Um, the Orthrus ban is really interesting. Like, do you, do you expect that when you say that it means something specific, like that they know the team or someone specific on the team has a particular? You know, that's what I'm wondering. I don't remember exactly what uh, Shalupto brought. Is it they <laughs> easily excited bandit, right? So I don't remember exactly what was brought. <laughs> Um, by them in the past, if they were the ones that brought Orthrus, so we've seen Orthrus before, or if perhaps, like I said, Easily Excited maybe has, like I said in the last match, where they have some sort of metagame, they, they know something about this team and they know what to expect from them, so they're it's, banning it out. I think one of the things we see when we see really kind of specific bans that are very general, like with the Orthrus ban, is that odds are, a lot of the time in practice, they'll have tested their setup and tested it, tested it, tested it, and they think it's really good, but they had one really bad match mm -hmm. against a team that flew Orthrus against them. That's another possibility, and sure. That that can be a good ban, but it could just be that you don't have enough data about it. Yeah. Because yeah. banning really specifically like that, you might have been able to make different decisions in the match. It might have been a close match, but because you still lost it, you became scared of that ship. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What would what would the Orthrus counter then? What do you think? What do you think then? Yeah, I mean that's that's definitely the thing that's weird about it is the Orthrus is a it's filling a role that can be done by several different ships. Right. So thinking that that will keep them, like they, they could replace it with, I mean, Cerberus is, are the obvious choice, but yep. there's there's plenty of others that basically do the same type of long range DPS um, with the shield tank. And so it's it's definitely interesting to see that. But yeah, like you say, if they've got some particular um, 
mm-hmm. memory haunting them or <laughs> uh, a very special memory. Yeah. Probably. I think the other the other the other thing the other reason that can that kind of band can come up maybe is uh, if you're trying to make a team that has a particular fondness for a certain ship more uncomfortable. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So if you know that when they've been practicing, orthoses are in just tons of their setups, yeah. then if you, if you take that out, then you force them to maybe do something they're a little less happy with. Yeah. Or, or, or equally, if you, if you have done some good spying, as we love in EVE Online, and you know they have you know five setups, and you know you can beat four of the setups, but you can't beat the one they run with Orthrus, right. then you know you can you can try and push them away from that, right, even right. though, as you say, they can quite easily replace it. But that will be difficult. You know, they'll have to change it depending on the point cost of what they replace it with. Yep. It can be a lot easier just to go, okay, we're just not running that setup. We'll bring this setup. Right. Absolutely. Well, and what you have available. I mean, you know, if teams didn't properly plan for having an Orthrus mm. ban, because who plans for an Orthrus ban? Mm-hmm. They don't have those ships there and yeah. fit. You know, that's part of the thing with the banning is it's not just about... Uh, you know, having alternate setups, but it's having the alternate setups ready, fit, and mm-hmm. you to jump in them. You yeah, have right. half an hour or something after the bands that bam, you're in that ship now. Mm-hmm. You know, and if you don't have it fit, or you're not in a market hub where you can quickly buy it and fit it, or you don't have an optimal fit, you know, written down somewhere, then you're going to be forced to change your setup. Look at the first weekend; there were five gilas left in Jita for like three bill plus. Jeez. That is one of the most uh, amazing tactics to fight in the Alliance tournament. Right. Just buy everything. I mean, but you guys <sighs> will have your uh, answers now because the match is ready. There's really like so, no joke. Something happening with the boat outside. I know. I just heard. I heard the boat horn. I'm like, what is going on? They're evacuating. Yeah. Well, Volcano is finally gone. Welcome to Reykjavik. <laughs> uh, <laughs> your predictions, really quickly. Mine is uh, easily excited because I'm an easily excitable person. Yep. Same. Hmm. I am easily excited, which means they're clearly doomed to. Lost. That's what I've chosen. Easily right. excited. Right. I'm going with low sick Naya on this one, so. Chill whoop de whoop. Never gonna say that. I well, have too much respect for our competitors. Respect is earned. Earn it. <laughs>everyone to this next match in the 12th Alliance Tournament. I'm CCB Fozzie, really glad to be here with you today, and I'm joined by Sir Squeebles now in the commentary booth. Hello. And uh, we have a ridiculous and awesome match for you coming up. We do. Uh, this is two uh, teams that one would not expect to warp in at zero that have warped in at zero on top of each other. <laughs> Easily excited bringing a Tinker with uh, Rattlesnake, Tengu, Vulture, Triple Heal, and Cerberus. And uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about this low sect? Yeah, so Shaloop the Loop has chosen to bring a Claymore, Triple Gila, Double Cerberus, Double Caracal, Three Worms, and then no logistics whatsoever. Um, so they have sort of a Kaidi drone comp that they've brought in at zero, and they're hoping to... Well, they're going to hope tank uh, yeah. this, this tinker out, basically. Not having a Logi at zero is always risky. We're a couple seconds away from the match starting. My guess is they're going to try to use the MJD in the middle right off the bat, I but we'll really see how well so. it works out for them. And the match has now begun, so we're seeing the team start to move. I don't see MJDs yet activating. No, but they uh, are burning out. Shaloop the Loop is, is yep. kiting out really quickly. They're putting damage down. They've got rapid lights across those missile boats, which are going to do substantial damage, but they can't escape the damage from Easily Excited. Yeah. So they, they can start burning off, but eventually that DPS is going to catch them. They have got to win this match very, very early. That Worm taking a lot of damage, and of course he does not have logistics to wrap him up. Easily Excited making an excellent choice, going after the most vulnerable ships, basically. I ex- I'd expect Worms and Caracals to be the main targets, as without any uh, logic to keep them alive, they're probably not going to survive too much longer. I mean, a point could be made that if you, you had ASBs on, on the side of uh, Los Ignaya Shalupin, that you could potentially kite out to range and, mm-hmm. and try and tank back up. It would be risky, but 
it doesn't seem like they're even going to execute with that because they haven't brought damps or anything to limit the projection from easily excited. So that being said, strange. they seem to be keeping this Gila below full shield. So right. they do have a lot of burst damage out of these rapid lights. But uh, once they go into reload, there's going to be a period of time when the Gila could probably get himself repped up fully by this Tengu. Right. And uh, that, that worm of uh, Christiana did kite out really effectively. Mm -hmm. So well, well flown there. He was going almost 4K. So he's probably some distance out. Um, he mitigated a lot of damage from easily excited. But if you're in easily excited comms right now, it's probably pretty relaxed. You know, people yeah. are having a beer, saying, look, we're not going anywhere. We just have to tank the volleys off these ROMLs. We tank back up, and then eventually we break something. It yeah. doesn't matter I mean, what we break. As long as they get some points down, then they've got this long game. That being said, the Gila still taking damage. If he dies, I... Uh. Yeah, yeah. If he dies, it's definitely going to be bad news. Because, uh, again, like we've said before, Tinker teams, once they start losing ships, tend to drop very fast. They need the cap transfers from their whole team. Right. Um, they've been sending these drones out after the worms, but the worms have been all, when they get primary, doing the right thing, going 4K a second, burning out, exactly. like, away from the fight, but not boundary violating. I think there are a lot of teams that have... I mean, the Gila is banned because it's, it's so powerful. There's a, a shield resist bonus, uh, those medium drones that just do so much damage. Um, but some people have made the mistake of overestimating their, their speed. Yep. Um, so they say, oh, the Gila, we can kill anything, we can kill frigates. Well, Christiana and Windy Killer both proved you wrong there. Mm -hmm. and uh, They're much better killing claymores, though. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> funny funny thing you mentioned that, because right now they're killing a claymore. Yeah. Um, so the frigates yeah. were able to outrun these medium drones and uh, get out of range. The claymore's dropping, but so is the Gila. That Gila is taking armor damage. That is not it's, good. It's very unusual to see a ship just kind of die slowly in an armor comp. It makes me wonder about how many reps this uh, Tengu has, whether it's a kind of atypical tinker fit, but they did kill a Claymore, so that's going to reduce DPS. But that being said, the, he the Gila going down is actually, I think, a worse loss for Easily Excited. Yeah, well, the only reason you, you could make a case the other direction is that Claymore had links, which allowed mm -hmm. Low Sec Naya to mitigate damage with speed. So they no longer have those speed links, but they're still going to be pretty quick. They're a shield team. They've still got, uh, hopefully, Thermodynamics yep. 5. And but, uh, the high slots on that Claymore, I have to imagine that it was a very heavy, like it had mo more right. than three links. Right. Because we did take a close look in at it, and it had uh, light missile launchers. As you it. do. So uh, yeah. not going to do a ton of damage. Um, obviously, uh, a ship that would more often be running like hams or heavy missiles. Um, but it also didn't have smart bombs, which would have been really handy when you were surrounded by right. all those. Right. And those are two things that you'd often see on a Claymore that you'd expect to see. Uh, the second Gila, or the first Gila now for Losec, uh, dropping very low, but he is also moving very fast. And it's strange, I haven't seen, I haven't been watching too terribly closely, but I, I haven't seen any shield boosting from the Los Agnaya team, which is, is kind of unusual. I mean, the, the fitting resources on the Gila and especially on the Claymore are more than enough to throw on an XLASB, and if you're not using Lodgy, um, I, I find it a little strange they go with buffer, but it seems like they have. Yep. Um, that being said, it's, it's working for them. Yeah. That Gila got into armor, uh, but he managed to get far enough away that uh, the drones weren't keeping up with him. He is like taking a bit of damage, but at this point, all of the drones have actually pulled back because he got over 100 kilometers away, and they all fell behind. And now, mysteriously, this Tengu is webbed. I have no <laughs> idea by what. You would um, think that that would be something that they would have used earlier. Well, maybe, but bide your time. Don't don't play your maybe cards. Maybe it was on one of the once. worms that had to run away at the beginning. No, that, that is true. Sense. That is yeah. possible. A lot of people have used worms for mm -hmm. tackle, um, but yeah, these gilas. I mean, Ipshin and Alex Fishka, both of which I can almost pronounce. Um, they're both getting low. They're both going to die. They they can maybe kite out and come back in, but eventually they're going to die to the remaining Gila drones from Easily Excited. Yeah, and if they do keep range long enough, then they just can't do any damage themselves. Right. They can't apply from that right. range. What we're actually seeing from uh, Alex Fishnet there is that the drones all went away, but he's still getting hit by some missile damage. Right. Uh, it looks like it's probably just the Rattlesnake spamming some missiles at him, and that's it's going to hit the whole arena. There's no way to avoid right. that. And then, I mean, to the credit of the low-sec pilots, they did a really, really good job piloting their ships as best they could, the mistake was bringing the ships that they did in the combination that they did, and they didn't give themselves a whole lot of options other than burning out and burning back in, which is effective, but obviously not infinite. So Yeah. We've seen people be very successful with these no logy like high-damage teams before, especially with the combination of Rapid Lights and the Gila's and Cerberus's and Caracals. You can knock stuff down very fast, but coming at zero was very odd. Yeah, um, it, it was meant strange. That you were going to be taking damage right off the bat, no matter what. Yeah, and I mean, it wasn't even that there was a bunch of tackles spread out or anything like that where they wanted to lock a team into place. They warped in at zero so that then they could immediately burn backwards to correct their mistake and no longer be at zero. So 
overall didn't really make a whole lot of sense and, and uh, they didn't really pay a high price for it though because easily didn't seem to take advantage of that honestly. Not right away no and again these guys just keep burning away the healers are running very far but of course as they're doing this they're not applying the damage. Right. Uh, easily excited definitely in the driver's seat here they have the points lead um, it doesn't look like their ships are dying with any uh, great quickness. Um, Losec needs to get a kill on something, and obviously the Tangu isn't working out. They have proven they could kill a Gila, so maybe switching to another Gila might be the best bet for them. My question is, what, whatever is tackling this Tengu, if, mm -hmm. if you're with Easily Excited, why not just find that guy and kill him? I think that might be what they're trying to do now, it, as we it, see a worm it, explode. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I mean, they're right in on top, and, and uh, Easily Excited, uh, they do have the Gilas for, for their main DPS, but they also have a Cerberus, which is mm -hmm. RLML fit. It is designed to kill frigates at, at any range within its, its missiles, which, well, on a Cerberus is actually quite high. Um, so if they're letting someone sit in and, and web the Tengu, obviously the Tengu is not really breaking a sweat over it, but still, that's easy points you can put on the kill board and yep. damage you can take off. Um, actually, the Cerberuses are the only ships that were fitted with um, hams instead Where of rapid ham? lights. Oh. Yeah, so they can't apply as well to the frigates, although the Caracals and the Heels are all rapid light fit. Ah. And as they lose another, a Caracal now, this is exactly what Easily Excited wants to see. They're knocking off DPS, which is making the tanks on the Tengu a lot easier. We've seen before that Losec can break through a Heels slowly, but it was going so slowly that now, with the loss of a Caracal and Worm, they're probably not going to be able to do it. Right, and if that uh, initial Gila of Easily Excited had died much earlier, and that little bit of extra cap that's going to the Tengu had been lost, maybe Losec could have used all of their DPS. But as you said earlier, I mean, it was a one-for-one -one trade, um, and it kind of negated, I think, the loss of capacitor off of that Gila. Mm -hmm. So. so this does look like it's probably going to be an easy excited victory. Of course, we still have two minute, two and a half minutes left. There still is opportunities for uh, mainly for easily excited to mess up. If they make a big right. mistake, then it could go the so other way. So if you're low sick Naya now, you're you're staring at these mobile micro jump drive units, and you're just hoping. You're just yeah. hoping beyond hope that easily excited gets curious and tries to. They do have three stylish. fast heals. They could try bumping. We have seen bumping work against Tinkers. Mm. I think this is probably a good opportunity to go through for anyone who isn't familiar with what we're talking about when we say the term Tinker. Sure. Uh, we've been using it a lot because we've been seeing a whole lot of them today. Right. Um, tinker setups are built around cap transferring usually to a strategic cruiser, Tech 3 cruiser, that is remote repping your team. They have a huge advantage in the amount that they can rep in that the strategic cruiser itself has a huge local rep, mm -hmm. and then it also can do a huge amount of repairing to its allies. The downside is it's very reliant on those cap transfers, so if you start losing people, right. then you don't have the cap. And it's very short range, so it's vulnerable to bumping, and it can't really move. You can't take the right. setup and move and, it from And it should place. be said that the reason that that's evolved, a lot of people may be more familiar with spider tanking on mm -hmm. TQ, where you have multiple ships doing the repping. Here, you're only allowed to have one ship that's repping, yep. and each hull is only allowed to fit one cap transfer. So that's why something like that Gila dying, I mean, that's one potential cap transfer down, and it can be really important. So mm -hmm. it's definitely super interesting, and as, as we've said at the desk several times, uh, if you're the T3 pilot in a tinker, you are under so much pressure. Yeah. Um, and But this guy's got to be happy now. He's done well. Uh, to be fair, I, I don't think he's had the hardest time of any of the Logi pilots, but uh, they have done well. And then uh, that losing that Gila maybe scared him for a minute, but they recovered and stabilized, and they you look bet. good. They just knocked down one server, so it looks like they're going to try to kill one more before time runs out. It possible. They killed the first one quickly enough. Uh, th that Cerberus is running for his life. He's uh, going to try to get some range, but he isn't as fast as these healers were, so he's not going to be able to evade the drones right. quite as well. Yeah, yeah. He's, it's not going to work out for him. As he goes into structure, he picks up a little speed, and then he's going to die. Yeah. And that'll probably be the last kill of the match. As uh, We're going to see Easily Excited moving on. As a reminder, if you're just tuning in, the matches we've had so far today have all been elimination matches. Right. So the losers of these are eliminated from the tournament. That means Losechnia Lo Shalupin. Uh, yeah, I think, think I got that right. <laughs> Close, at least. <laughs> Better um, than mine. Is uh, going to be eliminated from this tournament. This was their first uh, tournament showing. Uh, hopefully we'll see them back uh, for AT13, because uh, uh, saying their name is always really, really enjoyable. Yeah, and difficult, yeah. not to mention. It's a challenge. It's good to so have that. Like, make, keep yourself sharp. you got to yeah, yeah, challenge yeah. yourself. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, we have now have only four seconds left. Uh, Easily Excited is going to be very happy to be moving on. Uh, our next match is going to be one that I think a lot of people have been really anticipating. Yep. Hun Reloaded versus Test Alliance. A couple of fan favorites. Hun Reloaded, a team that has a great tournament history. Mm -hmm. uh, Test, a, a very popular team uh, with a, a large null set group. And uh, it'll be great to see how that match goes. So that is the end of this one. We're going to send you uh, back to uh, Gargant and the guys in the studio, and we'll be back with you soon.
only game. Why you have to be mad? I mean, my heart's beating, my heart's beating, my hands are shaking, my hands are shaking, but I'm still shooting, and I'm still getting the headshots. It's like, oh, man, shot, man, shot. back to the analysis desk, as I like to call it, uh, in a very witty turn of event. Mm, uh, yeah. I think this excited easily excited easily. What do you think? <laughs> Probably. Yeah. Oh, that yeah. hurt my head. I'm excited because I've made a turnaround here. I've now gotten two in a row, which means the rest of the day I'm going to be completely right. Yeah. Uh, according to the matches we've yeah. been seeing, where a lot of teams turn it around during the three minute mark or so, when they look like the underdog, uh, mm. they just Hmm? Pull something out to earn our respect. I think I definitely agree with Squeebles in that um, if you looked at the tank bar uh, on the um, they're on the low second uh, team, um, shaloop -de -whoop. The, the, yes, shaloop -de -whoop. <laughs> they uh, didn't have any part of their tank that was active. Um, it was all buffer shield yep. with no logi, which is really surprising. You know, as he said, uh, SBs really fit well onto Gila's. You can do them on Serbs. You can do them on the Claymore. Like they've all got great resist tanks. Like, why do you think they didn't? choose to do that you know my best guess is they think they had a they th thought they had a counter to tinker there where they thought they were bringing the right combination of dps and it mm -hmm. wasn't going to be a match that was going to go very long because in theory and against a tinker if you break that that logistics then the whole thing kind of falls apart like a house of cards you can just kind of blast through most of the rest of the setup before time and i think that's Probably what they thought it was gonna be a match that doesn't go over quickly, so they don't need the active tank. Because really, in a in a match that doesn't go to time, in a shorter match, the buffer tank works just fine. Uh, if you're anticipating a quick win, the two reasons I can think of, and I'm not even sure the first one makes sense, is that <laughs> if you're in a like a high DPS brawl early in the fight, like if you expect to be fighting Ishtars or something like that, um, the buffers are more efficient early in the fight when the DPS is really high. They actually ha generate more AHP than the the ASBs would, especially if they can, you know, if, if they're going to lose ships with active tanks before they even get to use a whole ASB cycle, but especially, or, or sometimes even if they only get to use one, maybe. So I could see that if they expect that they're going up against a team with a lot of damage and they just want to uh, win the early part of the match, um, because where the ASBs are stronger later in the match. Um, the other thing I can think of is that uh, the passive tank's a lot easier to fly. And if you're a team that mm -hmm. wants to kind of hedge against mistakes, um, make it easier for your team to perform the way you expect to, avoiding ASBs is probably a good bet. You, you much less likely to overheat mods uh, and lose them. You're much less likely to um, do weird stuff with reloads or with timings. And so you just, you, you know what's going to happen with your setup a lot more. Um, I don't know, you can be more sure of it. Which that's, that's a good point. Having, having done that before in a Slepnir in a tournament, accidentally reload my ASB after the first charge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was dangerous. Exactly. I, I got into structure and I did, you know, save myself, but that is a mistake that it's made. Yeah, yeah. And, and I mean, we, we, you know, pick on people in, 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 in the matches when they're going on, but it's a really high pressure situation. Yeah. Like when mm. it comes to, EVE is already a high pressure game where it's hard to do everything correctly and keep track of all the information mm. you need. And then the tournament just amplifies that a lot. So I think it's a, an environment that's uh, prone to causing mistakes. And maybe, maybe that's some factor for yeah. some teams at least. More moving parts always mean more. Uh, room for error, so yeah. certainly. Yeah. Hmm? yeah, I don't know, well. but it didn't work out. So <laughs> we just saw a tinker with rattlesnakes and uh, healers. So that was uh, it was sort of a melting pot of everything that we've yeah. been talking about. Yeah, uh, what seems to be the me forming meta for this day, at least. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it is overall a meta that has kind of existed, but you're right. The tinkers have been, become more popular today, and uh, I, I have am, a feeling they're going to continue. Uh, I am interested to see what happens uh, in the situation you described where we end up with two of these teams against each other. Yeah. Mm. I, I have to think that they practice that, that that's uh, you know, something they're aware of as a real possibility, but it seems like the obvious conclusion is nobody can kill anything. Right. And uh, even though the Tinker teams aren't quite as low DPS this year as they maybe have been some years before, it still is a big risk. And I wonder 
kind of what the plan uh, some of these teams have is in case they do run into that situation. Well, I mean, the good news is with the reverse tie dye, if you go to time, yeah, uh, you true. start speeding things up really. So, and that's just who can switch targets the most quickly and most sure. effectively because right. you know the Logi pilot it's already doing a ridiculously hard job. He now has to do it five times faster. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and in, I mean, if by chance nobody knows uh, what you mean by reverse tie-dye, we do have a uh, tiebreaker system that I think we installed in the Neo for the first time uh, earlier this year, which is uh, that if, it, if a match goes to time and the points are even, we start speeding time up uh, to make it much uh, more likely that something dies and something will eventually in the match. It line. goes up to 5 or 7.5 uh, times the normal speed, so yep. uh, everything goes... And the way that works for those who haven't seen it, we had a, we had at least one, I think maybe two uh, last yeah, week we, and the week before. Them, yeah. um, is it's a full five minute period. It's not not first kill. It's yeah. not you know. It's a full five minutes. It's yeah. the full five minutes. So it's like the match is extended five minutes, and whoever has the most points at the end of that wins. Yep. And then after that, if it's still even, it's who had the the bigger attack bar at the beginning of the fight. And then I believe in the infinitesimal chance that both teams had an identical attack, you know, potential uh, going into the match, then it's. Literally a coin flip is yeah. the tiebreaker, so. Yeah, the most brutal of all right. tiebreakers. Right, worst way it's to do it. It's worth noting how it scales, because it goes 1.5, 2.25, I think then 2.75, yeah. and mm -hmm. it ramps up. grows yeah. like that. It's not immediate five times. But now, on to the next match. It is ready, so we have to go through these discussions pretty pretty quick. It's uh, Hun Reloaded versus Test Alliance, please ignore. And Hun Reloaded have banned the Guardian and the Oneros. Mm. So that's a pretty pointed, targeted ban. Mm -hmm. And Test have banned the Legion and the Geddon. Hmm. Yeah. Legion Hun is interesting, not yeah. to see an armor tinker probably. Yeah. Probably. Yeah. Hun is a team that I was really looking forward to watching this year, not because I expected them to do exceptionally well or not because I expected them to do exceptionally poorly, in that um, they lost um, a, a lot of their AT team to another alliance. So I'm interested to see um, kind of how much that affects their ability. I mean, yeah. Historically they've been an exceptionally good AT team. Mm -hmm. This year they seem to have been struggling a bit, so I'm interested to see you know, what, what's left of their AT team, what new talent they've brought in to replace them and, and mm -hmm. how they do. Yeah. Are you going with Unreloaded for this match? I am going with Test, as it happens. <laughs> Interesting. I'm I, doing that too. I think Unreloaded are going to bounce back. I think that they probably still have enough left. Maybe these, these are less experienced pilots, but they have, over the time flying with the other pilots you mentioned, mm -hmm. have learned from them, and they're maybe the new crop, the new, the new generation of Unreloaded pilots. Mm -hmm. So I think they're going to bounce back. I'm going to go with Test. <laughs> yeah, I think Test have shown that they're, uh, they're full of surprises. They're like yeah. an un unstoppable wave of surprise uh, this <laughs> tournament. So let's see what they do this time. That last malediction is at about half armor, and uh, this match will be over before too long. It's like he's got a raptor right on his tail. So. Right, the malediction down. Looks safe, looks safe. I just grabbed 250 million. Sorry, I'm sick of your phone. Welcome back, space friends. This is CCB Fozzie once again, joined by Sir Squeebles, and we have Hun Reloaded versus Test Alliance. Please ignore. I know a lot of people are looking forward to this match, and it's a doozy. Test Alliance bringing a whole new type of uh, tinker that we haven't seen before, with a lot more ships, but a lot less tank than uh, you often see in them. We'll have to see how well it works out for them. And Hun Reloaded bringing uh, also Gila's, so Gila's on both sides, but uh, they're pairing it with two EOS and a Scimitar, which is a little more traditional core, um, with some frigates, uh, whereas Tess is going with all cruisers. Yeah. Tess came in very close to the beacon with her team, which is a Tango for Repi and an EOS for Lynx and Damage, triple Gila, and then it gets a bit odd. Blackbird, triple Vexor, double Worm. It's a lot of ships, which generally is something I really like, um, but of course those ships are going to have fairly weak tanks, so they're yes. not going to be able to win on points. They need to win by killing their opponents. Right. I, too, like a lot of ships, unfortunately. 
unfortunately, the entire concept of a tinker is that uh, you have really high resist profiles and there's no easy primary. Um, in the case of tests this time, I think they've painted a huge target on the heads of those vexers. Yeah, I'd be surprised to see those vexers live long at all. But it does look like they're actually going for the blackbird, which is also a good choice. Um, I just, I, I think when you water down your high resist tinker core by including T1 holes like this, you're just asking to have points taken out from under you very early on. Yeah, that Blackbird is obviously not tanking all that well. He's in low structure, yeah. and there he goes off the field. Uh, there's a lot of augmented uh, hammerheads coming in from those helos. They do a ton of damage, right. and uh, there just isn't enough tank on these Tech 1 ships. Right, and uh, part of the beauty of Gila is part of the reason I think they're I so think attractive. Scimitar dropping for Hun Reloaded. Just, yeah. Sorry to interrupt you, Exa but that's really important because Scimitar is about to die. That is right. a huge, huge kill for a uh, test if they can pull it off. Yes. And for that semi pilot, he can't outrun those Gila mm -hmm. drones. That's what I was going to say. The, the draw of the medium drones from the Gila is that they can chase down Lagia and punch through them. And even the Tengu is starting to realize <laughs> how true that is. Um, he's not going to tank. It, it, it's not at he all is stable just with the barely holding boosting. on. He must have everything overheated at this point. At the only way that Tessa can keep him alive is if they can knock down some DPS fast, maybe some worms. I don't think it's going to be enough. He's no. right on the edge. He's keeping his shield boosted, but he's losing bits of armor in each run. He is like just barely, barely holding on. But he is going right. down very slowly. So if they can kill some worms, it might be enough DPS off the field. Or, or just kill an Eos. That yeah. works too. Yeah, that, and that is They're taking down pretty fast. Like yeah. This test team is obviously a team that its game plan isn't to try to just like not lose any ships. Its game plan has to be to kill stuff. And it is. More so than uh, most Tinkers have been yeah, seeing. Yeah, to that end. This can there's... kill stuff fast. Right. And that with that Eos going down now, this Tengu is getting a lot more comfortable. Wow. Um, if you're on Hun Reloaded side right now, you are sweating. You are yes. sweating a lot. Um, I think you need to be killing some Bexers to knock down DPS. Well, and that, that I guess, is uh, they saw how successful they were at the Blackbird. That's mm -hmm. to be expected. But then you were opting to go for the Tengu, which has super which high resist. Almost worked, though. Yeah, no, and that's the tough part as a mm -hmm. target caller is you see it breaking slowly, and you, you, you're so committed already. Um, but this second Eos of Deviant Ant is He's dropping so fast. Yeah, that's yeah. deleted. The shield tank Eos is. This is test executing really amazingly on this. I yeah. think it actually would have gone a lot worse for them if Hun had made the choice to go after those Vexers first, uh, after the Blackbird instead of the Tengu. Right. But there, it's almost impossible to predict that. The Tengu, really, that was only like three volleys from drones away from dying. Right. With yeah. like 20% armor and then it's structure. Tengus don't have a lot of that. Yeah, and uh, so a question while we watch uh, this worm die is... And a Gila. Well, and a Gila. Wait, wait yeah. hold on. Why, why are you dying? Hun can still kill stuff. No, Agent, <laughs> you, you're not dying now. If it's they can kill Gila's, that means they can definitely kill Dexers uh, at this point, even with the DPS they have. Like, they're, they are breaking Gila's. They're breaking Gila's with the shield resist bonus. This is a, this match is still a uh, open match. Uh, there's a Gila now dying for Hun Reloaded as well, and Agent Hawk is holding oh, on for so no, long. Oh, no, it was such an emotional roller coaster at that point. I he did go down, but those extra seconds allowed them to get a Gila into low shields. Right. Tess needs to kill one of these DPS chips before they lose something else. And yes. it looks like another heal is the target. I'm still kind of surprised that Hun's not shooting the Vexers, because the Vexers should collapse if, with from this I DPS. mean, you're, you're going to see more damage come out of the of the, the healers, but I... But not that much more damage. Vexers right, right, but the, I mean the, the disparity between yeah. a tank of a Gila and a Vexer, it's an easy call. You mitigate as much damage as you can, as quickly as you can, and they're not doing that. So how is it that Agent Hawk died terribly, but uh, <laughs> Jameer Vaughn lit Jameer, how is he still holding on? Uh, I'm really not sure. Maybe he has uh, his hardeners overheated at the right time. Uh, maybe, I mean, the drones are all still on him. They're, these drones are not uh, missing him. Uh, they've got the Gila from Hun Reloaded. So uh, Yago there is down, and now a worm following as well. Uh, Test obviously proving that they, they're still losing ships, so they, this isn't in the bag for them. But right. they are in the driver's seat here. I'd be much happier to be Test right well, now. Well, it, it's kind of reminiscent of, of the last match in that there's sustain still left on mm -hmm. the side of Test. There's no sustain for Hunt. Yep. You, they're essentially, their entire team is now just a buffer tank. Now we're going to see how well this Vexer does go down now that like it's getting its reps. Mm -hmm. uh, there's another, like one less Gila on the field doing damage to it. Uh, it is breaking, but if they can knock these worms down, they might be able to actually keep him alive. Yeah, and I'm curious what the worms are dying to. They could be dying to the... Uh, they're really not moving. Uh, their worms mm -hmm. are going 400 MS and getting popped. Yeah, it, he was just getting hit by Valkyries, so it's mainly oh, the Gila okay. Valkyries yeah, yeah. there, uh, which makes sense. Uh, sure. I mean, unless a worm is going really fast, it has going to have trouble outrunning these drones. Right. Uh, and that Vexer is now tanky. Like, this is the opposite of most of the Tinker matches we've seen so far. This is a Tinker yes. that's made for brawling and just trading yeah. chips back and forth. It is really interesting. I mean, uh, what Test has done is smart, I think. Like you said, I mean, adding more pilots mm -hmm. 
not just increases uh, the DPS potentially, but it gives more minds to the fight and allows people to independently pilot around position for tackle, recognize who's burning out. It's it's more sets of eyes, so that's really cool. Uh, and they've they've used it really successfully. The only risk they run here that I, I keep repeating myself is that. Uh, had Hun Reloaded gone straight for those Vexers, those are automatic points to mm -hmm. their side of the fight. So um, thankfully they didn't. And if you're Hun, uh, somebody is probably face palming pretty hard right now over this. Yeah, I mean, if they if they'd successfully killed the Tengu, then they would be the right. ones cheering right now right. because the rest of the team just would have fallen and apart it, so quick. Right, and up to that, I mean, the Tengu call itself wasn't wasn't the problem, mm -hmm. right? They they killed the Blackbird, great. Um, they went for uh, the Tengu; it was breaking, and as soon as it didn't break, you have to understand like we need to find something with low resist yeah. and they have plenty of options in that department and they didn't they didn't go for mm -hmm. it so i think yeah this this match really did come in a razor's edge it's not going to look like that in final points right. uh, test is going to be a dominant victory with the number of ships killed uh, but this is a match that really could have gone either way up until maybe the like 4 minute mark yeah that that tengu pilot also uh, undoubtedly crushed his mouse in the throes yeah. of, of bleeding armor so but a good job to him he did stabilize he kept reps out on other people uh, and that one gila inexplicably of agent hawk maybe they have a bit of personal drama and he decided you can die um but he kept the other gila up fine so mm -hmm. i assume that him and jameer are pretty tight um so now the swarm of drones is chasing after uh hun hawk here in his kestrel and it'll be only moments before he goes down right and that's a very very convincing victory test alliance knocking out what i think a lot of people expected to be the favorite from their previous victories yeah absolutely the yeah. success hun reloaded yeah, it was it was really well done. I uh, I was kind of uh, kind of negative about Test's <laughs> approach here. Um, it's kind of a hybrid tinker sort of a thing, mm -hmm. but they did really well. And I just wonder if and when they bring this back out later in the tournament, if it would fare as well. I, I think it played right into their hands that those Vexers got a lot more damage out than they ever should have. Um, and now <laughs> Hun Hawk is still yeah. just burning around. So the, the test guys actually sent the light drones out and then pulled them back. I have a feeling we know why, because we just saw the ad right. about it. Yeah, probably, they were looting the field. probably on comms also, they're playing like a Celine Dion song, something emotional, you mm -hmm. know, to, to sort of honor uh, the Hun team. And I imagine Hun Hawk is enjoying that, but probably not for long, because mm -hmm. here in a minute they're going to have looted and then it will be back to business. Although only two minutes left, I hope they don't ride that whole time out, but it is They're test. pulling some Valkyries back, we'll see. You know, they might yeah. need every last bit of Isk they can get. Uh, yeah? They, they, there is actually a ton of Isk on the field when you consider the fact that these that are augmented yeah. uh, hammerheads, uh, which are extremely valuable drones. Uh, there's some, a drone that used to be just kind of okay and was only used for the tournament, really. Now it's actually just a great drone all around, right. um, but quite rare and valuable. So. Yeah, there are, uh, I know one team in particular picked up over a billion uh, just in augmented medium drones mm -hmm. because they are absolutely everywhere and it's one of those times uh, the tournament is is certainly not a pay to win environment and we saw a, a, an expensive flagship die earlier you yep. know just because you have officer newts does not mean you're the better getting on the field um, but something like those drones is a huge huge boost to your power and something mm -hmm. like a gila so if you've got the money or if you've got friends with money or if you need to host a, a space <laughs> bake sale or whatever uh, i definitely recommend going with the augmented drones yeah they've got the great advantage of uh, extra hit points which uh, mm -hmm. is useful in normal combat as we see that uh, Kestrel just no, did field. he fly out? Uh, yep, he. Oh, what a he brave exploded, soul! Exploded, sent himself out of the arena to be killed by the robotic CCP Veritas. Ah. The, the finger that just touches you and you're dead. Good work, Veritas. And uh, so that is the end of this match. Uh, that's a really, really strong victory by Test Alliance. I think a, surprising uh, a lot of their naysayers. And uh, we're going to send you back to uh, Gargant and the guys in the analysis desk.
welcome back to our uh, fancily sort of drifting into studio effects. I'm talking about effects. You, this okay. is lost on you guys. You don't know what I'm talking about. No. Uh, so test alliance continue to surprise. Mm. That's fair to say. Yep. That's fair to say. Proving me wrong once again. Thanks. You love tinkers. Uh, you know that one. That was an interesting tinker. It wasn't really a true, you know, turtle tank tinker. They they expected to lose ships there, and they went out to win that match. It wasn't so much of a let's just sit here and hope we pick off a frigate and then ride out time. So mm -hmm. I'll give them credit for that. If they're going to do a tinker, that's that's the way I like to see it done. Um, yeah, it was just a well executed match on their part, and uh, you know, Hun didn't. I don't know if they just didn't play it right. They weren't. I don't know. The fact that they were able to get one of the Larrys down and no others, they couldn't kill the Tangu, yeah, I've got to call it Larry, um, is, uh, it was an interesting choice, like maybe what Squeeble, Squeeble said there, maybe the Logi pilot just had beef. Um, the other thing I could think of it perhaps is that they were really stressing the cap on that Tengu for a while while shooting him, and perhaps the Tinker wasn't done quite properly so that the Tengu was uh, maybe running his ASB off capacitor, but not getting fed enough capacitor to keep up with it, and he eventually was capping out, so when it came time to rep that, that uh, ship, he just didn't have the capacitor to do it. Mm. I mean, uh, uh, we looked this up during the match, and I was very surprised to see that the Tengu has max five targets lockable, mm -hmm. um, which I still don't really believe. And when you're running a team with 12 pilots in mm -hmm. a tanker based Tengu, mm -hmm. like you're taking a really hard roll and just like going extreme with it. I cannot mm -hmm. imagine how how difficult that job is. Yeah, wow, that's that is pretty wild. Uh, makes it even more, uh, maybe more. Silly that they didn't go after the Vexers, since it's likely yeah. they wouldn't yeah. have even been locked. Exactly. I, I was thinking this this is a pretty interesting step in terms of the environment, actually, um, to have a full team with a T3 base Lodgy. It, I wonder if it's partly the result of um, the entire tournament environment for now being fairly long range based. Like, mm. this seemed like a team that would be punished really bad by Slipners. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but we haven't seen them. Like, we've seen uh, Rail uh, Astartes yeah, and mm -hmm already slipners and otherwise a lot of mid-range projection from missiles and drones mm -hmm. and uh, so they are able to stay in a tight ball and not get punished for it they you know they can kind of sit there and um, use that tengu in the really short range and I don't know it's, I think it's, one of the contributing facts is that because we're in such a really drone heavy meta and a moving drone meta mm -hmm. it means that tackle is so easy to clear off last AT we saw mm -hmm. very assault frigate based really really yeah, tanky yeah. frigates coming in but we, we're barely seeing it at the moment because yeah. I think people are so scared you know you know triple worm drop light drones they're just gone 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 completely yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah but on that note uh, the next match coming up is the fearless empire versus shadow cartel mm. that'll that's very likely going to be a good one. Uh, the bands for it is uh, Gila and Ishtar for the Fearless Empire and Shadow Cartel have gotten rid of, rid of the Tango and the Loki. Hmm. So they don't want Shield Tinker. They don't. No. If I'm not mistaken, Shadow Cartel were the team that threw the match against Pandemic Legion with the Heretic jumping out at the last second, is that right? I uh, think it was going to be a draw. There was some pilot error, error, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think Shadow Cartel overall as a team are a good team. Yes. Uh, they, they played that match extremely well outside of the Heretic suiciding itself. And, um, you know, I'm sure that pilot has either learned how to use micro jump units since then or been, you know, kicked off this team. Um, but I, I really, I think they have the advantage going into this match over mm. Fearless, and I, I really have confidence that they're going to win. So, yeah, yeah. I agree. Uh, the Shadow, Shadow Cartel was just uh, displayed uh, very good piloting all in all against Pantera. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. one heretic approaching instead of using is a. Uh, it happens. Yeah. I, I, do I do really like when a team kind of we expect to win a match. I think that it gives teams like the Fearless Empire, who are kind of less storied, um, gives them an opportunity to be the underdog and get a big kill. Because mm -hmm. even if Fearless don't go on to win the tournament or whatever, if they kill Shadow Cartel here, that's a, like a really big feather in their cap. Yeah. It's also really fun how uh, in those kind of situations, a lot of the, the other veteran teams really try to get behind the weaker team. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, I know I've I've heard plenty in the past of teams uh, matches like this or matches where someone's fighting against Exodus or fighting against uh, Dark Side in the past. The teams like PL and Hydra will go in and try to coach those teams a bit, give them spy setups, mm -hmm. and try to do anything they can to kind of uh, increase their chances of taking out one of the, the bigger well, opponents. A lot of times the teams wind up not using it though. They think they, they're, they're too paranoid. Yeah. I know yeah. Rogue Capel got a set up in AT8, I think, to beat Hydra and wound up deciding not to use it. Hydra bought exactly what the intel we got said they would. Yeah. Um, 
There was a time, Star Fraction against Bob, I remember there was even commentary talking about the fact that someone gave, a PL gave a setup to Star Fraction to beat Bob that they didn't want to abuse and they went up winning anyway, but a lot of times you'll see these teams don't use the intel, so. So the lesson is, uh, use your intel. Yeah. <laughs> Just believe what anyone tells you. Yeah, right. believe what anyone, that, that's what I do. Uh, so, with that, somebody, somebody told me that the match is ready, and Excellent. I believe them. Hey. Uh, are we all going for Shadow Cartel? Yep. Yep. Ah, yeah. Wow, this is a first. But good luck, Fearless. Good we luck. believe. We believe. Ish. So, do we have any setups that aren't a tinker? Oh no, I bombed. You bombed us. So I'm sorry, guys. back everyone to this next match fearless empire versus shadow cartel i'm ccb fozzy joined once again by sir squeebles and i hope you like tinkers because we've got even more tinkers for you coming up uh although this is another uh, kind of different tinker than what we've seen through most of the day as uh, fearless empire has brought back their marauder plus tinker setup uh they've changed it up a bit they no longer have the get in there and now they've got more damage from vnis uh vexor navy issues but uh it still is uh, at its core a setup that relies on a chronos with a great tanky potential and then the rest of the team uses the Tinker to keep itself alive. Right, and on the Shadow Cartel, we see something that's, uh, I won't even call it more standard because it is a little bit of a different setup with Rattlesnakes, but they have two Rattlesnakes, a Nighthawk and an Eos, two Flycatchers, three Worms, uh, a Mollus, and two Burst. Uh, I think the Shadow Cartel comp is really, really nice. Yeah. Um, so we've got Geckos dropped uh, across the board here from the uh, Fearless Empire team as the match begins. Fearless Empire came in at zero. Uh, they're obviously trying to make sure that the opponent is as close to that Blaster Kronos as possible. And uh, Fearless uh, taking out these bursts uh, if they can really quickly. That's, I think, a smart move. Mm -hmm. And you saw one rep cycle come across onto Adam and then it drops, so mm -hmm. presumably that's a range issue. There's no e war interference here, and he and does he go goes. down. That's actually big. Yep. Um, interestingly, we, we discussed before the match, uh, if you're Shadow Cartel, you've got to look at something like a Vexor Navy issue, which importantly has a fairly limited drone bay. Um, and you've got to wonder if you can kite out and maybe even have your support kill some drones. Yep. Uh, that really is an option with a lot of these drone metas is some drone on drone action. So I'd expect that'd be what they'll do if the, if they can't kill the Proteus, but mm. uh, the Proteus is successfully dropping right now. Yeah. Weirdly, this is a shield, a dual tank Proteus it looks like, because th there is a shield booster on it. Um, I mean, it's not a terrible fit, um, but obviously it's not enough to keep it alive against right. this damage. And, and now, now he's just a lost male. Yeah. So uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, these VNIs, they're going to take them down really quickly. That's mm -hmm. easy DPS off the field. Uh, the VNI can fit a really nice armor buffer tank, but it's still not going to have a T2 resist profile. It doesn't matter now that they don't have Lodgy. Um, but it, it, it definitely is a capable ship in something like this. But typically, you want your Lodgy Proteus to live beyond like the minute yes, and a half Yes, that tends yeah. to help. Yeah. Uh, the longer you can keep that ship alive, the better. Uh, there is a lot of damage coming in at, at that uh, Rattlesnake, uh, mm -hmm. Raytheon there. Uh, but uh, with the Vexor Navy issue down, this is a smart move for Shadow Cartel. they got to knock off this vulnerable DPS. Now, the Kronos is going to be very hard to kill. Kronoses have the ability to go into Bastion mode, which gives them incredibly strong tanks, but locks them in place. Right. Um, the reason you don't see a ton of Kronoses in the tournament is that in this kind of mat what this match is going to turn into, where it's just the Marauder versus the entire rest of the other team, right. um, the other team can get out of range of a Kronos a lot more easily than they could a Paladin or a Golem. And even when the Kronos isn't alone, I mean, obviously it's easy once it's down to just him, but um, it, it is sort of strange to see a gunboat used as your Marauder. Uh, the Paladin has been used successfully, absolutely, outside of the certain micro-jump drive incidents. <laughs> Um, but yeah, the, the Kronos is just not going to apply as well, or project as well, as something yeah. like a Golem, which is why a Golem is a really common pick. Uh, that DPS goes really far. Not necessarily true here. It did work out for him, though, that they did catch this Rattlesnake. Mm -hmm. 
And by caught, I mean there's no tackle mods, but he's still dying. Yeah, so. he is going down. At this point, he's taking damage pretty much entirely from the um, Kronos. The Kronos is hitting wow. him with for low damage. He's w very deep into fall off at this point. Kronos is, have a lot of fall off. Mm -hmm. um, he is probably going to be able to kill the Rattlesnake, but uh, with the whole rest of the team collapsing around them, it's going to be probably a pretty easy points win for Shadow Cartel. Yeah, uh, that was probably pretty comfortable for them, mm. I would imagine. The, there was no moment there where uh, they weren't in complete control. I will say I definitely agree with going for the burst, though. Mm. Uh, the Lodgy Frigate, especially in a 12v12 comp, there's so much damage on the field that uh, bursts are an easy thing to kill. We've seen a lot of things like heretics and worms used to kill off support wings effectively. Um, so, uh, But the burst is still nothing to scoff at. It is a little yep. fragile. Uh, the reps are not massive, but they are consistent, and they uh, they can really sustain your frig wing, and they can add to the tank of even your bigger holes. So yep. so if you remember a few seconds ago when I said the Rattlesnake is going to die, obviously I was wrong. Yeah. Uh, the Rattlesnake got enough range. He basically he moved out uh, to uh, quite far away from uh, the center of the arena now and uh, was just able to get far enough out that the Kronos can't hit him anymore. Yeah, interestingly, well, I guess he had to have had a mod to get there, right? I, I wasn't watching his speed at all. He but never went all that fast. I think he just, because he started out at uh, like 30 kilometers anyway, okay. so he, they just started moving slowly away. Right. And uh, he's now basically just sitting there. Uh, doesn't need to do a whole lot. He's still moving away, but not, again, at any kind of fast pace. Uh, they're going to try to break this Kronos, but uh, a Kronos and Bastion is a very tough nut to crack. I will bet you a thousand is that the Kronos dies. You know what? I don't think I'm going to take that bet, uh, considering he's saying, already like in half armor. And I do mean the in-game currency, mm -hmm. just so we're very clear about that. But he's he is getting into low armor. And the great thing about uh, taking rattlesnakes into a tinker like this, where there's a battleship core, which is most often the case, is uh, he's not going to be able to mitigate any of that damage. And yep. uh, rattlesnakes are absolute sledgehammers. He does have smart bombs. I'd be interested to see how those are affecting the, the drone tank. Um, but I don't think it's going to be enough, and I am starting to regret my bet a little bit. Nope, never mind. I'm pretty it, confident. It, unless he can wipe out all these drones in, like, one of the next cycles. He's killing off some of the drones, but, of course, these are healer drones. Or, or he's killing a drone worm drone. as well, actually. This worm of... Uh, <laughs> What? How? Did the worm brawl into the smart bombs? Or, or the worm got in close enough to get hit by blasters. Uh, Great. And did end up dropping. Uh, I guess he, he wasn't keeping up enough transversal. Uh, the Kronos, as well, just boosted himself like uh, up. I, uh, I all feel the way back I up. feel foolish now. My faith in these rattlesnakes is uh, is turning me into a liar. I think the Kronos might have been bait tanking there. He may oh, have just yeah. let himself. <laughs> yeah. Because you see the reps he's getting at this point. He's getting like 40 percent of his armor in one go. And then uh, the flycatcher of Coriel decided uh, I'm just going to sit still, and then once I hit armor, I'll try to move. And unfortunately, yeah. it didn't work out. But uh, I appreciate trying something different. And the Kronos, God, just die, please. <laughs> I need some isk. Shadow Cartel uh, proving that uh, there's no match that's uh, too in the bag for their small ships. To make <laughs> mistakes. Well, I, I think it's uh, sort of, they don't want to discourage uh, Fearless from coming mm -hmm. back next year. So I think this is Shadow Cartel investing. It's like not overfishing salmon, you know? You got to yeah. let them leave enough so that they're they're still there next year. And I think that's what they're doing here. I'm confused about whether this Kronos, like, whether this Kronos is actually bait tanking or not. Because uh, now he's into structure. He was <laughs> tanking so well there right. for a moment. Right. Um, he may have just run out of pace in his AR. It's like, the common fit for these will be dual rep, AR, normal rep. And he's, like, sliver of struggle. There and he goes. And dunked, yes. <laughs> that no. is the match. Yeah. It was exciting. Mm -hmm. I, had, I had a really good time. So with that, Shadow Cartel will be moving on. Fearless Empire is eliminated from this tournament. Uh, we're going to send you back to... Um, the guys in the analysis desk, and then be back soon for Waffles versus the Methodical Alliance. Okay, we'll just chillax for a sec, everybody. And then we'll just, like, graph, like, explode, and it's going to be awesome. It's not going to be worth, you know, 500 bill, but it's going to be okay. <laughs> Do I, I want to like, do it? I want every dead like... motherfucker out of the alliance. No, no, no. Every no, no. one. Bro. Nomad.
welcome back to the desk. Uh, we all know that it's very important that Squeeples has a good time, so thank you guys <laughs> for providing that. I'm CCB Gargant, joined here by Apothne, Back in Alien, and CCB Rise. What did you guys think? I was right again. Yes, that was nice. <laughs> This is a strange turn of events. <laughs> it is, cool actually. Match. We got our, uh, I think it was our third Marauder of the day. Yes. Mm -hmm. And um, by recollection, I don't think the Marauder teams are doing very well, are they? Mm -mm. I think all of them? Well, all of them have lost? Uh, no. Did the Golem win? No. The Golem... They were definitely doing okay last weekend, but I, yeah, yes. I think today they've done really badly. Mm. I feel like the Kronos is just kind of an odd choice in that situation, too. I don't know, I feel like it's kind of a shorter range, you know, in, in, in a tournament like we were talking about, there's a lot of range projection going on, unless you're rail fitting it. Mm -hmm. And in that case, rail, Kronos, yeah, kind of makes me squeamish, so yeah. 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 Better Marauders to bring for range. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's not, there's not a lot to say. Yeah, like they, kind they, of they Fearless they, Empire died. Right. Yeah, we, we said before the match, they banned out the Tango and the Loki, Shadow Cruise mm. banned those too. They didn't want to face uh, shield Right. Tinkers. Mm. And I mean, they disassembled a, an armor one. There's pretty much nothing more to discuss about that, I think. Very good showing from Shadow Carta. Yeah, Fearless did, it, Fearless did a really good job of becoming lost males, as Squeebles put it. Mm. So. That is all they are now. Well, yeah. they have gone home, and the next match us up is Waffles versus the Methodical are, are Alliance. You nervous yet? You yeah. are a Waffles representative. Waffles. Please win. <laughs> Please. <laughs> I have a set. I believe in you. I have a set of puns prepared uh, if they don't. So. Uh, oh, God. God. I knew you would. <laughs> I knew you would. What puns have you got if, if the, it goes the other way? I or guess, are you just prepared? I guess I can quote a very popular song. Oh, God. I was waiting Our for a song very popular lyrics. jingle. We could count on the jingle. Is it, is, it, is it by Nickelback? I know you're... <laughs> oh. if, you say a, if you say a fan... Uh, you will not be here when the camera comes back. But uh, anyway. <laughs> the bands for this match uh, are Ageddon and Gollum from the Waffles team, and mm. the Methodical Alliance have banned the Astarte and uh, the Ishtar. Huh. Hmm. So, Methodical what? don't want a ridiculously high DPS set up on them. Like, mm -hmm. who does? From the start, but yeah, <laughs> but I mean, that's specifically what they're scared of in this case. Yeah. yeah. But this still leaves both the, both the Gaila and the. Mm. The Rattlesnake Open. <laughs> yes, that, that is true. We could see you know, a continuation of the day with the Rattlesnake Gila. Um, I obviously am not in comms for, for once, so I have no idea why Waffles banned what they did. Uh, I, I've actually been kept out of our testing, so I don't really even know our setups. I'm, I'm useless. You're to find confusing from. the expert, guys. Well, you're confusing the expert. Mm. What do you guys think? What, does, what do these bands say to you? Oof. I don't know. Golem Geddon is mo much more interesting. The other two to me, the Ishtar Asart, they seem almost more like just banning high value ships that they're not interested in using mm. um, and rather than being associated with something super specific. Yep. Mostly because we've seen Rail Astartes, it yep. doesn't necessarily mean really high damage, but um, Geddon Golem is a little weirder. I mean, Golem usually is a team that wants to um, use a lot of E-War because they, like, that's the strongest Marauder and they don't want to have their kind of uh, E-War lo um, uh, strategy mm. Mm. Uh, messed up by a Bastion module, but um, then combining that with the Geddon's a little interesting. And that's actually reminded me what I was going to say about last match. I finally remembered like that's five good. minutes later. Which is that uh, I think Fearless didn't bring any E-War at all. Yeah, zero I control bar. started the, zero, the control bar zero. And I think a, a trend we often see as tournaments move on is more and more um, focus on E-War. Uh, winning, winning a damp or ECM uh, or cap war tends to become more and more important late in the tournament, I think. So it's kind of disappointing, I guess, to see that they weren't really interested in mm. <laughs> messing right. with that at all. I think going back to the bands, I think uh, yeah. the Geddon band speaks to not wanting to be under cap pressure. I mean, yeah. there, there mm -hmm. aren't, you can, you can slap newts on a couple other different ships, but there's not a really, we haven't seen like the Cursor or anything that, that's got, we've seen the Ashimas, I guess, the Blood Raider yeah. ships, but, but you, you really, the Geddon speaks to, we don't want to have our cap outfit out from under us. We want to be able to run our modules, our hardeners, our guns, whatever it may be. And, you know, that's, that's the one that we've seen the most, so get it off the field. I think yeah. in general it's interesting how we've seen the Geddon be a more popular neuter than the Battle. Obviously it's less points, mm -hmm. but equally, mm -hmm. I think people are preferring that range bonus yes. Yes. over the amount bonus, because mm -hmm. it means, you know, when you land on grid, it's going to be easier to get in range the newts, you can apply the newts sooner, mm -hmm. and the AT is a match of, like, who can kill each other the fastest. It's yep. not who can each other, kill each other yep. full stop, it's who can be quicker. Yep. You pick up first two ships, you get some lucky newts, like you turn off their prop mod, you catch them, you kill them, and you're at a massive advantage. Yep. 
and getting, of course, a little less points as well. Yep. Uh, so with that trade-off, it ends up looking really nice. Also, I, I'm going to guess, uh, which team banned the Geddon goal? Uh, the Waffles. Waffles, Waffles okay. yeah. I'm guessing, I want to guess at, like, Damp, Cerberus, Orthrus. Mm. I could see that. Yeah. Mm. I want them to bring a bar guest so uh, we can talk about I doubt pancakes. there'll be a bar guest. But, but uh, <laughs> the match is ready though, so right, we'll okay. see. Fantastic. Uh, can Waffles do it or is it the Methodical Alliance? Your predictions, please. Waffles all the way. I'm going to go with Waffles too. Yeah, They waffles. amused me in the past. I like Waffles. waffles. All the way. Methodical Alliance, uh, it's your ball. Whether you're into gate camping or jet can mining, you'll find Eve's best music mix at Eve Radio. Visit www.eve-radio.com today. I like waffles. I like waffles. I like waffles. Do you like waffles? Yes. Yes, I, I like, like waffles. Ah. And pancakes and fruit soap. <laughs> And welcome back, everyone. This is CCB Fozzie, joined once again by Sir Squeebles, and we're bringing you Waffles versus the Methodical Alliance. We've got Apothne uh, shivering over there, uh, really hoping for his team, as uh, there's some really creative setups here going on. Methodical yeah. Alliance, it's not, it's not strictly a tinker, because it doesn't have the Tech 3 rep, but we're seeing a Paladin, Triple Rattlesnake, Triple Jaguar, Kestrel team. I expect these Rattlesnakes are going to be cap transferring to each other to keep their tanks up. Mm -hmm. um, ASB's running all the time be interesting to see how well it works out against a much more traditional Waffles team. Yeah, the Waffles team is something that we've seen before, and I think it's been effective almost every time that it's used, barring any serious piloting errors. They've got double Claymore, one Scimitar, three Gila's, uh, three Worms, a Corax, and two Merlins, so mm -hmm. they definitely are going to try and emphasize kiting, uh, and they'll be successful given what Methodical has brought, but uh, that's some pretty monstrous tanking capability for Methodical. Yep, so the match has now begun. We've got Curators dropped by the uh, Rattlesnakes for Methodical Alliance. They're, I'm assume, going to try to knock out that Scimitar fast. We'll see if they can track it well enough, um, but uh, the damage is not yet applied. There is some damps going on to the Rattlesnakes from Waffles. That's not going to actually do very much because the Rattlesnakes don't have missiles, and the Rattlings can assign their drone to the undampable Paladin. So the only assumption you could probably make here, and yeah, now that's confirmed, Sir Phobos Knight and the Korax is taking damage. Mm -hmm. uh, for some reason, they want that Korax dead. Good on him. There goes the Jaguar, though, and really yeah, fast. That, that's what <laughs> that's I'm worried about. That's probably why they wanted yeah. the Korax dead. Yeah, makes sense now, looking back on it. Mm -hmm. uh, but so these Rattlesnakes are spending DPS with no result right now. And that is the absolute worst thing you can do in a tournament. Uh, if there's one rule, it's make sure you're applying it. Micro jumping out of the arena is probably worse. Well, yeah, no, maybe, yeah. maybe. Uh, only slightly, though, but uh, the second rule of that is that uh, make sure you're applying it to the right target. Yeah. So we don't have either of those rules being followed. As the second jag is going down, and why are they not switching to something nice and fat that they can hit? Yeah, these are not doing anything significant. I mean, it, we're seeing, uh, there you go, another frigate off the field. Uh, the Waffles just uh, are able to easily pick apart these frigates. They've got the Worms, the Korax, that are really, really good at killing frigates. Yeah. Uh, the Korax is, uh, oh, we've got Micro Jumps activated. Um, the oh, Paladin no. and all the uh, Rattlesnakes are going to try to Micro Jump on top of the Waffles team. They're going to try to jump in the middle of them, and uh, they were, are successful. They are oh, about to oh, land whew. in the middle of the Waffles team. Oh. Yeah, that uh, that is the most impressive thing I've seen mm -hmm. all year. <laughs> like that, that's gonna top the highlights list. Four people, not just one person, mm -hmm. but four people just MJD'd successfully so, only to show up for the Jaguar to die. Yeah. Uh, so now, again, the frigates still have no protection because the frigates can't micro jump with the battleships. Mm -hmm. It looks like they were trying to do some damage with the smart bombs from the Paladin, but yes. obviously that's not gonna so kill these ships. The scimitar of. Denale, mm -hmm. something along those lines, was, uh, he wasn't ever tackled, but he did have a newt cycle on him, presumably a uh, heavy newt from the rattlesnakes. Um, 
But he kited right out because he wasn't tackled, and now that's just a faint memory. Yep, I mean, they had a painter on him for a bit and looked like they were going to try to apply damage to him, but now they've given up and switched back to the Korax. Right. Um, an odd choice, considering that they only have the one Kestrel left to keep alive. I guess the Kestrel might be their painter, and you don't want to lose that, yeah. or else you're going to lose a lot of your damage application. It could just be trying to avenge their uh, fallen Jaguar pilots, but I don't think it's going to work out well for them. Uh, I think this is a classic case of a group that looks at a ship, recognizes that it's got good tank, it's got good damage, um, and maybe not 100% understanding the projection on, yeah. it, on that damage. So this Rattlesnake of Bandit is going down. He is getting cap transfer from his friends. He's running a uh, what this, you would assume is an ASB. Um, there is the Paladin smart bombing the drone. So if the Paladin can clear off these drones from the heel as fast enough, they might be able to keep him alive. It's going to be very close. Though. So interesting minutia from this ca uh, camera angle. The Rattlesnakes are using like a traditional uh, cap chain. Mm -hmm. So they're making a complete circle. They're not funneling two cap transfers into the guy that needs it. So they're actually gaining a really, really small amount of capacitor. It's not negligible, but it's certainly not enough to fuel a, uh, a shield booster. So I think that's a serious mistake, and uh, I, I would I would want them next year to, to maybe... Maybe, cap focus a bit more. Maybe they decided that they wouldn't need cap boosters then because you need cap boosters to fuel. That is possible. I mean, yeah, you can keep your hardeners on. And so it, it's not wasted. It's just it's not something you see here. And mm -hmm. obviously he, he didn't have enough cap to stay yeah. alive. So maybe something to think about. Yeah. So at this point, uh, with one rattlesnake down, that's uh, more than a quarter of the actual damage application. Well, yeah. well there's no uh, turret or no launchers on the rattlesnake. So it's yeah. some significant amount of damage from yeah. the <laughs> methodical so, team. Down. And, and a question to that end is, if you have no launchers in the high slots, you've obviously got the mm -hmm. one cap transfer. But per the rules, you can only have that one cap transfer. Yeah. Um, there is more than one high slot on a rattlesnake. Snake. And we did see newts, so presumably each has at least one newt. That's still a lot of space. There's no extra smart bombs. You would kind of think right, a smart bomb right, would also right. work, but only the paladin has used smart bombs this right. fight. Um, so my guess is that it's just lots of newts. Um, some... Um, uh, drone uh, range drone -like modules. Augmenters, yep, yeah, those yeah. those are probably mixed in there. But uh, yeah, it's definitely uh, not what you more kind of commonly see from rattlesnakes, right. which is using cruise missiles to take advantage of that big damage bonus they have. Yeah, this is uh, this has got to be painful for methodical mm -hmm. because, in the same way that a tinker works, hypothetically, once they lost one of those rattlesnakes, it sacrifices the tank even more on the other two rattlesnakes. I don't think that was really important because they can't apply damage. Yeah. So uh, this is one of those those matches that I'm sure Apophne was grinning from ear to ear as soon as he saw them go for the the support ships with those sentries. Mm -hmm. It's not a bad plan. It's just rolling those dice, and and if you don't connect, then You've, you've spent thousands of, of DPS that yeah. didn't go anywhere. So the second Rattlesnake now is going to go down. He's dropping into armor now and will probably go down much quicker now that he's in armor. Um, the rat the um, Paladin is killing drones with that smart bomb, but not fast enough. The right. healers have backups and they're just sending backups in as needed. Well, and, and one thing that I think is absolutely awesome here is that this Paladin pilot is still moving, which mm -hmm. might seem insignificant, but it means that this guy's at least thinking about what he's doing. He's, yep. he's drifting around to try and hit more drones. He's not panicking and, and bastioning. Um, a lot of people immediately bastion for the E-War immunity and the added projection, given that neither would benefit him greatly here. He's just saying, hey, I'll stay mobile. I'll keep my options open in case I do MJD mm -hmm. into Oblivion or wherever he wants to go for his next cycle. Um, I'm hoping for a synchronized MJD out of the arena as an act of solidarity. They are aiming in the right direction to do that. Yes, <laughs> uh, I'm just waiting for it. I'm like, I'm as my face is as close to the screen as it can get without me going out of frame. Yeah. So uh, the all the new wave of drones have now caught up with this uh, rattlesnake. He was pulling back for a bit, but it looks like it's only a matter of time. The uh, oh, waffle team has lost a worm a to worm a boundary violation. Really? Yes, that yeah. worm was a boundary violation. <laughs> He just decided so, to fly out of the arena because okay. he was bored, I guess. Right. Uh, again, I go back to my salmon metaphor. Might be the reason. But I, I don't think so. Uh, that's kind of a... Apothne needs to yell at him later. Yeah, he yeah. wasn't anywhere near the fight either. He just no, looks like he, he just, just like decided out, to yeah. motor off to the side. He was trying to like approach the planet, maybe. I, I don't yeah, know. well, you know, yeah. do your own thing. That's what I always wanted say. to set up some PI colonies. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now's not the best time, but mm -hmm. maybe Jove Space has some particularly nice planets. You try to pick so them up once per year when yeah. you come back from the Lions <laughs> tournament, and, like be, harvest your stuff. I would love to write that article if that does end up being the case. But uh, this last rattlesnake is going down, and then I'm not going to bet a thousand this because it almost got me burned last time. It might space wife would be furious so uh this time we'll just we'll just wait and see i really don't think the paladin should die because 
there's not that much damage with this Waffles comp. It is very sturdy, very mobile, but it's not the sledgehammers that we've we've seen from other groups. No, but that being said, healers do a lot of damage. So right. any time you have a setup with triple healer, you have the potential for a ton right. of damage. Um, the uh, healers for Waffles, though, fitted uh, not for full damage. Obviously, they're trying to squeeze on things like tank uh, because they've all got rocket launchers fitted. Yeah, uh, which... Which is a little bit odd. I, you don't get a lot of yeah. damage out of that. But uh, I think they're probably just focusing on tank and drones. Could really. you hypothetically kill drones with rocket healers? Very slowly. Yeah, yeah. I just don't... I, I don't know. I, stylistically, they're not even the coolest looking thing to put up there. Festival launchers are allowed in the Alliance tournament. They something indeed. to consider for their next run. Yep. Uh, but uh, one way or another, it's still winning them this fight. Uh, yeah. There's uh, two minutes left, and it's now just a question of the, whether this Paladin dies. And of course, Methodical, I'm sure, would love to keep it alive. Uh, they are going to be knocked out of the right. tournament, but a good consolation prize would be not losing a very expensive Paladin. Right. This guy can go and, and get this Paladin stuffed and, and mounted mm -hmm. and all that. The uh, the interesting thing, to your point about the Gila's, right? The, the Gila is, a triple Gila setup is really all the damage you need. Yeah, technically, if, if you're piloting well. There are obviously some substantially tanky setups where it wouldn't be enough, but um, we've seen several teams pair them with EOS. We've even seen one or two teams, I think, that brought a Slepnir with them. Um, why a Claymore? Why not maybe a command ship with more damage? Is there any obvious reason? or? I mean, the Claymore uh, gives you the advantage of being able to hit at pretty long ranges. So these are heavy missile Claymores. Uh, mm -hmm. So they're not designed for max DPS. I think right. they're designed to provide the links and tank and then just sort of stay at the outskirts of the fight, like launching missiles in. Um, gotcha. The other alternative for that, of course, is the Vulture, but the Claymore is faster and uh, you don't have to worry about tracking as much. So the sure. heavy missiles don't do as much damage as the Vulture, but at least you, don't, you can still hit things in close. Uh, looks like I maybe should have bet you another thousand is yeah. because it really is amazing actually that these um, we always say I think going into matches that uh, this Marauder is probably not going to die and every time that gets said the Marauder ends up dying. So the Marauder is still smart bombing. Uh, he's knocking out these drones slowly um, and uh, there is time being taken for like more waves of drones to arrive. Sure. So I think that is actually going to keep him potentially alive. He is still sitting at like 30% armor. Uh, he's repping pretty solidly and he does only have to survive for 22 seconds. But it is, it's like right on the edge. Artemis there is, uh, he has structure damage, he's dropping quite low and uh, there's basically they're throwing everything they have at him at this point. Yeah, this is sort of like a mini game embedded in an alliance tournament is if you if you are going to lose a match, uh, just see if the guy can tank. It gives yep. you something to celebrate afterwards. And it actually was a pretty good run. I mean, that's a strange comp and it didn't work how they had hoped. But I think they still position really smartly, and that four-man MJD blew my mind. And they yeah. actually hit their target. They yeah. did go out of the arena. Yeah, so congratulations exactly. to Methodical Alliance. They are eliminated from this Alliance tournament, but I'm sure we'll see them back in AT13. And uh, Waffles will be continuing on. So uh, we are going to be back in just a few minutes for Afterlife versus Scum. But before that, let's send you to the analysis desk and what I'm sure is a very relieved apothecary. Yeah, I'm sure. All right, Space Chutney's primary. My client just froze. Support took care of that, please. I can Everybody can't. else stay on the Vexor of Space Chutney. down. Yep, Space Chutney's primary, followed by Captain Go. Primary target. Okay, Space Chutney is now primary. Okay. Uh, space is about to go down. Right on. You dead? Space Chutney's primary, guys. Make sure it's on Space Chutney. Loot the field, guys. Loot the field. Welcome back to the studio, everybody. I'm CCB Gargan, joined here by Apothne, back in Alien, and uh, CCB Rise. Apothne, contain your smoke, please. Well, how Turn do you like them waffles? <sighs> <laughs> <laughs> I like waffles. Oh, I wish I had but, waffles. <laughs> but let's make one thing clear. They only uh, delayed the inevitable. Like, my puns will come out imme uh, eventually. Yes. They we, will, well, they unless could, they, they win the win tournament. tournament. If we they win we the do tournament. face at our cartel now. Next, which I, we will win, but it's going to be a hard match. 
<sighs> Are you going to give them that? That'll be a, it'll be a hard match. Okay. Absolutely. It's very. Uh, a very strong team. Yeah. It's very gentlemanly of you. What did you think when you saw the uh, setup you were fighting in this match? So um, I thought it was uh, weird, frankly, because it, it was kind of a, a tinker without the logic. Yeah, um, you know, you had those buffer fit rattlesnakes, you got the paladin, which obviously can bastion self rep really well. You got those jaguars, which seemed a little out of place. Um, I think uh, the Waffle FC realized that, you know, you can just drop a bunch of flights and take them off the field quite easily, which is exactly what they did, gave them the point advantage, which allowed them to then be in control of the match. Yeah. If any A team kind of can pick up some points early and there's no kind of rush to kill anything off the field, as there wasn't in that match, by having that point advantage, you're then forcing the other side to actively do something so that they just don't lose on time. Yeah, that was uh... a... <laughs> that was just a body perfect... shot the camera that right there. Perfect time for that. I actually think Twitch TV just uh, uh, just uh, sort of solidified into a person that brought water for season yeah. <laughs> That was the most random thing. Okay. Um, wow. That so, threw you off a little. Um, okay, so uh, as far as tinker without Lodgy, mm. what I was thinking is. Um, We've kind of I talked about this off and on. I know we talked about it some last tournament, but with the Marauder, you end up having to kind of find something, find a way to make a mini team that mm. functions mm -hmm. separate from the Marauder. And we've seen versions of that in this um, tournament where it's kind of tinkery, kind of a uh, kind of self-sustaining logi of some kind. And this to me looked like they, what they were thinking was like, we just have to get something killed with this mm. other wing. So we'll have like just the rattlesnakes. We'll make sure that they kill some stuff and then the Marauder can finish the fight for us. But yeah. um, then that didn't mm. happen at well, all. They managed, this... they managed to kill something. They, they yeah. can Kazakh. Well, uh, well, I think like, Veritas sort of. managed to kill something. Okay, fair enough. Well, no, I think that um, like, what what can you really get the kill on that? You know, we saw the yeah. Mimitar Gila team that we've seen a, a lot of in this tournament. You know, you got the the, the, the Mimitar command ships, great shield booster mount, Gila's great tank, Worms great tank, apart yeah. from to Veritas, um, and then uh, I, I can't remember what our support wing was considered of, of the rest, but it was it was no, I think yeah, Worms. I think it was probably the setup they wanted to see the least. I just yeah. uh, now my favorite, all of my favorite maneuvers in this tournament have been done by a paladin pilot. This was a smart bombing, micro jump driving pilot, pilot and pilot. They did do a nice job with that. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, the other one think, just went straight. I think out they the do have the counter to the heavy to the moving drone meta sorted. They had a lot of smart bombs. Mm -hmm. I just think that that idea needs some probably some refinement and some better execution, which I think we will see as the tournament. It was just on. really surprising that they like they they were actually uh, commentators mentioned they got had a target painter on the scimitar for a while right after mm -hmm. the MGD. They actually also had neutralizers. They were mm -hmm. close enough to actually nuke the scimitar as well. And they still managed to get almost no damage applied whatsoever, which is just really strange. I, I don't know if that's about drone choice or some other like execution problem, but like mm -hmm. otherwise that seemed like it had the potential to be a really nice move. And yeah, they could have I was going to say that, that was something worth mentioning is the first time we've really seen that done extremely effectively. They managed to micro jump drive like their entire fleet right on top yeah. of logistics. I thought yeah, as soon as that, that happened, really I went, well done. something's yeah. changed here. This is going to be really bad for waffles. Hopefully they're far enough ahead at this point that they can they can pull something out. But then just like you said, nothing yeah, happened. But this like, proved that micro jump drives can be used for good in this tournament. <laughs> <laughs> well, the it only took three weeks. <laughs> it, well, everything takes time. Now the final match before our little break, so that yeah. we can feed ourselves, uh, is going to be the afterlife dot versus scum dot. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, lots of dots. Lots of dots. I don't know. I honestly don't know what to expect from this match. The bands uh, from afterlife are Tenko and Loki, while scum dot have banned out the Gila and the rattlesnake. So again, shield tinker bands with Tenko Loki. Yeah. And then yeah. you said Gila rattlesnake. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's it's going to be very difficult to have a shield team in this match, I think. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I wrote a rattle shake, but that yeah. was wrong. Maybe, Unless maybe. we see another, like, fourth for Serb setup, I think we're going to see some, like, old school armor versus armor. Well, you never know. You could, they could bring Drakes. They <laughs> could do that. That is, that is a possibility, but I think if we go to probability. Probabilities, it, I'm, I'm doubting it. Actually, never not believe. Never no. not, uh, exactly. Don't, <laughs> don't stop believing. The great <laughs> fever that Shadu warned us of may return one day. Oh. Now, that, now that you say it, I actually think there will be shield teams. There, I think it'll probably Team? be just shield, like Ishtar, Claymore. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, VNIs are there, which I guess are more likely to be armor, but armor, yeah. Vexors. I don't know. We've seen the old Let's shield ears as well. We yeah. have seen quite actually we saw like three in a row, like three matches Let's in a row with those. Jump had face first. Face first. Face right. first into the next match. Uh 
The Afterlife with it versus Scum. I'm going with Scum. What do you guys think? Um, I'm going the Afterlife. I'm going Afterlife up. I'm going Scum. Ah, oh. yeah, even split. Let's CCD see what happens. Castles. Target has engaged bait. Jump, jump. Target has been broadcast. Kill the pod. Red versus blue. Shooting people in the face all day. But best friends after. Back one and all to the uh, last match before the break on this third weekend of the 12th Alliance tournament. This is CSP Fozzy joined once again by Sir Squeebles, and we have the Afterlife Dot versus Scum Dot. And uh, these are two kind of uh, old school armor setups coming up against each other. Uh, we've got Afterlife with a Dominix, Eos, Double Ishtar, Neros, Kruer, Triple Malice, Malediction, Double Merlin. And on the scum side, you have uh, an Armageddon, double Eos, Oneros, Vexor, 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 three Heretics, and two Mollus. Mm -hmm. Both, both these teams are actually going to play pretty similarly. I yeah, think. yeah, yeah. The interesting thing is, I feel like this is one of those matches where the support wing is the fight. Um, you're going to see drones coming out from both mm -hmm. sides. I mean, the Armageddon is definitely a factor here, but uh, I think really it's going to be a matter of the three Mollus on the Afterlife team establishing damp superiority and holding it and using it to keep those heretics from getting anywhere close. Mm -hmm. um, if those heretics can nuke one or two of these molluscs early, I think Scum would uh, would have a very easy time from there so on out. The match has now begun. Both teams came in at max range to the beacon, but they came in from pretty close uh, warp ins, so they're actually not too far away from each other, mm -hmm. easily within heretic range. So we're going to have to see how well those heretics apply when they're all damped. There's damps on every single one of the Scum Dot right. uh, team members, and you can see that control bar is uh, pretty heavily filled for Afterlife. And really importantly, there's not just damps on every Thing, right? Uh, spreading your damps evenly might not always be the best choice. So they not only have things damped completely, like everyone has their own special damp, but they've damped out the molluscs enough that there's no counter damping. And not only did they damp them, but they also are starting to kill them. Well, one of the molluscs went out of the arena from a boundary violation. <laughs> that molluscs lost for scum was boundary. <laughs> no. And meanwhile, they are losing in a Nero. So that a Nero of uh, Phil is taking a lot of damage. He was barely he was painted once again. And uh, I think it's going to be only a matter of time before he dropped. And this is a really bad start for scum. Those are probably two of the worst ships you could lose early on. We've talked about logistics being a nice thing to have with you. Um, and that mollusk being super important. And my question for that mollusk pilot it is why was he burning away toward the edge of the boundary when he's already losing the damp war? So uh, the fact that damps actually have a max range that's much smaller than the arena means that you can sometimes win a damp war by getting out of range of the other guy's damps and then getting in and counter-locking him and damping faster. Um, it's a pretty tough game to play, though, and obviously very dangerous as it's easy to get yourself out of the arena. Yeah, there is an edge to the arena. Mm -hmm. uh, the Oneros is gone, a Heretic is gone, a Mollus is gone, and everything is still damped. And just like uh, old-school ECM comps, or any e comp for that yep. matter. Uh, as fewer and fewer ships are left on field for scum, they're going to be more and more and more e -ward. So this, it's just sort of like reducing down into being so damped you can't accomplish anything. Yep. Uh, so uh, meanwhile, they're losing a Vexor as well. Uh, there is damage hitting the Afterlife team, but the mm -hmm. Aneros there of Dirty Coyote is doing very well, keeping this team alive. He saved that crewer when he got down to below half armor. Uh, now he's taking damage, but the damage is so slight that I think uh, Afterlife has this in the bag. And Scum has gotten some new out presumably i mean the eos could have newts the vexers could have newts i'm not sure what it is but uh, they're distributed on targets that aren't going to suffer a terrible amount from being muted uh, they wanted them on the oneros the oneros seems to have wiggled out um, good piloting on his part uh, they are this ishtar of dagao alone <laughs> is uh painted and he's not really moving all that quick he's not tackled he's below 300 ms so he's gonna die uh and then actually this remaining Mollus for Scum is putting in some overtime. 
by damping out the Oneros, and uh, Dagon died in the meantime. Yeah, uh, so the Oneros also has uh, what I b believe are going to be ECM drones around him. Mm -hmm. uh, nope, they're actually Valkyrie, too. So he's, he is taking... Oh, there you go. They, uh, those are ECM okay, drones. Okay, I was Constant about to say, ECM I don't know who on the <laughs> other team would have ECM, but that would be pretty brutal. Um, next, they're going for the Dominics. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's going to be hard to break with the Aeneros still Yeah, I, I have to imagine that's a positional thing mm -hmm. at this point. Um, again, they're following the first rule. They're putting damage on something. So you'll give it to them that they are cycling their drones around. Even under the damp pressure, it looks like they're pretty effectively putting damage down. But now this Oneros is taking damage, but is still being allowed to burn at 1,300 MS. So yep. there's no tackle left for Scum besides maybe on those EOS to support the drone damage. And you can tell they're suffering because of that. Yeah, so they did take down a crew there, but this Armageddon has actually not put a nude on anything, pretty much. This really? Fight. I've been watching him, there's no nude effects coming off. Mm. Basically, he's just too slow to get close to things, and he's damped down, so he can't use yeah. that long nude range. Uh, he's now getting pretty close to the Eos. Uh, well, actually, that's his own Eos, but uh, at least there's a frig on him, he could be nuding. But at the moment, he's just uh, motoring around the arena, hoping to get within range of something. I think yep. it's going to be too late pretty soon. Yeah, I think it was too late, even like two minutes ago, really. Mm -hmm. they, uh, Afterlife had a really strong start. Uh, that damp superiority worked really well. It played into their hands that Scum decided they didn't need that Mollus anyways and let him fly out. Um, but this Eos is going down, and quite frankly, an Armageddon and an Eos don't have the damage to close this out, even if everybody in the afterlife goes to make a cup of tea. So I'd, yeah. I don't see this going well for them. So it looks like they actually are getting in some more damage onto that in Eros. It, at this point, it may just be some drones from the Eos and the Heretic. Uh, the mm -hmm. Heretic, of course, with great range, although he is damped. Um, but uh, that, with that last Eos down, or the last Eos dropping for Scum, uh, this is definitely a, a solid uh, position for afterlife to be in. Yeah, I mean, I don't know what Scum did wrong, to be completely honest. I, I think, like I said, the three Mollus on the Afterlife side, that's a heavy investment, I mean, to put three ships toward damping, but it's a really good investment. It's, yeah. uh, it's very point efficient, and we've seen a lot of teams, doesn't really matter, shield, armor, mm -hmm. either one, uh, that have won matches based on damps already. We've been seeing a lot of teams uh, relying heavily on damps, a lot of good teams relying on them, also a lot of good teams that uh, are aware of how powerful they are and trying to ban them right, out. Right. If you look at the um, setups and the bans from the uh, first two weekends from our defending champion and uh, defending runner-up, uh, PL and Hydra, Hydra's been running super heavy damping teams. Mm -hmm. Like, they've been running Mollusses and uh, Celestuses right. and just like tons and tons of dams. And uh, PL's been banning out uh, Mollus and Celestis in like almost every match. Right. They're just, and they really don't want to face right. them. Right. And you could still have the carries, but I mean, that's that's pu putting more points into a single hole. You're not going to be able yep. to distribute this many dams. So um, there's no way to ban out dams in the same way that there's no way to ban out a drone team. But uh, yeah, definitely... I think moving forward, teams that haven't considered that option should take some time and sit down and consider that option because yeah. these damps have just wrecked several teams. Yeah, you have to have a good game plan for them, and as Afterlife showed, one of the best game plans for them is being the, the first ones to damp, winning right. that initial damp right. war. Both of these teams actually had quite a lot of damps. It's the uh, two Molluses on Scum versus the three on Afterlife, but it's likely that the Heretics on an Armor Heretic team probably have some extra damps as well. Um, and uh, so there's a lot of damps there, but they just all got hit much faster and then quickly lost a Mollus to Boundary right. Violation when he was trying to do the dance <laughs> of this support, which is another thing that we often don't really get to see very closely because it's kind of hard to follow yeah, the intricate movements. Yeah. But for uh, Molluses versus Molluses, in these kind of fights, dan like dancing in and out of each other's lock range is actually pretty powerful. Mm -hmm. And that is the match. Afterlife is going to be moving on and Scum is eliminated. Uh, and now we are going to be sending you back to our uh, analysis desk and then uh, to a quick break.
Welcome back everybody from our little break where we fed our commentators and ourselves so that we can continue to bring you guys <laughs> great matches like we've had all uh, first half of today. Until we can develop robotic commentators, we have to keep doing that unfortunately. <laughs> You're our prototype, <laughs> which still requires sustenance. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is the 12th Alliance tournament, the fifth day, the third weekend, uh, the first studio weekend. And I'm CCP Gargant, joined here by Back and Alien, Sir Squeebles and uh, CCP Fuzzy. Both of them coming back from the hot commentator booth. Uh, yeah, uh, but it wasn't temperature hot, but it was... It was, <laughs> it was steaming hot. Yeah, steaming yeah hot. it was like Absolutely. caliente, look at how exciting these matches are, mm -hmm. sort of a hot, which I much prefer. So, uh, it ended with um, a bang, so to say. Mm -hmm. last 12 match. of them, actually. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> actually, I think it was, was like it was 11. Like 11 yeah. Or whatever, yeah. <laughs> but the next match we have uh, coming up is the End of Life versus Coven match. Mm -hmm. uh, the Coven guys are some that I know from... A, I met some of them in a Polish player meet in Warsaw in, uh, mm. in July, so I have a bias. Mm. The End of Life guys I'm not as familiar with. The match is ready already. Do we oh. have bands? Uh, we ready, have, ready. Well, mm -hmm. we can just go right into the match. They can talk about it. Yeah. Let's just yeah. go in uh, blind. Let's just do it live. I like it. Do, do our like guesses. It. Yeah, yeah. This right. is this is the test of a true like commentator predictor. Yeah. 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 So yeah, I'm uh, going end of life. End of life. Yeah. I know nothing about either of these teams, so I'm going with end of life. I'm going with Coven because I know them. Uh, <laughs> and uh, we'll go to the commentator booth. We'll we'll go to the commentator booth soon, uh, and then we'll return to the show called CCP Garkin talks a lot and has a bunch of people there with him. <laughs> So, My favorite show. <laughs> it should be. It's a great <laughs> show. So let's uh, head on over to the commentator booth. Welcome back, everybody. This is Elise Randolph, joined by uh, Apothne in the commentator booth to continue on our day five action. We're still in the losers bracket, but these teams are, are still pretty entertaining. We've got End of Life and Coven. Uh, End of Life is in red, and Coven is in blue. They've got sort of similar teams, not quite. Coven has a few mm. fewer people, uh, but why don't you tell us about the teams? Well, we've got two kind of Mimitar Gila teams, as we've seen before. Um, I find it very interesting that Coven have decided to bring a Nighthawk. Typically, uh, we prefer those Mimitar battleships, but the Nighthawk has a better resist tank rather than the active tank. Uh, we've got the Coven team supported with the three Gila's, as we said. A Serb, some Anti-Tackle, Triple Worm, Maulis, and the Carries. On the end of life side, we've got the Double Slip and a Simi Gila setup that's very, very common. Only two Worms rather than the normal three, then Raptor Merlin Merlin. The match starts, and we already see lots of damps being put on the end of life slap nears. Yeah, it totally is. And the way these guys came in, they both came in at range, but they're actually very close to one another. So you're just going to see a little bit of posturing by both teams as the drones from either side start going off. And it looks as though Coven are going after the End of Life Scimitar for their primary target. And um, Coven actually won the Dampor. I mean, they've got a, a Karis and a Mollus. Oh, wow, that Simi is dropping fast. No, there comes the boost, but it is in trouble already, starting to hit its armor tank. Coven doing a great job, that TP really helping them apply that DPS. Down into armor, down to structure. There's another boost. Is it going to drop soon? Is it going to hold? I think I think he's going to eat it, but he is Ooh. sort of... He's, well, wow, he's actually over-boosting a little bit, but that's still really good. Those but during this time, End of Life aren't doing anything. There's there's no damage being applied to the Coven team. Uh, yeah, well, they have to get in range a little bit, I suppose, or maybe they're just trying to hold out. I have really no idea what they're up to, but this Scimitar, 
He's doing an admirable yeah. job. Okay, here we go. End of Life is now going after the Coven yeah. Scimitar. Here we they go. They need to win the Logi trade. Yeah. Here. I mean, the End of Life Simi is now going to be on the end of his ASB cycle. The Coven Simi is going to be on the beginning of his ASB cycle. Unless End of Life nuke through this Simi, they are going to be really far behind at the beginning so, of this match. Tiny Mouse in the End of Life Scimitar is actually really far from the rest of the arena and the rest of everyone else. He can't rep his own team at the moment, but uh, who cares? Yeah. He's, he's living and... He can get back in. Meanwhile, the Coven Scimitar is now scrammed and damped and webbed, so he's going to wow. die. End of life turning this one around. Wow. The Mollusk of Coven also starting to take a bunch of damage. Uh, we'll have to see whether or not it can hold reps. Looked like it was webbed for a while, but now no longer. Web back on the Simi. Looks like they're going to go after the Coven, Coven Simi again. All right, so Although first there was near event of life taking a lot of damage. Yeah, first blood was that Raptor that died. But yeah, Coven are now focusing on this end of life Scimitar. And, uh, or Slepnir, sorry. They pushed mm. the Scimitar out of range, damped him, and so now they can just finish this uh, Slepnir off. Yeah, it looks like the Simi is overheating its uh, MWG to burn back into rage, but that Slepnir is already hitting structure. Is it going to go down? Looks like it is. That's a big kill, but at the same time, the Simi for Coven does go down. Yeah, End of Life is actually winning this battle, I think, a little bit better. They traded a Slepnir for a Scimitar, mm. um, and their Scimitar is actually doing really well. Yeah, it is damped at the moment. Looks like we've got a web and a TP on the Merlin. Looks like Covenant going after. Actually, they're going after a worm. Worms do a great amount of DPS. They're quite hard to catch. So if you do get some tackle, it's a great idea to take them down while you can. Looks like more support for End of Life is going down while Coven is losing their Mawless. Yeah, okay. A Coven is now tackled and End of Life Gila. Ooh, wow, he's not in a very good position no. at all. I think he's going to get dunked on pretty quickly. Yeah, there's the TP and the web taking chunks and chunks and chunks of damage. At the same time, they're also learning a, losing a Merlin. And Coven aren't taking any damage at this point. What's going on, End of Life? Yeah, who knows? But it looks like the Serb on this Coven team is actually slowly killing these Merlins down. And as these Merlins die, um, Coven are winning the con uh, the damp or and their control bar is actually fully applied. Yeah, I mean, without this Frick support, you're not going to be able to tackle down those fast-moving Gilas, the Serbs, those Worms. It's going to be super hard to apply your DPS. And let's be honest, what DPS they have less? They've lost a Gila, they've lost a Sletnir, they've lost a Worm. You know, they've you know that's maybe a, at least a third of their DPS off the field, whereas Coven are sitting pretty. All they've lost is a Simeon Wallace. They've got a ton of DPS left. That Nighthawk means that they've got a huge buffer tank on those ships still, even without the Simi. Ooh, but the end of life Simi finally drops. He couldn't kite forever. He did an admirable job lasting three and a half minutes minutes he really baited that fight out for end of life he put the team on his back but it's still not enough let's see coven's got three healers and a nighthawk and a serb end of life has got two healers and a slepnir i think coven's yeah. coven's way in the lead here coven's sitting pretty here you know it really shows in the points 50 versus 18 yeah but even, even just with the, yeah oh. even position like coven just currently dunking all over yeah, the other Slepner going down, another big chunk of End of Life's DPS. Um, I think, you know, Coven have played this really, really nicely. I mean, they lost their Simi kind of kind of haphazardly, but other than that, they've done a beautiful job here. Yeah, really nice recovery from this Coven team. They're really showing that they, they know what the tournament is about. Ice water in the veins, and uh, they're just currently just dismantling the rest of the team. As you can see, like, End of Life can't really do anything. They can't apply any of their damage at all. All their key ships are damped out. And after they killed that one scimitar, they have nothing to show for it. Mm. I mean, so at least tell me, like, uh, we, we see a lot of Mawless in the Alliance tournament, and some teams are choosing to fly the carries, especially in um, uh, their Kaiti speedy setups. Do you think that's a lot to do with the extra mid or the possible defensive scram? Uh, it has a. You I know, don't think what, what is it, what makes it worth that point cost. I think it's all about it's all about not the Benjamins but the mid slots and the dams. Mm. Um, I don't think they're going to be fitting a scram or anything in there. Maybe they will if they're a little bit uh, zany, but I think it's all about the really fast locking initial dams to win that damp or, which is exactly what Coven did. And uh, yeah, end of life is just now paying the price. Yep. They've got two Ish. ships left. Soon it'll be all gone. Um, so yep. here we go. We've got two setups that are very similar. They're sort of similar to something we saw last year from Hydra and Exodus, yeah. who fielded the two command ship, three Gila core. Um, do you think this is going to be like the new part of the drone meta today, or is this just yeah, like an aberration? Absolutely. We've seen it for the past two weekends, and I think we've seen some teams like do variations on it. For example, Hydra, as you say, played it last year. This year, they chose to put Arties 
on yeah. their Slepnirs, which is a really cool decision. You know, we get the famous Boom Hepshot ad out of that, which I really like. Um, mm. And I, I think that even with this drone-heavy meta this year, we've got teams who are taking these core archetypes, the Rattlesnake Tinkers, the, the Minmatar Gila setups, but each team is supporting it differently, making tiny different decisions based on what they think their opponents are going to do, based on what they think might be better, trying to get ahead of the meta. And I think it's really, really interesting to look at Analyze. I'm really looking forward to reading Even News sites uh, after the tournament's over, after kind of the guys that know what they're talking about have had uh, some time to look at the matches, kind of look at the Alliance tournament as a whole, and we can have a really good discussion about how the meta has shifted this year. So they're basically just going to copy everything we say, and uh, of course, we are we are Absolutely. the experts. Um, so end of life, I have one Ishker left. Looks like Coven's just kind of looting the field. There aren't really any fancy, expensive drones, so mm. they just want some cap charges or something. I don't know. Maybe you their take what you like can get. Really maybe empty. maybe their their bank took a little hit. I know. What what do Coven do in Eve? I'm not familiar with them. Uh, they kind of just live around in the Stain area, shoot dudes. Yeah, so living in Stain, not going to be incredibly rich. So maybe that's that's what the looting is about. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're all about the shooting dudes, I guess. Um, yeah. Let's see. End of life. Hmm. They're going to be eliminated now because we're now in, we're still in the losers bracket, even though mm. we had a break. Yeah. Coven advance. Um, the losers bracket's really tough. Like even though Coven oh, it's, were it's really dominant, seeing like. It's so many matches. Like yeah. the guys in the losers bracket, just this weekend before the final weekend slog, they can play up to three matches if they win today. Jeez. Obviously, they want to win. They'll be really happy to win. But they'll play. Also, they'll play one game today. But they can play two games tomorrow, really, really easily. That is incredibly grueling, mentally fatiguing. Yeah. And uh, maybe that's why they're just taking their sweet time now. Like they just want to rest up a little bit, <laughs> theorycraft for the next opponent. Probably not. They probably just want to just enjoying their victory, games. slapping each other on the back on comms. Yeah, these are high pressure situations, so. Yeah. When it's over, you kind of just take a breather. You kind of forget how fast time goes. But this ish curve finally goes boom. Coven wins, advances, end of life is gone. Yep. And with that, we'll send it back to the studio. See you guys. Welcome back to the blue table, everybody. Uh, I'm CCB Gargant, joined here by Bacchanalian, Susquibbles, and CCB Rise. Uh, the Coven people <laughs> <laughs> in disguise. I'm sorry, CCB Farsi. <laughs> this was just pull a, off my mask. This was just a tip. There's actually the only trick. one of us. We do all the balancing, and, or mm. I, I do all the balancing, and I'm CCP Rise with a CCP Farsi uh, mask on. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That uh, would the... that would uh, mm -hmm. that would explain a lot of the conspiracy theories about how both of you balance really badly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh. Ooh. Anyway, the Coven people uh, have now proven that. Uh, what I knew already, people that drink that much vodka on a Wednesday night, they, they win in tournaments. Mm -hmm. It was a strong showing though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and from very, two very similar setups as well. We were talking a little bit uh, over here during the match about kind of why the damage seemed to be applying so much more easily to the end of life team. The end of life team was losing ships much more quickly. Uh, the Coven team uh, avoided a lot of that damage. And we basically concluded it came down to the speed that they were moving at. These yep. um, heals, especially for the uh, Coven team, were doing a great job of overheating their MWDs when they take damage, getting away from the drones, and the drones were spending a lot of time chasing after them instead of doing damage. And that's something we've been seeing a lot of good teams do, and in a very like mobile drone heavy meta like this, it's a very important skill to have. Mm -hmm. And that goes back to rule number one from the commentator booth, which is always be applying damage, and they weren't, whereas it's Coven mm -hmm. was. Good rule. So. Yeah, it's yeah. a good rule. That's yeah. a good rule. But that is one of the drawbacks to drones is time on target. You know, you have to 
consider they have a huge attack bar, but when you switch targets, those drones have to travel a long way sometimes. Yeah. And especially the heavier drones are slower, so it takes a while to cross the field and get there. Mm -hmm. And that really can affect a team versus one that can apply instant damage with uh, with turrets or, or even you know slightly delayed damage with missiles. So. Yeah, my uh, my sort of approach to the tournament now would be like bring smart bombs and go fast. <laughs> <laughs> it seems to be that it's, it's developing. The it's yeah. 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 it's developing. Added a layer yeah. now to the I, We can I'm, tell that the next thing you're going to learn with if those are your first two, bring smart bombs and go fast. The next lesson you're going to learn is don't go out of the arena. <laughs> so yeah, we'll get there. we can already see the progression. Yeah. Yeah. It's, oh. it's building into a proper meta. Now the next match uh, sees Circle of Two versus Outbreak. Mm -hmm. Dot. Uh, Circle of Two did not get a match. Last weekend, because yes. they were set up against up against Code, who mm -hmm. were disqualified from the tournament, uh, so we don't really know what they'll bring. Yeah, I mean, they've only had the one match so far total. Um, they This is an interesting match because it's two teams that have both had great tournament histories. These are two teams that have both won silver medals in the past. Um, but they're also teams that haven't been all that impressive in the last couple of years. So uh, they may be working really hard to try to regain some of that old glory. Yeah, I think Outbreak in particular over the past maybe two or three years has gone through sort of a typical drop in activity. Mm -hmm. And I think they really picked right back up before this tournament. So uh, I'm, I'm cheering for them. That's also going to be my prediction by the end of this. But uh, I really would like to see them come back strong because they do have such a good history with the tournament. Mm -hmm. So Yeah, I don't know. Circle of Two having that weekend off. You know, We were talking about fatigue earlier and how many matches some of these teams are going to have tomorrow if they you know, get through here and so forth. Um, but I think I think uh, having that weekend off leaves you a two week gap between the first match when you got your game face on, you're you're mentally prepared and ready and part of it, mm -hmm. and then to go a full two weeks before you do it again, like it's really there's a potential there for you to lose your head of steam, lose the momentum yep. you carried into that first match and. Uh, just, yeah, I mean, it, it could be a struggle. And especially considering that they didn't win their first match in the first weekend right. either. Yeah. So that's a lot of time for you to maybe overanalyze the mistakes yeah. you made, to focus too much on that. You don't have the chance to kind of bounce back more quickly. So well, that it could be an issue. Alternatively, though, it means that they had no pressure whatsoever. They got to sit mm -hmm. back and watch all the matches. So all day they sat there with a cup of coffee and were just like, oh, this is good, we'll write these down. Whereas if we were about to pilot, you know, we'd be focused on that and then Typically, once that's done, you might watch a few matches, but you're about eved out if you've had like, really good fights. <laughs> so that really is a benefit. In real time, they got to sit around and, and take yep. that time that yep. they were going to spend on the match. So hopefully they got some really good analysis yeah. done. And Could certainly it, go either way. If I mean, not, I hope they at least partied hard the night before. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the, two options. the bands for this uh, silver level match is uh, Ishtar and Rattlesnake for Circle of Two, and Outbreak have banned the Tango and the Loki. All right, so we've hmm. said it before, we'll say it again. Tengu Loki means you don't want to face a shield tinker. Yep. And the shield tinkers have traditionally been the best tinkers out there. Yep. Um, they have a much stronger tank on the, the central ship, usually a Tengu. Uh, the repping ship is kind of a vulnerability for the armor tinkers, uh, less so for the shield ones. And uh, so it's, yeah, it means that there's a number of different setups that don't want to face that, but it might indicate a relatively low DPS team, a team that is trying to win by maybe evading damage, but mm -hmm. uh, doesn't apply quite as much. Uh, Ishtar Rattlesnake, because it was, it was the first yep. two answers. Yep. Mm -hmm. Let's say, again, that's a, we don't want tons of drone damage. I mean, that's, yep. we've seen that one before, and uh, yeah, I'm sure we'll see that one again. It's pretty common, too, bands. So. Oh, that does leave the Gila open, though. Sure. Mm -hmm. Right? So, um, Ishtar Rattlesnake is a little bit weird, I think, because the Rattlesnake has more in common with the Gila in terms of like a, a sort of a, a synergy for the meta. If you're not going to use sentries, then the Ishtar isn't terribly appealing, quite yeah. frankly. So the, I, the one thing that, you, that may suggest uh, the Rattlesnake Ishtar ban is actually also a more kiting team. Uh, mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. it, although we did okay. see Rattlesnakes fail against kiting teams just earlier today, uh, if you put cruise missiles in them, uh, combine that with sentries, mm -hmm. you actually do hit these kiting setups pretty well. And so do um, uh, sentry drone well, Ishtars. Going back to time on target again, your drones mm -hmm. aren't chasing anything. The sentries yeah. sit still and shoot. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's also a question of whether uh, good synergies have been banned out. If uh, I mean, you may you may be able to bring a Gila, or but what else does it synergize with? Uh, As we've seen anything? a lot, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it so works great with a the, um, the great with, with a nightmare. Yeah. Or a, yeah. oh, nightmare no. Sorry, yeah, yes. <laughs> let's go with that. No, yeah. 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 Sure, yeah. It, so it works as well with a nightmare as just about anything. I right? don't see any of the incursion <laughs> groups on here, so I don't yeah. think we're going to see any nightmares. But um, <laughs> the beauty of it is, is it's range independent damage mm -hmm. on a shield bonus resisted hull. Yeah, or shield resist bonus hull. Um, there are so many places you can put that. And the great thing is it, it's, it fits really well with Tech 2 Shield Resist. 
So things like the uh, double shield command ship plus three Gila's is amazingly strong. And quite frankly, like I think it is going to be sort of the equivalent of the, of the Slepmere Rush, in that it's a comp that you have to get comfortable with. Because even if you don't intend to fly it and you intend to ban the Gila, understand why it works, because we've seen it a lot and we're going to keep seeing it. Every time Gila's aren't banned, I think you're going to see Gila's and shield command ships. I think it's pretty likely. Yeah. yeah. That was the, this was the point that I was trying to throw out of you guys. I'm not that stupid. Well, if we, had to, we have to make it dramatic. It's yeah, not yeah, a show. Of course. Like, yeah. We all agree on stuff, so we got to make Would it, it be so awesome if it was nightmares, though? If it is, it wouldn't yeah, work. Yeah. I love them. Great. I love nightmares. We They're have pretty. two nightmare. I think there are two nightmare uh, flagship nightmares in the tournament. Um, um, one of them died really? already. Didn't one we? of them died already. Yeah, huh. I think. If there's one in this match, I'll go jump in the harbor. We will Can hold you to that. I won't actually do that. The harbor is literally over there. Like, well, you know, yeah. mm -hmm. directions. You can go that way and get to the one by Harpo, though. Right? No, Harpo is over. This, is, oh. this is Iceland. If you walk in any direction long enough, Eventually you're going to water. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Qualities of being on an island. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. it's great. I, I brought all my beach gear, and turns out that's, uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. There's one man-made beach that's open uh, between 11 and 5. On How like two open days and close of the year, beach? they uh, pump hot water into it. Uh, <laughs> no, really? Yeah. Oh, oh you God. guys have everything. This is everything. Iceland. Yeah. yeah. Again, yeah. hot water is free here, so yeah. they just like dump it into the ocean. It's great. Uh, why wouldn't you? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so about these teams. I think yeah. the things you learn when mm -hmm. talking about spaceships. Yeah. No, that was really eye-opening. Yes. So two uh, s uh, second place holders facing off against each other. Uh, one of them has to come out on top, and uh, as we say that. It was whispered into my ear, very delicately. Jelly, okay, yeah. Are you trying to say the match is ready? Yes, yes. yes. The match <laughs> is ready. Let's go. September 13th, the EVE online gaming event. Hashtag EVE underscore NT. Be there or be a douchebag. My nerds, welcome back to the action. We have two more unusual teams coming in now for the Circle of Two versus Outbreak match. Um, we have a, ooh, I won't say quite yet, uh, Elise, tell us a little bit about these two teams. All right, so this is kind of, um, at least Circle of Two is kind of doing a throwback team. They've got a, a double Macarial core with like an Assault Frig wing. So they've got like a two battleship core and then just a mm. fleet of assault frigates that go out crazy. Outbreak, meanwhile, went with a two Geddon core, lots of newts and stuff, but they've got tons of Celestuses and their core isn't really frigates or anything. Um, they've got Vex Navy Vexers to apply the damage and uh, Lodgy frigates and these Inquisitors for the mm. Outbreak side. I mean, I think it's going to be very dangerous because that fleet of assault frigates will be able to tear apart those Inquisitors. I mean, that double Celestis component is going to make the Macarial's life really, really difficult. If they get some range damps on them, Macarial's don't really want to come in very close, especially to those Geddons. And look, we already have the damps, as I say, going yeah. to the Macarial's and the Guardian, actually spreading across the whole circle of two team. Yeah, they're actually just burning straight at each other. They don't care. They actually warped in at opposite sides, so they're max range from each other where they want to go. Um, Outbreak is throwing all of their stuff against, looks like a Navy Vexer. Mm. And these uh, these Outbreak Gens have been pinned down by these Ishkers and Wolves. Um, so you can see they're scrammed, they're not moving, and this is the perfect tactic for these yeah, Circle of I mean, Two teams. That, that was the deal with all the old AF teams. You'd get some really hard to kill tackle on the ships you didn't want to move around either to keep them in place for your DPS or to keep them away from things you don't want, didn't want them getting close to. Yep, all right, so Circle of Two is going after these Navy Vexers. Uh, Pretty pretty good choice, I guess. Mm. But these Inquisitors are keeping them up a lot more than yeah, I think I mean, they thought that would happen. Meanwhile, Outbreak is going after this Mac, 
And this mech's not doing too good. It's got a Guardian helping it, yeah, but... At the same time, you know, they're dropping an Ishka, so maybe the rep's being first on the Mac, and at the same time, you know, they get a, a few things to shoot the Ishka, and they're just taking away that AF force as quickly as possible. A Wolf now, the Wolf of Gig X, uh, one of CO2's leaders, now taking a lot of damage. Um, the, you know, these damps are still being spread rather beautifully. The Mac still taking damage. I mean, I don't think this Guardian quite knows what to do here. Yeah, this Frigate Wing is very smartly going after these Inquisitors. They realize they can't break this Navy Vexor without killing these Inquisitors first. So that's what they're doing now. They're not falling too much. Meanwhile, Circle of Two, they're about to lose a Mac. Like, Whoa. this is the worst trade you can make. Yeah, an Inquisitor for a Mac. I mean, I do like what Circle of Two are doing in that they have their primary ta webbed and tackled ready, and they've got another target that they're ready to go to in, in that Vex and A with the web on it. But as you say, losing a Mac for Inquisitor, they've already lost an Isker. Okay. Like, Outbreak are a severe advantage <laughs> Inquisitor, here. Inquisitor, number one, finally down. There's still a second Inquisitor, but this Mac's gone. Circle of Two lost so much of their DPS. Um, obviously, these frigates do quite a, a deceptive amount of damage, mm. so it's not it's not the worst situation for them. And wow, okay, I take it back. Max <laughs> living in structure. Whoa. He's living to win super hard. Look at him run, <sighs> boys. Look at him run. I mean, one of the things about this Outbreak team, they're very, very damp heavy, but look at the DPS that you two have. Look, Wolves, projectiles, no cap usage. Heretics, missiles, no cap usage. Max, projectiles, no cap usage. All the DPS is not being turned <laughs> off by these guns, and the Mac finally, finally goes yeah, down. They can start working on something else. we had a lot of explosions really quickly there. A Mac, a Vexor Navy, and the second Inquisitor down mm. for Outbreak side. I don't know. I think Circle of Two, even though they're behind on points, I think, yeah, I think, I think they're they going to do it. You know, their Logi's still alive. It's uh, being okay. muted and damped pretty heavily. <laughs> their Logi just got tackled. So ah. this is actually pretty bad for the CO2, uh, CO2 team. But no. Looks like see. we got a web on an Outbreak Vector Navy. So CO2 are going to try, try and take some more of their DPS, uh, DPS off the field. Looks like they don't care about those newts, as I mentioned before. They're largely leaving the Armageddons alone. Uh, they've left the Celestis alone. But it looks like damage is split qu across the CO2 team here. Outbreak really need to rally and decide what they're doing. Yeah, uh, this Navy Vector is falling. This is, this is the ship you want to kill right now, this Navy mm. Vector. Uh, somehow the CO2 Guardian went to the beacon at zero and is just sitting on top of the Geddon. I think that might have been a mistake on his piloting part. Maybe he just wanted to take a picture with them because they're besties or something. <laughs> EO's down, Navy Vex are down. Yeah, Lots I mean, of stuff's exploding. If, if, if we look at the DPS that's left, Outbreak have two Geddon's worth of what I assume is drones. I mean, you're not really going to fit turrets on a Geddon. You've got um, an EO switching to a lot of DPS, but then you've got a Carriers and two Celestis. On the other side, CO2 still have three Wolves, an Ishker, two Heretics, plus a Mac. That's, that's a yeah. huge more amount of DPS, and you can see that in the reflected bar. It just happens to be the case that we can see how much the attack bar for Circle 2 is filled. They're not applying much of it. Yeah, so CO2, even though they're behind on points, I think they're strongly winning this match right now. Mm. They've got one Mac. They're all super mega damped, which is really not what they want. But their Guardian's living a heck of a lot longer than they expected. And um, let's see, so this Karis for Outbreak's taking a little bit of damage. A uh, Celestis is Whoa, going down Whoa, the, the Guardian time. of CO2 suddenly going into structure. That thing got blapped. I'm not sure what's doing all that damage to it, but it is in super danger zone. Yeah, it's going to go down, but I think it's still a good spot. Like, all the drones managed to catch up to uh, the Guardian. He's mm -hmm. sitting on top of it again. The Gaiden's not letting him go. Getting down, yep. carries down for a trade. Well, I, I mean, know. I was surprised they would still have enough DPS to take him out. Maybe, you know, they just finally got his newts out. Um, so this is now a fight of still no Logi versus no Logi now. Um, looks like one of the Celestis got popped. Looks like they'd probably go for the next Celestis, but then they're going to have to burn through the really tanky Geddons and the really tanky Eos. The Mac is kind of tanky, but I think now it's going to be a question of can the Eos and the Geddons, their only hope is if they can apply DPS to very small ships, yeah, which, okay. let's be honest, those big ships aren't very good at. This Mac is... These damps are really screwed this Mac over. Mm. He is now sitting on top of again. He's tackled. Uh, the Newts don't screw him over too much, but if he has any local tank to speak of, it won't work. Oh, yeah. Um, his guns will still hit, but, man, this is this is not where he wants to be. He's in half armor right now, Both and he's not taking much down with him. Both these teams do have a little bit of active tank left. We can see from the defense bar. I'm assuming that's probably an AAR on the EOS and then uh, you know, an XLISB on the Mac, but it is now going into deep armor. It looks like it'll be dropping soon. But I mean, the, the, the support wing of CO2 is looking pretty, and I think it is going to get them the match. Yeah, it's it's really tricky right now. It's just a matter of how much this Mac can, can live and how much damage uh, CO2 can do while their Mac is alive. They're going to finish this Celestis off. Um, Jeez, this is this is pretty tricky. Uh, the Geddon's actually 
are pretty... Let's see. They got rep drones around them, so the Gens pulled some of their damage to kind of mm. save themselves a little bit. And I think that was long enough to, to kill this oh, Mac. There goes the Mac. Yeah, I mean, if the Geddons are just carrying, you know, rep drones, if the Geddons don't have a flight of lights, and, you know, why would you put a flight of lights in a Geddon? Oh, yeah. Like, their mediums and, and, and larges aren't really anything against fix. So just pull them back, put out your rep drones, help your EOS as long as it can if your EOS is carrying the drones you need to kill those CO2 frigs one by one by one. Yeah, CO2 has got to be kind of sad right about now. Uh, it looked like they had it. Mm. They, were, they had it for so long, then they finally lost it. These Geddons are Ooh. being really resilient. Uh, CO2 is going after the Outbreak EOS. Yeah, but these these uh, not these, enough these frigates them. are being muted by the Geddons, right? Uh, I, mean, I don't know why they came in super close. They had all you have to do against the Geddon is kind of kill the drones and kite away. Uh, they decided to do neither. Yeah, and, losing uh, a heretic. The price for it. I mean, the Geddons are a smart bomb fit, so that's going to mitigate a lot of damage from the remaining Ishker. It's going to possibly fire all the heretic missiles away. Wolves are going to have a very difficult time putting DPS on it. But I think Outbreak are just going to keep this point advantage. I mean, we've only got, you know, nearly two and a half minutes of the match left. Yeah, this is actually really, really amazing. I have no idea how this is happening. <laughs> Uh, they have two Gens and an Eos. They, they've never gone over 100 meters per second in the last two minutes, and somehow these fast assault frigates are getting murdered, like right on them at zero. This is the weirdest, most bizarre maybe, thing maybe ever. Maybe they're playing chicken with each other. Who can get the closest to the Geddon? <laughs> well, they all lost. So yep. it looks like CO2 is now without a hope. And uh, they all, there's two minutes left, but I, there's no way. They've got this Eos. 60% armor, but they've got a heretic that's about to die, yeah. and a wolf. What are these guys doing? Why are they all CO2. sitting next to each other? We believed in you for a while. We believed, <laughs> yeah, and you, you, like you let fool. us down. You let us down, CO2, frankly. So in the Battle of the Silver Medalists, Outbreak is the victor, <laughs> as unless something really crazy happens. I mean, mm. okay. Un unless, you know, we have seen MJDs yes. go off. We have, we have seen, seen strange that. things happen before. But this would have to be like the biggest throw of all the throws. They would have to MJD out of the arena. Like this with every this would ship be the, the double rattlesnake throw, like on an equivalent uh, <laughs> level yeah. that we saw in the first weekend. So it looks like CO2 is eliminated. Um, do you yeah. think the Max? Like, do you think the Max could have been replaced by something else? I'm not sure. I mean, I, I like the Max in that they're kind of very new resistant uh, in terms of guns. But I mean, what well, what else are you going to run in that setup? I mean, maybe. Like, I guess you could run, say, uh, bar guests might be a cool idea. <laughs> that would be kind of crazy. We've traditionally seen, like, Vindicators in this role. Yeah. Um, maybe they could have gone with, like, double Gens themselves and just had a better mirror. I mean, I, I, you could even have done something like a Triple Eos or e even maybe a Star Taze. You know, use that Assault Frigate Wing, tackle what you want down, bring that big Galente heavy DPS on top of it, and, you know, you'll, you'll possibly do really well that way. The Max, are, Max aren't mega kite because they're battleships, but they also aren't mega close range. Yeah, but these were armor max too, so they yeah. were a little bit slower than the, the shield max. Yeah, still it looks like the final heretic is going to go down at last with 30 seconds on the clock. It's in structure, it's new to down, no prop mod left by the looks of it. And there, and there we go. So that's it, outbreak continue. CO2 sadly have to go home, so we'll send it back to the analysis desk. This, this, like, it's it's not as bad as the Barry ad, but it still makes me feel uncomfortable. I love it. Gross. Welcome back to the set. Uh, that was an exciting match that we forgot to make our predictions for, but I'm the only one who lost, so mm -hmm. nobody cares. 
Yeah, I think most of us were choosing Outbreak there, and uh, they, yeah, did the job. Uh, Newt Victor, when you can get two Geddons on top of stuff, right. they kill things really well. And more importantly, when stuff gets on top of your two Newt <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So, uh, Mercurials. Mm -hmm. uh, no. <laughs> they, now, they, they, they don't seem to be in as much as they were last well, time. No. Yeah, the, the thing about Mercurials is they have all this really great stuff that you look for in a battleship in the same way that a Navy Dami does. Is that you can fit? Um, you can fit utility. It's it's got great damage, um, and it's got really good speed, which it makes it interesting to use in, in maybe a shield setup. But in an armor setup, your speed is is not going to be too helpful if it requires you to leave behind other parts of your core, like an EOS, and also the Guardian inexplicably still showing up in matches where the Oneros isn't banned. Um, so I feel like the, uh, using an armor mobility setup is not very strong, and just they don't offer the utility for the points put into them, basically. Um, they can be effective, I just don't think they're the best investment. I think there's yeah. always a better choice than yeah, Mercurial. I mean, but if you're arm tanking too, you're using your low slots, one of the advantages the Mercurial has is the, the ability to project damage to range with mm -hmm. the turrets, right. but yeah. you generally want the maybe tracking enhancers in the low slots. I guess they could go mm -hmm. tracking computers in the mids, but you know, you're know you not you're not maximizing your use of the range without, without a you're tracking. You're mac maximizing <laughs> I, I like it. Yeah. There yeah, we there, go. Yeah, yeah. Come on. I'm, not, I'm on the board now for puns. <laughs> Armor Max do tank surprisingly well, but uh, I think it c partly comes down to that uh, pirate battleships other than the Rattlesnake just are, are hard to justify for the points. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Rattlesnakes fair. do a great job in the tournament environment because they have these weapon systems that are so good for the tournament arena size. Mm -hmm. Like cruise missiles are awesome for it um, and uh, drones are awesome for it. And they can't also uh, be tracking disrupted uh, and have some resistance to damps and like there's a lot of good things about them. But all, all of the other pirate battleships have been doing pretty poorly. We saw the Vargas uh, manage to lose a match, <laughs> uh, the Rattlesnakes uh, losing. Uh, Vindy's haven't done great. Um, mm. There hasn't been a lot of Valgorns, even, actually. Like, the, a lot of teams chose yeah. Valgorns as flagships. You'll notice those are the flagships that haven't been being like, brought out. Like, the people yeah. with the Geddon flagships are actually using them. Yeah. The people with the, um, uh, the Valgorn flagships, I think a lot of them are probably just fake flagships to uh, try to, like, bring the other team in a uh, different direction in their predictions. Yeah. I have nothing to add to that. <laughs> <laughs> that was just perfect. Uh, the next match... Is almost awesome dot versus no hole no holes mm -hmm. part. Uh, I marked it down almost awesome as my uh, my prediction. Uh, I should go into the bands before mm -hmm. I do this. I know all this. Oh my God. <laughs> I don't know about you guys. So almost awesome have banned the Hela and the Ishtar, and Noho has banned the Geddon and the Rattlesnake. So that's a lot of the drum boats. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and a lot of both of the big drone battleships that we're seeing kind yeah, of right, a lot, yeah, yeah with the uh, the rattlesnake and the Geddon, Yeah, both but of these teams the have been uh, <laughs> both of these teams have been showing us stuff during these the last two weekends, like mm -hmm. impressive stuff. Yeah, what yeah. do you guys think? Um, I really like Noho. I think uh, I'm impressed by the fact that they kind of came. Uh, within uh, at least throwing distance of challenging Hydra, uh, <laughs> and that's that is something very notable. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, the setup they brought last weekend was uh, overall solid. It missed kind of the the key like vulnerability to ECM, um, but other than that, they like they had came in with a good plan. Uh, and uh, I think they've yeah they've just been kind of demonstrating that they uh, are kind of a solid all around team. Yeah, and interestingly, mm -hmm. like no tinker bands out for them, so mm -hmm. that should be interesting. But I, I don't really know much about Almost Awesome as an alliance at all. I definitely know who Noho is, but I will say Almost Awesome has a great name. They like do. it's simple. It's not even off the wall. It's mm -hmm. just a really solid name. So I, if they can play in that far ahead for their alliance name, mm -hmm. I think they can also take this match. You've got me scared now by saying that no tinker bands, we're going to see a tinker v tinker, and it's going to make yeah. me cry. <laughs> uh, this is going to be yeah. your dreaded match. Oh my god. Yeah. So I, I think Noho. I, I think they've done pretty well. Like you said, they were just like one module off of uh, challenging Hydra there. <laughs> one, <laughs> so very, right. one very, very yeah. important right. module. Yeah. And uh, I don't know, I think I think they're going to be, be the ones to do better here. So. <laughs> but both teams have a potential of bringing something that we don't expect. Like we are, yeah. Oh, yeah. We are getting into uh, like we've been in the elimination bracket for the entirety of the day. Mm -hmm. uh, these teams are facing elimination, and when you're up against um, big names such as Noho, and uh, I mean, Almost Awesome have shown stuff too. Mm -hmm. right. They have an awesome name. Yeah. Uh, maybe there, it's time to bust out the uh, secret 
Yeah, oh, bring absolutely. your unbeatable setup. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, well, obviously. When you're back to the wall, you'd have to mm-hmm. do it. And I'm surprised we haven't seen more flagships today. But we've seen a couple. Well, but you know, your back is to the wall here. You you, you need to you, you play your best card. Yeah, mm-hmm. definitely. I think uh, I'm interested to see what teams they bring because the Armageddon and Rattlesnake ban is actually, I think, a really effective pair of bans. Um, because it almost pushes people into like a more evenly distributed setup, command ships and cruiser DPS, mm-hmm. which quite frankly is really, really tough to fight because you have to hunt down every single one of them. Yep. Your DPS is a little mm-hmm. more distributed. So I think uh, like armor VNIs are an option here. Uh, I don't know, a lot of the comps that are good but not top tier are opened up by these bands. Mm-hmm. So I, I'm kind of excited to see that. Was it Noho that banned the Rattlesnake and the Geddon? Uh, yes. Uh, I mean, Rattlesnake and Geddon are two set ships you don't want to face if you're bringing the same setup Noho brought last yeah. time. The, mm-hmm. the Marauder yeah, plus Tinker. Because yeah. yeah. like, uh, Rattlesnakes have the potential to do a ton of damage against Marauders. Um, and Geddon's, of course, are problems for Tinkers. Right. Uh, not necessarily as much as like some of the smaller ships that have fast recycling nukes, but still it can be an issue if they spread it. Uh, so yeah, I mean, that's, that's something that at least almost Austin has to be keeping in mind and considering that they might be bringing that out again. So the match is ready. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we can just... Check it out. See if they added that extra ingredient that might, <laughs> might make the recipe magical. Almost awesome because it's going to be all ECM. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, let's, go over to, let's go over to the commentator booth and see what's going on. Guys, welcome back to day five of the 12th Alliance tournament. I am Elise Randolph, joined by Apothne, and we've got some really fun, explodey looking teams coming here. Um, we've got Almost Awesome in a Balgorn and Vindicator with uh, Navy Vexer and three Kitsunes, just chilling. The Balgorn and Navy uh, Vindy came in at zero, by the way. And meanwhile, No Holes Bard have a Triple Slepnir Scimitar team with some Vexers, a Moa for support, because why not, and some Jaguars. The, the cool part is, these Slepnirs came in at zero right next to this Vindicator and Balgorn. Well, uh, it's interesting to see Almost Awesome throwing out kind of the popular assertion that Damp's the best of your. You've got three Kitsunes, massive, massive, massive jam potential. But as you say, those Slepnirs are straight at zero. Looks like the jams are going straight on to the Slepnirs, actually mixing across anything now. Uh, we've got webs. The Vindy is webbed, but both Slepnirs are also webbed. So they are going to have a really tough time. They're going to be neutered out by the Balgorn, and they're going to have an insane amount of DPS on them from the Vindy and the Vexor Navies. But it looks like a Kitsune has already gone pop. Yeah, Almost Awesome is not having a really good time. You see the jam effects on the Almost Awesome uh, team. Those are actually ECM drones from the Slepnirs on the No Holes Barred side. Um, so they might not be jammed. Either way, mm. Torin Torres is getting melted in his Vindicator. Wow, that Vindy is not tanking well at all. Looks like the Guardian is getting muted and webbed, so it's having trouble doing reps. And another Kitsune goes down for Almost Awesome. Looks like No Holds Barred is taking a lot of damage on Barak in the Slepnir, but he is he's doing his best to tank. He's holding on tooth and nail. Yeah, this is not going to be good. The Vindy goes down for Almost Awesome, and I'm pretty sure they're 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 gone right now. So yeah. these Jags on the No Holds Barred side are actually being really, really good. They are fighting a different fight away from the, the main action. They're killing all of the Kitsunes that were causing like a really huge issue. And those those, those three Kitsunes died. Uh, at the same time, those that one uh, Vindy from Almost Awesome died. So really good coordination, doing two things at once. Multitasking, really good. It's different than <laughs> splitting fire, but multitasking is strong. Meanwhile, Rowena in the Balgorn, uh, he, he's basically dead, and No yeah. Holds Barred are just wiping the floor. Absolutely, it is a time. giant credit to the No Holds Barred team 
that they landed on Zero with a Balgorn and a Vindicator with three jammers on the field, and they haven't lost a ship this match. So yeah. Though, I mean, the Slepniers wanted to be at Zero on that Vindy too. Um, it's interesting that No Holds Bar just did not care about the Guardian at all, and they had so much DPS, mm -hmm. and they were so convinced about their attack bar that they just plowed through two really bulky battleships. It's not something you generally see all the time. Yeah. I mean, um, the thing about the Balgon and the Vindy is they do have T1 resists. So yeah. while they've got a great amount of EHP to um, kind of catch reps in the first place, holding them is, you know, just the same as holding them on any of their T1 hull, realistically. Yep. So I think this is one of the most one-sided matches I've seen, at least today. Mm. This is just a complete stomping. Yeah. Well, uh, well, almost awesome. Maybe the, the Kitsunes, they just, I don't know, they didn't have enough luck with them. Like, what do you think? How would you change this almost awesome setup to uh, against this no holds bar team? I mean, I mean, obviously they had no idea what they were facing, but yeah, let's I mean, pretend you do. I think that I, I, I honestly, I don't like the triple kit soon. I think that um, you know, damps are, are more reliable. As as we always say. ECM jamming is based on a random number variable, and teams who have participated in the AT for a long time, you know, like your PLs, like your Hydras, they remember those days. They always fit those ECM slots. Some team, some of the newer teams do forget, but it looks like, you know, no holes bars. I don't know if they have ECM modules fitted, but they, you know, they had a good comp. Like those Jaguars, those Vexers with the light drones, they were able to, you know, really destroy those kits soon. So I think something else there. And they're also very top heavy, almost awesome. You know, they've got Balgorn Vindy, then the Vexer navies. That's that's really not much left for them. Yeah, but that's that's all she wrote for this one. No holes barred advances. Almost awesome is eliminated, and we will send it back to the uh, desk. Welcome back to the desk. Uh, I'm CCP Karkant, joined by Bacchanalian and Sir Squeeples and CCP Farsi. There we are. Uh, discussing this first wipe mm -hmm. match of the day. Mm -hmm. You know what happens when I say, hey guys, pirate battleships are a bad idea, and you bring pirate battleships? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you called it. Yeah, what's with the Guardians? Like, I don't know. I'm starting to freak out thinking maybe <laughs> I missed something. Like, I, there's a couple of nice things you can do with Guardians. You can do a cap transfer with one of those ships. Like they might have, like it could be with almost any of them you can do a cap transfer. Um, so some people plan around that. But in general, you're almost always better off with the Aniros. Yeah. And even, I mean, in that setup, they did have the Balgorn, which hypothetically mm -hmm. you could be fueling. But I've never seen them do it. I kept looking for it, and mm -hmm. I, I never saw anybody mm -hmm. actually transfer. So it's a little strange to me. And of course, there's there's the higher level mentality about sensor strength and trying to maximize the number of ships you have on field of a single sensor type to counter ECM, but They had plenty of really Glendish ships too, yeah, yeah, so there was no real yeah, advantage it's, there. It's just yeah. strange. I don't understand the Guardian and uh, I think the team that they fielded was specifically to kill the Tinker that they saw from NoHo uh, mm -hmm. in the previous week. Didn't work out. As it yeah. turns out, so uh, the, the like joke about hey maybe they'll bring all ECM and then they bring the triple Kitsune. It's <laughs> it's uh, yeah. uh, maybe like it might just be that they expected them to bring exactly the same setup, but expecting your opponent to bring ex the exact the exact setup that they just lost with again and not yeah. even update it at all and to bring yeah. in not the plug the bracket. hole that they that I like mean, everyone knows that they this, had there. Uh, turned out to be a comedy that wrote itself. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I don't think there's a lot we need to discuss more about this match, so let's move on to the next one. Uh, as I mark a really frowny X here, because <laughs> I'm uh, really far off my game uh, after the break. Uh, next up we have Monkeys with Gunstart versus Agony Empire. 
I, I really love Monkeys with Guns uh, in this tournament. They have been bringing really fun setups. They brought the crazy Glente all blaster team uh, the first weekend. Uh, and then they brought, I think it was like a Slepner team uh, in the second weekend. Uh, they've been bringing setups that get stuff done fast. Uh, and even though they lost that first match, it, it's, they've been piloting it well. And um, the other thing that brings them really close to my heart is that they tried to bring uh, police comets in the first weekend, <laughs> which is, I love that ship so much. I love that skin so much. It turns out we had a technical issue with them, so we like made them change them into normal comets. Because, but, because we hate fun. Yeah, we fixed it now, so they can bring them. So oh, maybe great. like they'll bring them, and then they'll just pull over the other team and win. I think the only thing that's <laughs> keeping them from winning the tournament is the fact that they can only bring three Thoraxes. Mm -hmm. If they were allowed to bring the full team, I think they'd have it. Mm -hmm. That's a. <laughs> the, I mean, we might take that into the I, yeah. I, I asked earlier before I came over, and they said no for no team. Will we make twelve. We, we, we have a couple of fans amazing. of the uh, full thorax team yeah. here. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, they're into the the Galenti RP. They're committed. Mm -hmm. These guys, so um, I, I like them. I yeah. like them a lot. For anyone who's not familiar, they are Galenti factional warfare pilots. So oh, yeah, boy, they, are they like they are uh, <laughs> really really into that, and uh, they have a good time with it. Yeah. Uh, whereas <laughs> Agony Empire. Not so much into the Galenti RP, but also a really, really good team. Mm -hmm. yes. And not yeah. only a really good team, but a really good group with a lot of history and a lot yeah. of really cool content mm -hmm. over the past few years. So Yeah, I've loved Agony in the tournament for a long time. And of course, their match last weekend was one of those classic matches with RVB, uh, yeah. where yeah. it went, like actually went into overtime for just a few seconds. Uh, we're that close. Yeah. Yeah. One of the most exciting matches we've had in the Alliance <laughs> tournament that ever, was, I would say. Yeah, that was one of the ones I was like actually legitimately yelling. At <laughs> My computer. I was oh, yeah. really yelling at my computer. So, Monkeys with Guns dot have banned out the EOS and the Guardian. Mm -hmm. Getting rid of the ship that you guys uh, don't understand. <laughs> they were like, all right, if you want to bring armor, you're going to bring it properly. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Agony banned out the Sleipnir and the Rattlesnake. Okay, they're trying mm -hmm. to avoid the Sleipnir kind of setup that they brought last weekend, and then probably just general rattlesnake shenanigans, which are always going to be pretty common. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of surprised they didn't ban out the police comet. Yeah. That oh, that would have been a targeted that would have crippled, ban. Crippled, yes. crippled <laughs> monkeys with guns. And, and insult to injury, if yeah. you if you say. Uh, mm -hmm. But this also leaves the Larry open. Yes. Yes. It does. <laughs> so uh, the the Gila is now like free for anybody to bring. Right. And if, uh, if I'm not a complete idiot, that means that we'll see at least one of these teams with shield command ships and gilas. So now we're not going to see teams with shield command ships. Well, if, if he started it, I'll say something wrong right. this time, and then we'll move down yeah. the line. So start thinking about what you want to be wrong about next match. Well, I don't know what you're talking about. I've been saying wrong stuff the entire day. Yeah, the um, uh, Mimitar command ship with Healers is still very open because you can pretty easily dodge that Slepner band by going with Claymores. Mm. Uh, they're a little bit uh, weaker at killing small ships, but they've got mm. their own strengths as well. So um, there's been a lot of teams that in the past have just swapped those out when there's a ban. Mm. Uh, so it's very possible we could see something like that. Uh, the match is ready, and uh, if it's a fast one, we might be able to go back on schedule, and then we get to talk more. Yes. Yeah. I like so talking. everybody, Woo. everybody, pray for that. Tell mm. bad stories. So. Man, we be flying tech trees and smoking them trees. This Avoid Alliance, represented by Pandora Spear and Viper Fleet Inc. Spaceship friends, welcome back to AT12, Monkeys with Guns versus Agony Empire with me, Apothony, sat here next to Elise Randolph. We have a really cool matchup for you now. We have a really cool kind of off-the-wall tinker from Monkeys with Guns. Back will be so pleased. We have them bringing a Golem Loki Vulture with triple Ishtar. Those shield Ishtars can do an insane amount of DPS. Then Elise, tell us a bit about the Agony Galente team. Agony went with a, a Proteus Navy Vexor Vexor Core with a few damage. Um, interestingly enough, they uh, had the Guardian band, but instead of taking Onerios, they just took the Navitas. They took two Navitas, so uh, 
No proper uh, armor logy for Squeebles. And here we have the action going on. Yeah. Agony Empire is... Mm, looks like they're charging in a little bit. Yeah, it looks like we have a TP going on to Charlie's Ishtar. They're going to try and break an Ishtar first. And it looks like Monkey with Guns are going to retaliate by going for that Navitas. So dropping immediately volley through shield. Is its armor going to be able to hold with those Ishtars? I think they may just volley it if they can get that tracking. Yeah, Ollie Geist uh, in that Navitas is kind of dropping a little bit, but... Whoa! Charlie's Ishtar exploding out of nowhere! What was that? Yeah, Monkeys with Guns Loki is kind of breaking a little bit. The Ishtars really did not want to see this much DPS um, from the Agony team. These Blaster Proteases are all up in Monkeys with Guns business. And this, this uh, Tinker Loki can't keep up. I mean, I have to say, like, the Loki can, again, lock only five targets. It has six things it needs to rep, so I think the scan res damp meant it couldn't lock the Ishtar in time. But now the second Ishtar, which is receiving half reps, looks like Agony fainted shooting Elijah, and now their second Ishtar is down. Back yeah. to be so pleased, this is a Tinker dying horribly. Yeah, there's, there's nothing more painful to watch than a Tinker that uh, doesn't really have the right uh, setups going on. So, monkeys with guns, kind of. Yeah, melted here. Another, <laughs> Another Ishtar, Ishtar breaking holding holding better than his time. brethren under full rep, but like just you know going down. Um, but like Agony have just played this absolutely beautifully with the mixing damps, with the fake target calling. Like Agony, Agony are one of those teams that apparently like Hydra, like PL, really know what you need to do to break a tinker. Yeah, Agony are actually a really quality team. I think they're one of the top teams in the losers bracket. I would be very frightened to to face them if I were in the losers bracket. Mm. Um, Showing a lot of chops here. They've got such a high DPS team uh, because they spent all of their points for their Lodgy. Instead of a Onerios, they went with a Navitas mm. or a Twin Navitas. That frees up a lot of points just for pure, pure mm. deeps. Look at that Vulture. That Vulture was not receiving reps at any point. I'm beginning to wonder if a bump did occur. I didn't manage uh, to see it on the screen. There is no Bumperino, but it looks like... Just the Loki may have just mm. given up. Like it, it's all over. This golem couldn't break yeah. anything. I mean, look, the the, the Vex are navies and the Vex themselves. They've got spare highs. That's probably where the newts are coming from on the golem. That golem is not going to last long at all. Probably, you know, ASB charges. But that's that. As soon as those cap runs out, it's going to have no cap. It's already losing, you know, the last bit of its shield. And this is an insanely quick match, just as Gargant wanted. Yep, yep. Man, Agony is, is doing a really good job here. Like, you've got to be afraid if you meet Agony now. They've shown a few different setups and different ways they can beat you. And, I don't know, this is really convincing. Who did Agony lose to? Because whoever it was, uh, they scare me. Yeah, I don't know. I think there was more of a, a fluke bad setup thing. Ah. But with that, the match is over. Agony wins. Monkey was with guns is completely out of the tournament. We'll see them next year. And back to you guys. Welcome back to us, guys. That was amazing. Yes. Uh, who gave those monkeys uh, executive decision-making rights on their team competition? I mean, the comp wasn't actually that bad of one, but Agony just executed really well. Yeah. Uh, like that Tinker, you'd probably be better off with uh, a Tango instead of a Loki in general. Uh, definitely would have helped against the blaster damage because of the resists. But uh, against that much DPS, Agony just brought out a super high DPS Galente Blaster team and beat our super high DPS Galente Blaster enthusiasts with it. <laughs> yeah. So, 
Pretty yeah. much. I mean, the, the unfortunate part of that is not only do they lose the match, but I think now contractually they have to leave the Lenti faction. They, warfare. they have to actually join Caldera so, FW. So going to be a lot yeah. of people yeah. looking for a new court. I, mm -hmm. I like the way you described it while we were watching the match. Was that it was like Agony tore their arm off and beat them to death yeah. with it. Yeah. Now I, I'm really really sad to say that uh, we were actually going to give out a medal to the whole Galente faction warfare people that uh, won the war zone, <laughs> but after that we can't. Oh, I'm, I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but monkeys with guns lost it for you guys. Oh. We really can't. No, that's just disappointing. Yeah. Black sheep, uh, they affect <laughs> everybody. Uh, I, I want to though, because we forgot to say our predictions for that match. Mm -hmm. I predicted uh, Agony, yeah. so I'm I good was, on that. I was going with Agony as well. So. I also predicted Agony. Did uh, I predicted monkeys with guns. And so you, either we're all better predicting or you're the only honest one. I just, I'm not going to emotionally recover until the latter part there. of the day. Oh. No, hmm? Put a big X. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Ha <laughs> Tradition is It felt good. Yeah, I bet. But so Agony, Agony now uh, advances to meet the um, winner of the next match mm -hmm. uh, tomorrow. And that's not going to be an easy match. No. Either Triumvirate uh, thought mm -hmm. or surely you're joking. Yeah, but if I was, like, honestly, Agony, I think, is the favorite against either of those two yeah. teams. Agony, like, the only loss they've had was that incredibly close match that we talked about before with RVB. Um, they've been solid term performance for performers for a long time, and yeah. this tournament's no exception. Yeah, and that match was definitely no exception. That was yeah. really cool to watch. If I remember correctly, last year they only lost to PL and Hydra or something like that. Like, it was... Mm -hmm. Really? It was to... Yeah, yeah, yeah it was, right. like it was just some top teams. It might have been like PL Ronin or something like that. But it was like it was some of these like teams that went really deep were the only teams that beat them. Well, and the best part about it is it put us back on schedule. Yes, like we're officially yeah. right on yeah. schedule now. Yeah. Thank yeah. you very much for that. <laughs> Thank you I very much. Uh, let's uh, move on. So the next match is the last match of the le the, 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 the. Yes. like yes, I say, <laughs> English is a very difficult language. Uh, when I want to do all my little and uh, sounds that Says you guys can't speaks Icelandic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, it's notoriously the hardest language on earth to learn, pretty much. Mm -hmm. Yes, your English is slightly better than my Icelandic. Can you, <laughs> can you smell my smug? Uh, yeah, yeah. So this is the last match of the elimination mm -hmm. bracket. So uh, monkeys with guns go home, um, and the loser of the next match will as well. I marked. Wait, okay. Let's go with bands first. Let's do this in the correct <laughs> order. We're, we're slowly com compartmentalizing. By the end of the day, video. you'll have this down. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> Let's hope. Uh, Triumvirate have banned the Armageddon and the Rattlesnake. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And surely your joking got rid of the Eos and Ishtar. All just really common mm -hmm. uh, ships to face. But the Larry is open. The Larry is again mm -hmm. open. Yeah. And I mean... And you know what else is open? Hmm. Tinker. Mm -hmm. So are Navy Dominixes if we're just throwing out <laughs> So are Nightmares and Foons. Uh. Yeah. Hey, I'm, I'm about all about the Foons. Maybe yeah. it would be a Foon tinker. I, I'm not all about the Foons. I, I think it made that quite clear with one weekend that we were talking. I'm, I'm really not about the Foons. I actually think Foons, Foons can be legit. Foons or um, CNRs are both like legit uh, ships. We get nothing on the state route. Yeah, nothing on State Raven, yes. Which we will unfortunately never see now. No, no, Razor's uh, moved on. Razor, so Razor moved on. can still Oh, that's right. I was, yeah. I was wrong. And I'm mm -hmm. sure they will. I'm positive, yeah. yeah. There's no way that they <laughs> submitted that uh, flagship as a joke. Yeah. Their yeah. honor is on the line. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I went with Triumvirate. Uh, Surely your joking did not convince me last weekend. Mm -hmm. And I, I have a feeling. Yeah, I mean, I wasn't going to go with Triumvirate, but then I saw that ad that they were playing, yeah. uh, and uh, they pulled up a sniper rifle and things exploded, so I'm going to go with them. Easy sell. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah I, think, uh, I think I'm also going to go with Tri. I think they're, surely you're joking, has some other practice partners, like Easily Excited is a group they fly with all the time, and Easily impressed me with their variety a little bit, but still Tri is, is I think, the stronger team overall. I think surely you're joking, take it. Mm -hmm. Surely you're joking. Sure. <laughs> no, I do. I, uh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Wow. But I mean, there always has to be one, right? Pun or? Both. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but what Whoa. do you guys uh, think we can expect from these teams? It's going to be hard to say. Try has been, uh, like, they've been pretty solid in this tournament so far. And, of course, they had a lot of... Uh, members who were part of good Neo teams in the last Neo as mm -hmm. well, uh, which is part of why I think people were expecting good things from this year. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, up against they're up against the wall at this point. They need to be bringing out stuff that's really good. So whatever it is, it's going to be something they're confident in. And their first round pairing was Hydra, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's... You that's hate a... to say it because <laughs> all things are possible, but 
Um, that's a tough place to be. I mean, <laughs> you're, you're up against arguably like the best, if not one of the best teams in the tournament going in. Um, and they actually were expected to be really competitive. And they mm -hmm. did a nice job. So just the fact that people went in a little skeptical, like, mm -hmm. I don't know if Hydra will win, should mean a lot to them because uh, they were up against tough odds. So hopefully they, mm -hmm. they get more time. Because being that first match pairing is pretty brutal. We'll see. People yeah. tend to be wrong, and teams tend to prove people wrong too. Just just thinking, Trey was good. I mean, yeah. You know, not to call out Elise, but looking at Pandemic Legion, everyone expected them to mop the floor with whoever they fought, and they barely inched, you know, eked out wins. So you never know. Yeah. I, I don't yeah, go with know. public opinion is not always correct. Mm -hmm. I have a theory on that, though. I think Pandemic Legion are going to win the tournament uh, and lose as many ships as possible in the meantime. <laughs> that seems to be the tactic they're taking. I thought that was Quebec's plan, was to, like, accrue as many billions of this loss in Jove space as anyone has ever done. And they that's, got that's tough to compete with. Yeah, but they I got mean, close. we've seen... Um, the the impact died in Joe's space uh, and yeah. like Atanas and Adrestias yeah. and Utu. Okay. So. Fair enough. Yeah. Don't quench the dream, yeah. Bossy. Come on. Know that just <laughs> no, it can still happen. I think if anyone's going to break that record, it's probably uh, going to be Hydra or PL though, because yeah. they they're the people that'll be just like throwing a bunch of Adrestias into a team and losing them all. And man, won't that be terrible for us to comment over top of? <laughs> or you know, it could be Razor. Yeah. You never know. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. I really do. Wow. Well. Yeah. Other than that, uh, mm -hmm. being on schedule means we can actually go in some of the finer details that were added into the camera client, which I've been mm -hmm. wanting to talk about yes. for the entire day. So, CCP Veritas is a space wizard. Everybody knows that. He added, uh, for this weekend, a little tiny sliver health bars below the bracket names of each target mm -hmm. in the, on the field. And each time they take damage, these uh, health bars come up, and uh, then they fade away after 12 seconds or so when they don't take damage. Uh, but if you go below 20% armor, they stay up. I think it's half armor. Is it half armor? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, or if you're below half structure as well. So if you wrap your armor up but you're at low structure, then that yeah, also... it'll stay up. Yeah, yeah. But uh, it's a great way of letting people know not only just like who's taking damage, but also it means that you don't have to be using the uh, fancy uh, UI at the bottom of the screen to get your information about the actual like health of these ships. You can make the connection more easily between what you're seeing and what the health is. Yeah, yeah. and Fossey was not just calling it fancy because it is. It's called fancy. That's yes. the name of the fancy. Of the, of the oh, UI. Oh, yeah. yeah. no, oh, but fancy. now, <laughs> the match we know is our UIs greatly. <laughs> yes, we do. Uh, the match is ready, however. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's just go into it. Uh, we've done predictions. So we're all good. Over to you guys. All right, welcome back to the day five of the Alliance tournament. This is the last match of uh, the losers bracket for today. I am Elise Randolph, joined by Apothne, and uh, we've got some interesting setups here. We do, we do, we do. We have from Time Ver um, a, a slight variation on the Mimitar uh, Gila team in that they've gone very, very damp heavy. They've got three whole molars to damp the enemy team, and I do think that's going to be quite effective against the Shulio Joking team, who have brought three Navy Ravens, supported by a Scimitar, an Orthrus, a Kerry's Daredevil, and a Vigil. Yeah, this is probably the last setup that Shirley You're Joking wanted to see. This tri team that uh, is a team we've seen before. It's something that Hydra and Exodus fielded in last year's Alliance tournament, even in the, some of the finals. And um, this one went crazy damp heavy. Look at that control bar, and wow. it's all applied. Yeah. Shirley You're Joking is going to have a really difficult time trying to apply any of this uh, Navy Raven damage. And as we see, the tri team is sort of. Just uh, just posturing around a little bit. They're going to throw their drones out shortly. 
Maybe they're going to try and blink on the other team because they're not rushing very far. We can only assume that uh, Tegaunt's Maulus is some kind of historied uh, hero Maulus, given that it's in half armor. It has seen battle before and it is coming out again. It is the veteran of the team. We do have the damp spread, not as well as I would expect from the tri team. They're missing a damp on uh, Larzen's Navy Raven, and we're still looking for both teams to try and apply damage. We do have a TP going on Starfleet Commander Simi, but we're yet to see damage applied to it. Yeah, it looks like uh, Kakarot in the Orthrus is, uh, is tackled. He didn't really move too much, so he's going to be the first target um, from the tri team, and he is going to melt pretty quickly, I'd imagine. Mm. Looks like Shuli is joking, we're trying to get some DPS on Upo's Merlin, but it's doing fine. Now the Slepnir is taking damage, possibly a fake out to get the Simi going, but the Simi hasn't got any damage supply to it. It catches the Slepnir, no problem whatsoever. The Merlin is now webbed, so it's going to be easy to kill. And that Orthrus, really, as you know, is just really great at annihilating frigate support. Yeah, but he's getting super mega dunked right now. Meanwhile, ugly Eric in the Slepnir, who was the Shuli or joking primary, has actually pulled range, and he is outside of their range, so he cannot be locked or anything like that. He's not taking damage, or at least mm. not much damage. Uh, only one of the Ravens is, is shooting him. Yeah, well, it looks like all the damps have been taken off the Navy Ravens. They're being focused on the Simi and the Carries. That Simi is going to have a horrible time locking the Navy Ravens. Thankfully, due to their giant, giant SIG, it's not going to be as bad as it might possibly be. But with a Daredevil down, the Inigo down, Triumvir are really burning through the Shirley you joking support with great speed. Yeah, that's actually a really neat tactic that we see sometimes. You uh, you damp the, the DPS ships and the Scimitar thinks like, oh, I'm not going to get damped. I'm going to pull range a little bit. And then you quickly mm. throw the damps back into the scimitar and just murder all the support. So Daredevil down, carries is probably going to go down shortly. Yeah. Vigil and down. Uh, surely you're joking. They had issues with their or Ishker, so it never made it to the arena. So it yeah. kind of came a little I mean, bit crippled. The surely you're joking team kind of have a a simple idea, but it, it really, really relies really hard on those support ships. You know, the Slep Nagila team are very, very fast. The Navy Raven, to apply their damage, they need that bonus fate from the Vigil. They need that web from the Daredevil to apply their maximum potential damage. And, you know, it's just not going to happen with those things off the field. Yeah, John Churchill in the surely you're joking scimitar is like super tackled. He... Ooh, he's going to melt real oh, quick here. Oh, good. Bye, sweet prince. Yeah, so uh, so here's the thing, right? The Surely You're Joking team, they can project damage across the arena really well. Mm. Um, they're undermanned, but uh, and they have one Karis and one Vigil. Yeah. Kind of a strange combination, I'd say. So the thing that they did not want to see was just super damps. Yeah. Uh, and that's exactly what Tri brought. Tri brought the Molluses, really good at damping things. You have to assume that these Merlins also have some damps in them. Uh, though they are doing a fair amount of tackling. Yeah, I mean, um, that carry is now getting new to doubt. Looks like one of the Navy Ravens is now web. Saying Navy Raven is very difficult. Um, looks like the Maulus is taking damage, but, you know, the reps are landing fine. I mean, there's, you know, just kind of... The surely joking guys are kind of holding on, but it's only a matter of time before Try reapply DPS somewhere and, and they go down. Yeah, Try is just rolling over right here. Like, they're very comfortable. Uh, there's almost no chance that they could lose mm. this one. And that means surely you're joking goes to the gets eliminated and try stay in the losers bracket. So the losers bracket is filled with agony, try, shadow cartel, and who else is really good? Well those are like some of the like top tier teams that people were expecting to make huge waves in the Alliance tournament. So yeah. this next set of matches that we have coming up are all winners bracket and the loser of the matches falls into this like crazy hell of a, a losers bracket which you do not want to go into. I mean, I think this this is kind of a result of that first uh, first round of the tournament. We had Hydra play try. And mm -hmm. Hydra are, you know, tournament real royalty. They are, with Pandemic Legion, the two biggest of big names. Try are a very, very accomplished, very, very good AT team. Them getting knocked into the loser's bracket early just means that they have to play a ton of, ton of matches. Yeah. And I mean, like, anyone who gets knocked in the loser's bracket think, oh, thank goodness, you know, I had a really hard match, it's okay, we'll come through the loser's bracket, and then you knock into Try. Like, you must be cradling your head in your hands at that point. Yeah, that is definitely not something you want to see. And let's see, just a uh, mop-up work now. This Navy Raven's dying of Lazran. Uh, the other Navy Ravens are actually sitting on the beacon at zero, so they're not even trying to move. I was hoping that maybe they would try to, like, uh, micro-jump and do some really cool shenanigans. But, uh, no, no shenanigans here. They're just shooting 
shooting things. So, so at least. It actually looks like they're shooting one another right now. <laughs> the Shirley You're Joking Navy Ravens are actually shooting each other. Wow. This is pretty fantastic. But, but at least, you know, we've got this triple Navy Raven theme. Do you think that with the correct support, this is a comp that could be really strong? Or uh, do you think it's kind of an inherently flawed? I, I, I don't want to say it's awful, because that's just mean. But it is a little awful. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's really incredibly weak to damps. So that's the that's the issue mm. it has here, and it's undermanned. So like combining those two things is is not very good. One of the things we do see in um, uh, typically in Tinker setups, you have like this one kind of destroyer or like this frig. That's its entire job is to remote SIBO or remote ECM. Do you think that's something that could help a Navy Raven team, or do you think it's kind of a wasted chip? Uh, I mean, it would have helped them here. I don't know. If it would have worked very well, like I, I'm just not sure I see the the same synergy that they mm. saw with this thing. I mean, obviously they wanted the the vigil to target paint for the Navy Ravens and the carriers to sort of win the damp war for them. But yeah. the carriers can't really win the damp war against Mollusks. So if you want that, maybe you ban Mollusks or something like that. Yeah. Um, either way, surely you're joking. Eliminated. They get some cool rattlesnake BPCs for getting this far. Uh, but try advance. Well, I guess they will advance in a second here. And um, continue on just making making plays. Hopefully, not getting headshot anymore. That's that match, and I believe the end of the losers bracket for today. Yeah. We are about to go into the winners bracket, so we we'll hand it back to you guys on the analysis desk. Now, uh, welcome back to the awesome set of Alliance Tournament 12. Day five, studio day one. We've got Apothne and uh, Elise Randolph out of the hot commentator booth. Yeah. And uh, with us is CCP Rice, the actual one this time. Uh, I'm done with making, making mistakes for the day. That was the last loser market. <laughs> Damn it, as I say that, uh, I fall over my own turn. Trip, stop it. Uh, <laughs> this was the last elimination bracket match of the day. With uh, Shirley, you're joking, going home. Mm -hmm. Probably yelling their own names the entire way. Uh, what did you guys think? Um, well, I, we covered it quite a bit, but mm -hmm. I don't know. I just don't think the, the setup they brought was designed to beat anything against the headstrong dams. I mean, they brought the one Karis, but that, that's really not good enough. Uh, if you really get so crippled by the dam or you want more than one, <laughs> one Karis to save you from it. I still feel that three Navy Ravens will win the beauty contest. They were very pretty, but they unfortunately they weren't able to shoot anything or do anything. They actually, that's not true. They did shoot each other pretty well. I was trying to think during this, is there any other uh, core setup or like, you know, uh, team cores that are being used a lot that don't have resist bonuses? Uh, uh, we see typhoons, the, I think. I'm well, those used ones. We see the, the Geddon like, was used as a core a pretty well. Teams. Geddon's are maybe the most common. There have been some typhoons, but they and haven't we, um, won anything. We did see the Donnies in the, in the loser's bracket last weekend. They yeah. were pretty popular. But um, yeah, I don't... Uh, and Donnies so. would probably still be extremely popular if it wasn't for the point, yeah. point increase. But I was just thinking that's one, of the, that's one of the big kind of 
big differences between a lot of the other courses. Yeah, that last just, year we yeah. saw teams yeah. similar to that Navy Raven team, but taking Navy Scorps instead. And then right. what they ended up doing is trying to mini tinker it around so they'd have like uh -huh. cap transfers uh -huh. between one another. Take yeah. make use of that huge tank they get. I was thinking if you if you really were uh, really set on using Navy Ravens, you might have to like win a damp war so that you didn't actually have to tank much, take much damage at all because yeah. that's kind of. They have a lot of HP, but they're like I said, like they're one of the one of the few ships that doesn't, you know, capitalize on logistics very well, and mm. uh, because of not having resist. So, I don't know. It'd be cool if they could find a way to win because they are cute. Very. That's true. Like someone else I know. Like, <laughs> like father, like son. <laughs> you are well, the uh, official uh, mascot of Alliance Tournament Twelve. I am. <laughs> you are now. Uh, on better? <laughs> the next match. Uh, in um, day five will be the first match of the round uh, in um, <laughs> winner's bracket. Yeah. This is great. Undefeated bracket, it's called. Uh, that's Exodus Dot versus Pasta Syndicate. Exodus banned out the Eos and the Ishtar, while uh, Pasta banned out the Getten and the Rattlesnake. All right, mm. so we see healers go through again. We've seen like healers not be banned, but then people not take them. Obviously, yep. then that last match we saw them. But there was like a, a stretch of four or five matches where no healers were banned and no one took them, like they were just trying to fake each other out to, to take a Gila. That does seem pretty strange. Yeah, it's pretty bizarre. But um, Pasta Syndicate are, are like fan favorites, I guess you'd call them. Yeah. Everyone seems to love Pasta. I kind of like Pasta, they're cool dudes. I'm um, excited to see what the uh, the winner side is going to do. We've seen kind of the reaction to um, like the last, like we've seen the losers now play. Uh, knowing what happened last weekend, adjust their setups over the mm -hmm. course of the week, and then seeing where kind of their meta ends up. I'm curious uh, what the winners will look like. If mm -hmm. we'll see them bringing any tinkers, if we see them bringing uh, tons of healers still, I or think, what? I think I really like Pasta in that their approach to the game on TQ is that they have this thing that they love doing, and they just do it relentlessly. Like, you know, they haven't kind of fallen into the trap of, oh, we're powerful now, let's go take Sov, or oh, we're powerful now, let's go take a ton of moons and have to defend them every day. They just know what they like and they do a bunch of it. And I think that is just really good for the health of the Alliance. Mm -hmm. and then on the other hand, we have Exodus, who are kind of renowned for their kind of small gang brilliance. I mean, for, for years, like, if you run into a small gang Exodus group, like, they, you, you run away, frankly, because mm -hmm. even if you've got twice their numbers, they'll probably still kill you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Exodus are actually an incredible tournament team. They kind oh, of yeah. surprised yeah. people last year. Uh, they were very good in Neo 1, which is kind of gave them momentum into Alliance Tournament 12, where they were very, very good. They took some amazing setups. They just barely lost to PL in the semifinals of Alliance Tournament 12. You mean 11? Um, 11, yeah, that's the one, sorry. We're in 12 now. That's right. Uh, I don't have any future <laughs> intel, unfortunately. <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, I do think, though, that the winner's bracket people will have uh, a greater incentive in not revealing anything new. I mm. think we'll see them bring the same setups, uh, mm. more or less. Mm. Yeah, that's a really risky thing to do, unfortunately, because if you get stuck into the loser's bracket, you have to go through Shadow Cartel, Agony... Mm -hmm. And you have to play a lot more matches as well. Yeah. That, yeah. that comfort zone only, you only get that comfort once. And then <laughs> yeah. even when you do get it, you suddenly have to play twice or maybe even three times as many matches if you get mm -hmm. knocked out early. Like the lo nobody wants to go into the loser's bracket. There's, right. there's very little that's worth allowing that to happen. Right. Well, the match is ready, so we can get on with it. Uh, what are your guys' predictions? Got to go with Exodus, to be honest. Like, they did so well last year. They've got such a good reputation on TQ. And as much as I love Pasta, I just think that Exodus are just too good. Yeah, I think Exodus are going to win this one out. Um, Pasta's been very surprising in the tournament so far. Um, but I, I don't think really good quality skill can be beat by just constantly being surprised. Exodus nope. won't, be, won't be shocked by anything. Mm. Uh, I'm going with Exodus, too. Zara never lets me down. Hmm. I think I'm going with Exodus, too. And uh, let's just see what they do.
Welcome back, everyone, to this next match in the 12th Alliance Tournament. This is CCP Fozzie, joined by Bacchanalian and uh, Exodus and Pasta Syndicate heard that no one had banned healers, so they uh, put some healers in their healers so they could heal by the healer. Uh, there are six healers on the field, and uh, both very similar supporting setups as well, actually. Um, the Exodus team has brought Claymore, Scimitar, Orthrus, Mandatory Triple Gila, Double Worm, uh, Hawk, Double Mollus, and Crow. And we're looking at Pasta Syndicate here with uh, Double Slepner Scimitar, Triple Larry, uh, Triple Heretic, Triple Merlin. So uh, it's interesting. I think they brought, in, in form of raw DPS, a higher DPS setup mm -hmm. than Exodus did. But uh, I trust Exodus to have a pretty good setup. They're usually a very solid team. Yep. Uh, it, a lot of this is going to come down to piloting. We've seen in these Gila Mirror matches uh, often how well you can outrun the um, drones from the other team is comes down to who wins. Uh, having two um, command ships for pass syndicates hopefully going to help with that because it means more links. But the match has now begun. Both teams did come in at long range uh, and from pretty far away beacons too. So they are a good almost 100 kilometers away from each other. And we're going to see them jockey for position as they uh, get the match started. Yep, we can see drones crossing the field and a mollus of uh, mm -hmm. Gasset is already taking quite a bit of damage. His shields just reappeared, but he is in low armor. So it looks like they probably volleyed the shields before the scimitar could lock. And here we go, more armor damage. So yep. they are volleying his shield straight off and back on. I wonder if those Slepners have already gotten uh, gotten a hold of them. Uh, the Slepners have uh, been able to reach out and uh, touch them because they are artillery Slepners. Uh -huh. uh, so this is a setup that uh, is taking advantage of some of the same artillery alpha strengths that the um, Hydra setup has, although with only two Slepners, which actually is probably why that Mollus is still alive. Right, you don't quite get the alpha to just mm -hmm. completely volley the frigate right off the field. We see the scimitar for Pasta Syndicate of Capcu taking a little bit of damage. He's about half shields. I haven't seen a huge ASB boost out of him yet, but uh, I'm sure he should be doing that soon. Uh, we have a, the damp coverage isn't uh, quite what I would expect from Pasta. I mean, they have some damps there on the Orthrus and the two Mollus. Why would they do the Orthrus? What do you think? Uh, I mean, the, getting the Orthrus's missiles off the field would be great. If, if the Orthrus especially was heavy missile fit and was at extreme long ranges, it might be a, a great way to uh, take his DPS off the field. He is rapid light missile fit, though, so he's probably going to be in a bit closer. Okay, well, that cap, that cap you scimitar is almost stripped entirely of his shields now. He's going into armor. That Mollus finally did get volleyed off the field after taking one more volley that cleared his structure. And the second, uh, sorry, that was Del Diablo del Rojo. It's a mm -hmm. different different mollus, so they're in danger of losing both mollusks on the Exodus side here, but figure two mollusks trade for a scimitar is a good trade, and here we go into, into structure now for Capcu. Capcu kept himself alive for a very long time there as he was being chased by all those Gila drones. He is down now, but again, he was doing what you need to do against these Gila drones. He and overheated his micro warp drive and got range on them and made them chase him. And both mollusks now down. The mm -hmm. crow of Mr. Falcon uh, lost his shields as well. Looks like he, I believe, has a tackle on the... Uh, the Larry of Ben Lee, <laughs> and a Heretic for Killer, a whole bunch of numbers, has lost his shields as well, so he's going to start going down here shortly. Uh, we have Sabotage starting to take damage on the Exodus side, So, but really, Pasta Syndicate's uh, picking off support, but Exodus seems to be going for the juggler. They're going right in deep. Yeah, um, that uh, web on Ben Lee is definitely huge. It means that they're going to be able to apply the damage a lot more easily. They won't be able to use that trick of getting the speed on the drones, uh, but it's taking a while for the drones to arrive on target. Uh, he's taking damage now, and it's, the drone swarm has definitely caught up to him, but uh, it was taking a while there. Oh, as and we see. a worm down yeah. on the Exodus side now, so another support ship taken out for Pasta Syndicate. You know, they still have a chance, but, the, but Ben Lee now losing his shields almost entirely. He's about to go into armor here if something doesn't happen soon, and with no scimitar on the field, that's really not going to change. Yeah, it's only only a matter of time now with all those drones atop him in the web. That worm that died was a boundary violation. So uh, there are some unforced errors here from Exodus. Uh, they need to make sure that they avoid more of those because they do have the huge advantage here. Uh, scimitar and Gila down. Uh, you're in a great shape. Um, as long as they can keep their Scimitar up and manage to avoid other boundary violations. <laughs> well, that's always <laughs> yeah. the trick. And beating yourself sometimes is the bigger danger. Mm -hmm. And already a web on the next Gila. A great work by the uh, Exodus tacklers. They're getting the webs on the targets very quickly and allowing that damage to then apply to them. Um, so, oh, Web cleared off. It looks like oh. uh, they're going to be... Uh, and he's picking back up to speed. He's already yep. up over 1,000. Yep. So maybe he's going to get away a little bit here. Yeah, if Pasta City can take down the Crow and Hawk, the two remaining tackle, and the Worm, the three remaining tackle frigates for Exodus, it's going to make these healers' lives a lot easier. That being said, their Steel Castle is once again webbed, and uh, he is taking a ton of damage quickly now as the drones have caught up with him. That Heretic is in a sliver of structure going 3,300 <laughs> meters per second. Whoa, he's like 1% yeah, structure or oh, something. I think it's only a matter of time. He's taking the missile damage, but uh, there, there he goes. goes. But again, every moment you can keep yourself alive is another moment that that DPS is a, isn't right. applied so to the next one. One more volley or two more yeah. volleys or whatever it may be. Meanwhile, Steel Castle is just clinging to a tiny little bit of shields here, but... Uh, Oh, there he goes into yeah. armor now, and I really think Exodus have a firm grip on 
this match now. They, they really are going to have to make some mistakes to lose this, although their Scimitar is now through shields. He's is being back, but he has taken a little bit of armor damage, so maybe these uh, the Slepners have uh, just finally gotten a position to apply some damage. Too little, too late, I think. Yeah, the uh, Slepners weren't actually doing a ton of uh, damage this whole fight. They looked like they were having trouble tracking the small targets. They were trying to pick off frigates, um, and uh, unlike the Hydra team, which was kind of spread out their scimitar or their Slepners a lot more, uh, had the three of them for Alpha, uh, the uh, guys from uh, Pasta just aren't able to apply their damage as consistently. There goes that scimitar, but again, I think Exodus are in the superior position here. Uh, they have the third uh, damage cruiser there for the uh, Pasta Syndicate going down, leaving just the Slepners once this mm -hmm. once this does explode. He is into armor, so it's a matter of a few moments here as armor is now gone. He's into structure, low structure, and about to explode. Meanwhile, Webb on Adriana Malvarin, Valoran's Slepner, so that also spells some danger. You yep. have the, the you have quite a bit of damage still coming from the Exodus side. Continued great work by the frigates for Exodus. You're seeing as the primary dies, there's a web landing on the secondary right away. They're timing it perfectly. They're getting those webs on that's going to prevent them from outrunning the drones. And now that there's the frigs that are causing all the problem for these Slepners, artillery Slepners just aren't going to be able to clear the frigs off. Unless they right. spread apart, which actually is something they haven't done. These Slepners are very close to each other. That's so it's pretty hard to uh, make sure that you keep low transversal I mean, on the frigates. That's, that's a great way mm -hmm. for Slepners, autocannon or artillery to pick off small support. You split apart. They can only really come after one or the other, or even if they split, you know, you have a frigate that'll be at 40, 50 mm -hmm. kilometers at much lower transversal than it would be if it's right on top of you. You get close in a frigate to a Slepner like this and just orbit, and, yep. you know. So they were able to kill off the crow, uh, the heretic there applying a lot of the damage, and the Slepners are pulling apart. So that's going to really help against these frigates. They've got a uh, target painter applied to the next hawk, but it's, it's too little too late. late. Yeah, way they, too late. I mean, the, the Slepners in destruction, Adriana is going to go down, and that will be all she wrote. The heretic goes along with it, so just one Slepner left on the Pasta Syndicate side. It's just a matter of cleanup here, and Exodus will have managed to clear this field entirely. Not without losing some ships, but really that's not going to matter to them. They got through this match, and that's mm -hmm. what's important. Yep. Uh, this is a, a really good showing for Exodus. They were able to bring a mirror match and just outpilot their opponents, especially with those frigs. There was uh, excellent piloting to get the tackles on, uh, while like their damage was applying. If you go back to Squeebles' uh, first rule, uh, make sure your damage is applying, and past his damage was not applying. Well, it looks like the Slipner got a good volume on that Orthrus right there before going down, so you know, a little bit of moral victory for him, but mm -hmm. that was it for the match. Exodus with a uh, solid win over Pasta Syndicate. They will stay in the winner's bracket, and Pasta will drop down to the loser's bracket. Yep, and uh, we will now send you back to the desk uh, for some more analysis. It's only, it's only game. Why you have to be mad? I mean, my heart's beating, my heart's beating, my hands are shaking, my hands are shaking, but I'm still shooting, and I'm still getting the headshots. It's like, boom, headshot, boom, headshot. I'm still getting the headshots. It's like, boom, headshot, boom, headshot, boom, headshot. Boom, headshot. Welcome back to the hosting desk of Alliance Tournament 12. I'm CCP Gargant, joined here by Apothni, Elise Randolph and CCP Rice. That was a, a fairly convincing victory uh, yes. of a first winner's bracket match of the day. I feel, uh, I feel bad that Capku lost. He's one of the most helpful posters in my balance threads, but I'm sure it at least was a little relieving that it was by rapid light missiles from the Orthrus because he's a big fan of those I know, so some solace, I hope. Mm -hmm. but, a good yep. match overall. It's a really interesting match. At the, on the outside, it kind of looked like the setups were very similar, but uh, Pasta went with an arty slept thing, trying to imitate sort of a, a Hydra tactic, trying to, to volley the molasses off. Didn't work quite as much, and uh, Exodus just took a similar core that they flew last time. They had the worms instead for good tackle. They had that Orthrus. Exodus loves the Orthrus, so I love Exodus for that. <laughs> and um, they, did, they did really well. They executed well, apart from the one worm that kind of zonked himself out, but he was just a little bored. I mean, sometimes these things happen. Sometimes yeah, you, you just gotta flirt with the edge of glory. And see you what are an, you're an expert in that. <laughs> yes, I am. I think that's one of those matches where you, these teams have, we, we have these archetypes kind of set. We kind of know what we're seeing commonly through the tournament now. And it really differentiates the super top teams 
from kind of the mid tier or the lower tier teams where the top teams can just pick apart that setup so beautifully. Whereas the middling tiers may be able to do it to someone else, but when you come up someone like Exodus, they know everything about your setup as soon as they see it. They know exactly what they need to do. And if you're not on that same level as them, you're going to be destroyed. Yeah, that's sort of where we are now uh, at the, this stage in the tournament. We're mainly seeing the uh, brilliant teams advance mm. while the good teams may have to take three or four more steps to catch up to them. Yeah. Um, I was thinking during that match, the um, Pasta decided to shoot at the Molasses first, at least for a while. And I was thinking, um, have there been any matches today you guys can remember where someone shot at Friggs to begin with and that like made a really big difference? I feel like there's been several, or at least a couple matches now where someone was wasting time shooting at Friggs and the other team was killing something big. And I think there was a team where somebody brought Inquisitors and the other team tried to shoot at them and it took them forever to kill those Inquisitors yeah. Yeah. because they had poor tracking. I think, I think it was Ishtars with sentries versus them, I'm not 100% sure. I don't think it was bad target calling on Pasta's side. Like, mm. they have the volley. They try and they yeah. get really specialized at killing the Frigs. Yeah. And the Slepnirs really need the, the range. Okay. Um, so they really wanted those Molluses off. And I think, I don't know, maybe if they overloaded a little bit or got a little bit luckier, or if the Mollus pilots right. were flying a little bit worse, maybe it would have helped them out a little bit. Okay. But I think it was just the setup, isn't, the setup that Pasta took isn't really meant to come up against the one that they came up with. Mm. <laughs> But they get another chance. Uh, they're yes. fighting tomorrow in the elimination bracket then. Yep. And uh, maybe they'll take that advice to heart. Hopefully. I don't want to see them go home in a ball of flame. I'm curious. I want to see uh, like Gila's lose to something that's not Gila's. Like this match, like we we're talking about Gila's are open. It's weird for teams to not take them. Mm. And then here with two good teams, they of course both do. And it ends up just being the variations between the two compositions. But Gila's at the core both. And mm. I wonder. I think we've seen Gila's lose, I want to say, to Rattlesnake comps before. Mm -hmm. Dur just during the whole tournament. I mean, you've got the cruise missiles. If you get, you know, TP, you get some good tactical good web, you're going to apply beautifully with mm. Gila. So even with their tank. You know, they're, they're still cruisers, they're still going to die. They don't have a massive, massive amount of EHP. So is that what you guys think the, the week three meta is going to be? You think like the good teams are going to take these helicores and then just surround it with whatever, Slepnirs, yeah. Claymores, Nighthawk, we saw? I think so. I, I think uh, that the winners are still, they have something that they're comfortable with and will yeah. run that yeah. with slight variations rather than... Until it breaks. Yeah, until it breaks, pretty much. Uh, while the losers bracket teams were maybe a little bit out of their element bringing them, I don't know. So will we see Eoses? Like that was a common like week one, week two mm. thing. It was like Eoses and Navy Vexers. We saw a few teams in the elimination bracket feel those things. Do you think the now that we're in the winners bracket, people will feel those, or do you think those are like? I think Eoses are really point heavy. Like mm. if you compare the the Eos to the Gila, they're both very high damage drone boats. They both have great tank. Obviously, Eos a bit better. But the EOS costs, you know, a good couple more points. So with Gila's, you can add in more command ships, you can add in more support. You get to apply that drone DPS. And even the medium drone bonus Gila's will inherently apply DPS better, even if it's a bit lower, because heavy drones are so incredibly slow. But your question is uh, pretty good, because it relates directly into the bands that we have for the next match, Ooh. which is uh, the Tuskers Co. Dot versus Faint Disorder. And the Tuskers banned out the Sleipner and the Ishtar, while Faint Disorder banned out the... Armageddon and the Rattlesnake. So the EOS is open and the Gila is open. Mm -hmm. If you remove the teams that I kind of have to back, because I'm a Waffle, so if you kind of remove, what, remove Waffles and PL, like Tuskers and uh, probably SSC as well, are kind of my two favorite teams. I know a bunch of pilots in them. And I think they're both very competent teams that have a good shot at doing very well in this tournament. So I'm really interested to see what the Tuskers bring. And I think they've got a great matchup in Fame Disorder who are really going to push them to you know, show us what they've got. So did Tuskers ban the Slepnir? Yep. All right. So they kind of want to avoid the, the Gila Slepnir core that we saw, mm. but maybe they want to bring something like a Nighthawk Gila core. Like I could mm -hmm. see that working yeah. for them. Um, mm -hmm. Or maybe they just want to say, you guys probably won't take a claim more. I really hate that setup. Please don't bring it. I'm just going to ban one of the ships, but I need the Gila for something else. They might mm. be running freak heavy and be scared of, you know, the RT Slep kind of meta we've been seeing, you know, people kind of going, Hydra did a really cool thing. Let's do that too. I guess, I guess. I would be very wary of, of flying a, a Hydra setup without practicing it for very much. <laughs> they are high finesse teams, so mm -hmm. just thinking you can pick it up is very dangerous. Mm -hmm. My prediction for this match is the Tuskers. I think they'll take it. 
uh, faint disorder have done nothing to impress me for the last two weekends. Bold statements. I know. I'm a bold man. <laughs> you are. Well, you've got a little bit of ginger, but otherwise you're good. <laughs> Only a ginger can call another ginger ginger, Apothne. Yes, no. well, I'm kind of sat between the two. I, f I feel it's kind of encroaching on me. You're totally not ginger. I'm not even close to ginger. I'm not even ginger adjacent, but it's okay. Who do you pick? Tuskers or Fizz? <laughs> Who do you uh, pick? Um, I'm going to go with Tuskers. Like I said before, I know I, I really like the guys. They've got a great attitude to the game. Tuskers. Yeah, I think I'm going to go Tuskers too. But not because I think Fane Disorder are bad or unimpressive. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, my, my pick is Tuskers as well. I am not impressed indeed. Uh, <laughs> with that, the match is ready, so let's just go straight into the thick of it and see if Faint Disorder can indeed impress me. Target has engaged bait. Jump, jump. Target has been broadcast. Kill the pod. Red versus blue. Shooting people in the face all day. But best friends after. Welcome back, everyone, to this next match of the 12th Alliance Tournament. This is CCB Fozzie, joined once again by Bacchanalian, and we've got the Tuskers versus Fain Disorder. And the guys in the analysis desk were just talking about Healers versus a EOS Vexor Navy Corps, and that's exactly what we have right here. Tuskers decided that uh, Exodus' team looked really cool, made some slight variations to it, and uh, are running something very similar. So it's, it's Claymore, Scimitar, Orthrus, Triple Gila, uh, tri or Triple Heretic, Double Mollus and Crow, and that is Rapid Lights on everything that can fit Rapid Lights on that team, so it will shred frigates. Yeah, and the Fainted Disorder team on the other side has brought Eos, Oneros, Triple Vexor Navy Issue, Blackbird, three Vexors, uh, two Worms, and a Talwar. So th their DPS core is actually pretty flimsy by comparison mm -hmm. to the Tuskers. Uh, and really, I think the Tuskers come in with the advantage. Yeah, I really do like the Tusker setup a lot more. Uh, the Blackbird especially is uh, I'm not sure the best use of the uh, ship in this case, but we'll see how it goes. Both teams did come in at max range from uh, fairly far apart beacons, so there's a bit of time before the drones start getting on top of each other, but we're seeing them starting to move now. So but instantly damps on the Orthrus <laughs> on the Tusker side. The only ship that's damps on the, uh, on the Tusker side. But the first two damps that went down on the Fain Disorder side were on the Blackbird, and one of the Vexors now damps on the other two Vexors, and they actually moved a damp off to the Heretic now. So yeah. uh, Blackbird looks like it's the first one to take some damage. Uh, they got reps on it, but then the worm was just yeah. volleyed. Oh. Very quickly. Worm. That's what those rapid lights will do to it. And uh, very quick uh, E-War win by Tuskers, although it's starting to drop off a bit now. Uh, the uh, Molluses, with their fast locking, did a really great job with that. And they're basically going to neutralize the Blackbird as another worm off the field. Again, great use of these rapid lights to take out the frigates. You know, with damps, that's really an important thing is you got to win the damp war right off the bat, and that's why you see so many frigates fitting the damps. We have the Heretic of the Evil One taking uh, shield damage getting repped back up but uh, shield tank so if he loses those shields he is going to go down blackbird meanwhile in armor but comfortably being repped so robinson and jacks hanging on and yep tower yeah. off the field so uh, tuskers right out in front very quickly here and those rapid mm -hmm. rapid lights like you say are really shredding the support yeah a very commanding start the blackbird is trying to jam the heretic i don't know if he's like all amar jammers or something but anyways he's dead now so that's his pain is uh, over a with very uh, question maybe it was the only thing he could lock with the dance yeah it's very possible um but uh it, this is a great start for tuskers uh, they've managed to bring in a setup that uh, hits well at long range uh, and really taking advantage oh, of that they had to be careful and the yeah. heretic does go down so mm -hmm. the, the heretic vanishes uh, I was just going to say they need to be careful with that not to lose the heretic. But at this point, I think the heretics have done their job. I mean, yeah. there's the, the, at this point, there's that the kind of DPS really is to pick off drones. So Vexor Navy issue, uh, low armor now, uh, webbed, and uh, not getting any reps from anything. I, I guess the Oneros is damped down. Perhaps he's out of range. Yeah. And the Oneros is actually kicked up to 2,600 speed, running to try to get in range to save something. But I think it's going to be way too late. Tuskers are way out in front here. Yeah, uh, 
knocking down the Vexor Navy issue uh, removes a lot of DPS from the field. Like you said at the beginning of the match, the Fain Disorder DPS core is very vulnerable. Now a Vexor taking a ton of damage, uh, it's dropping fast, and it's also not getting reps yet. Uh, they're doing a great job with the Tuskers of knocking down these ships. Uh, still damage being applied to the Heretics. Uh, the Heretics, yeah, are definitely there mainly to kill frigates. They can kill the drones off the Vexor Navy, which is effective, but just killing the Vexor Navy issues themselves is much more effective, and Tuskers and has proven they can do that. A web on Vandiri, who I used to fly with quite a, few, quite a long time ago, he's in Rook Capella. He got free of the web, though somehow the web actually dropped off of him because he's not moving really. Uh, we have the uh, the Vexor of Alex. Alexandra, there we go. He's into low armor and as well as Vendor. So both a Vexor Navy and a Vexor taking some damage. Yeah, Tusker is splitting damage, but it, it's, it's, it's fine at this Why point. Not? I mean, it's probably they're trying to get drones applied to close targets. Uh, they've proven uh, that they can easily knock these it's targets like down. It's like got got himself webbed as well as the Scimitar of Latronicus, but it's I think it's too late. I mean, both these ships are webbed. That, that, that he looks like he is going to die, but... Uh, does it really matter at this point? I mean, the Tuskers have a 30, what, 37, 36 point lead? 37 point lead? Well, now even more, 40, yeah. 43 point lead. And uh, they're just absolutely tearing through this Fane Disorder team. Yeah, it was the Eos that got on top of uh, Cool Foreign's uh, Gila there, and he's the one that's got it tackled and neutered. Uh, so he's going to get it killed, I think, but it, yeah, it's just not enough. The knocking the defense off the field is fine, but they really need to kill that Scimitar if they want to be able to uh, actually take this match back. And it's a very tall order. Go oh, Newt's on that Scimitar, and the Scimitar is strangely not repping that, that Gila that goes down. So Cool Foreign D goes down. Uh, Scimitar is webbed and taking quite a bit of damage, and the, the Evil One also taking a little bit of damage there, who immediately catches reps. So really strange that that other one did not get reps. But Might Vexor be. Navy of Godhab is uh, going to go down next, and I think the Eos looks like he'll be the next primary after him. Yeah, and that Vexor Navi was the only thing tackling the Scimitar, so, uh, and, and nuding it. So with him off the field, hopefully he can rep all of his sense, uh, sure. friends instead of just some of them. Um, and now they're going to decide to take down the Aneros, it looks like, uh, just for fun. Let's actually finish off the ship they was repping the whole time. <laughs> and uh, it's really just a cleanup at this point point for Tuskers. A uh, really, really strong performance from them. And showing, again, like what they were talking about at the desk, uh, these Gila core teams, I think, are going to be very popular as we go forward. They just do a lot of things very well. Yep. And, and uh, we're probably going to see more people banning them. I, I think so. I think it's going to become even more popular ban as we go forward. Uh, looks like that Oneros is absolutely going to melt off the field. Um, I got asked on Twitter what, what would be the uh, Spanish equivalent of uh, Larry, so we're going to call it the Lorenzo. Mm -hmm. So these are Lorenzos now. Um, the Neros is gone. The Eos is webbed down, presumably going to be the next target. Um, I can't see. Is the, the Vexors just kind of farther away? Is that what's going on here? Looks like yeah, the Eos and yeah. the Vexors are separated, so that would make sense there. Target painter on the Eos, because I guess the signature radius is <laughs> not high enough. But uh, really, it always helps a little bit when you're trying to track. Uh, it, it'll definitely actually help a little bit with the Claymore if he gets his speed up a bit. That's fair. Yeah. But uh, at this point, again, it's just uh, taking down the, uh, the target as quickly as you can, get this match out of the way, and move on to their next one. Uh, they're going to be up against uh, Exodus uh, next, and that's going to be a, a tough, tough match. match. You yeah. know, for all the talk, we're, we're talking about the uh, loser's bracket being a really nasty run. The winner's bracket doesn't have many slouches left yeah. either. It's really, uh, this is all around a tough tournament. A lot of really, really good teams over, developed over the years, and all of them turned out for this tournament. So we have some great matches coming up even today. The, the next couple, I'm really excited about the rest of this day. So. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the EOS now Low armor, probably going to be a bleeding structure momentarily. He's going to be off the field. And again, this is just a matter of cleanup. Uh, it's taking a little longer than I would expect with as much damage as Tuskers actually have on the field, but they're yeah. doing their job. So we've been seeing a lot of teams using the Gila's and the Orphuses all with Rapid Lights recently. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think about the choice between uh, Ham uh, Gila's and Rapid Light Gila's? Because we talk a lot about their drones, but they actually do a lot of damage with missiles as well. What do you think the trade-off is between those? Well, I mean, winning the support war is an important thing to do. Uh, you, you can run into uh, frigates that really cause problems. You can get tackled by the frigates. We've seen that. These helos like to run around. You know, they like to just kite and drop their drones. And uh, if you get run down by a frigate and tackled, then you really want the option to be able to blow it off of you. Um, you know, again, E-War frigates have been a huge thing. We've seen molluses in almost every match, it feels like. Uh, you see lots of worms that do a fair bit of damage, actually. Um, so I, I think that's what that is. It's just it's it's fear of support ships. and. Yep. You know, you, you were talking earlier about, you know, primary frigates right off the bat may not be the best choice. And their Vexor is down, by the way, and this one's going to go shortly after it. But um, at the same time, when you don't win that support war, if you don't clear those frigates at some point, it tends to go badly for you. Yes. Yeah, especially when they're frigates like uh, worms or assault frigates that deal a lot of damage. It can just cause you a lot of problems as you go. And also just webbing you down when you're trying to run away from medium right. drones. Right. Or, I mean, you know, getting behind the screen, catching your Logi. Oh, you've seen that a lot, yeah. too. Once a Logi gets webbed, it's really, really bad, bad, mm -hmm. bad news. So uh, if you can clear those frigates off before that ever happens, you can protect your team. And that Vexor, low armor now, still <laughs> slowly dying. Those rapid lights aren't really crushing it or anything. But uh, it will die. Uh, 
Yeah, and of course, like damped. The, He's probably uh, having a bad day. The Tuskers guys are in no real rush to try to take him down faster. They do have now a Gila on top of him, and uh, but they're not sending the drones on him quite yet. It looks like they're probably going to try to do some looting first. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> every little bit of this counts, especially if there's any uh, really valuable drones. I'm seeing some uh, some geckos in there. That's going to be uh, oh, worth picking up, and some augmented hobgoblins oh, as well. Go. Yeah, you definitely want to be grabbing those if you can. Well, we can talk a little bit about what we got matches we got coming up. We have Ronan versus TNT and X. TNT, I believe, lost to Knicks yesterday. Mm -hmm. Okay. So yeah. they're kind of smart and they want a morale victory to come back with uh, and do that. So. Not going to be easy versus Ronan, though. No. Ronan were very strong last AT, and of course, this is a team that has been uh, a tournament powerhouse all the way since uh, AT4. Yep. Now I can remember them going back that far as well. Um, after that, it'll be Camel Empire versus Myth. Uh, since they don't want to be called, you know. <laughs> I don't know, MIF, MIF. And then my alliance, Royal Capel versus Ministry of Inappropriate Footwork, which I'm kind of nervous about. And then we get to see if Pandemic Legion can uh, overcome their troubles earlier in the tournament against Gorgon Empire. Yeah, and we've talked about this, I think, a little bit last weekend, but I'm not sure if we have yet this weekend. This last match between PL and Gorgon Empire um, not only is it kind of exciting because we have the defending champion, but also Gorgon Empire, for anyone that's not familiar with them, they picked up a lot of the core members from the old Dark Side tournament teams. Ah, I didn't realize and, that. And uh, Dark Side, of course, is the team that ended PL's kind of first run of victories by knocking them out of AT9. Uh, and uh, so this is, I mean, obviously, the first, this is the first time that they've met each other since then, so obviously it's going to be a, a match a with a lot, match. Of, yeah, a lot of yeah. historical consequences. Um, and uh, it'll be great to see exactly uh, whether PL can even the score there or uh, whether Gorgon can uh, knock down the defending champions twice, or the members of Darkseid on that team can knock down the defending champions twice. Right, well, I mean, a real question is, is PL going to end its own run? I mean, they seem to be their biggest own enemy right now. The, the teams that they've come up against have some, you know, brought reasonable setups and, and, and flown pretty well against them, but ultimately it's been PL's own mistakes that have really put them against the ropes. So hopefully they can recover from that. I'm sure there's lots of, uh, you know, angry rage going on in comms during those, and maybe they've learned their lesson. Um, looks like that uh, Vexer has given up. He is now sitting still, finally taking some shield damage. So I think they're finally going to finish him off, probably looted all the uh, fancy drums that they want off the field. His armor's gone. He's into structure. They're going to finish him off right with only less than a minute left. Yeah. <laughs> Just keeping us on schedule. <laughs> and there, and he, there goes. he goes. <laughs> so that is the Tuskers through. Uh, Fane Disorder is still around. Remember, this is the uh, undefeated bracket right now, so Fane will not get knocked down to the elimination bracket, and they will continue, but they're going to be up against the wall next match. Yep. And very, very long road in front of them in the loser's bracket. Mm -hmm. So I think with that, we'll send it back over to the guys. Space Chutney's primary. My client just froze. Support took care of that, please. I Everybody can't. else stay on the Vexor of Space Chutney. down. Yep. Space Chutney's primary, followed by Captain Go. Primary target. Okay, Space Chutney is now primary. Okay. Space Chutney's about to go down. Right on. You dead? Space Chutney's primary, guys. Make sure it's on Space Chutney. Loot the field, guys. Loot the field. Welcome back to the set, hosted by me, CCP Gargan, joined by Apothnia, Elise Randolph, and CCP Rise. Wow, that's quite the, quite the little verse to say. Uh, that match was great. Yes. I, I don't have any other words for it. That's Were you what you impressed? guys are for. Yes. Were sorry. you impressed by Fane Disorder? What they brought? <coughs> they brought the Navy Vexor sort of thing, while well, the Tuskers brought the the Healers. Yeah. So, so they showed that the Vexor Navy issue is not as strong as the Gaila. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. one thing that they seem to have shown. Mm -hmm. So. I really like the, the Tuskers team in that, that they had a really a lot of light missiles. Like they had a lot of things that could both kill, you know, frigates and desis, and also drones. Yeah. Like one of the things about light missiles is people are saying, you know, bring lots of smart bombs to defeat these heavy drone setups. Light missiles are really good at killing them too. Possibly not all at the same time, but mm -hmm. you know, say they drop a bunch of heavy rep bots, you can throw them on that without having to get into the middle of the enemy team. Um, you know, you've got you know, Maulis is a super powerful. The heretics themselves have been super powerful. Having that heretic Orthrus and a light missile core can be very, very strong. Yeah, I thought it was interesting what the Tuskers did. They they brought anti-tackle, but not in the anti-tackle that you generally see. Like 
Mm-hmm. Lots of people have worms or frigates of some sort or hawks. Um, they brought anti-tackle in the form of just light drones just murdering all the other light tackle. Uh, or Yeah, that, that's about what I was trying to say. <laughs> light tackle killing things in, instead of taking small ships to do it. They just put it on their, their healers and, of course, they brought the Orthrus, which is becoming really popular among like these quality teams. Mm. Uh, I'm really happy to see this because the Orthrus is one of my favorite ships. It's really interesting how it seems to be really popular to just have one. Or at yeah. least, I mean, Exodus obviously likes that a lot, and now we see it again. I suppose that's probably most of it. But having kind of one anti-support mid-sized ship rather than having a wing of them as, like, your primary mm-hmm. DPS. I mean, that's that's actually something we haven't seen a whole lot of generally over the last couple years in the tournament. Usually, um, anti-support is handled by other small ships. It's yeah. handled by your own frigates. Um, and then there's, there's some mid-sized ships that are good at dealing with support, like um, like Slipners or something actually can be fine at it, but it's... It's, it's cool to see just that one cruiser there that's really good at that job. Yeah, it is really good. And they also had like uh, the heretics alongside with it yeah. to, uh, to kill the light things. And it seemed as though, I'm not 100% sure, I couldn't see on that thing, but it seemed as though the healers had uh, light missiles as well uh, right. to take care of. Right, right, right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like if, you know, in this setup, why have uh, another rapid light Orthrus rather than having uh, some other drone ship. Having, yeah, exactly. Uh, having so, so they did the, the heretics and stuff so they could max out their healers and max out their like DPS points to, yeah. uh, to totally take Fane Disorder by surprise. Fane Disorder, they took the Navy Vexor, which we saw a lot in week one and week two. Um, but this is, I think, one of the few times we've seen it this week. This is the first time we saw it in the winner's bracket this week. Mm. Uh, do you think that ship is, is kind of dead or, or lost its usefulness? Or what? I think I think it looks better than it is. <laughs> like like you know, it's it's a navy hull. It gets a bit of extra EHP. You know, it, it's got a full 125 bandwidth. So, and the know, drones and, go really fast. Yeah, That's the, the one drones thing are really about fast. It. You know, full flight of heavies, full of sentries. If you want to kind of old, the old Ishtar days, like in theory, it's really good. But what we're seeing is that it's kind of an easy primary. It gets a little bit more EHP than a regular Vexor, but not much. It's kind of got its uh, um, slots mixed between the mids and the lows, so you can't do an insane armor tank, you can't do an insane shield tank. Mm. It doesn't have a resist bonus, so they, they, they die quite well. Yeah, yeah so, which definitely is bad news. I, yeah, it seems like the, the cores that are consistently winning are very resilient, more like Helos resist bonuses, and mm. at least as many slots as the Vexor and Vexor Navy issue versions yeah. have. So the cool thing about the, um, the Tuskers team that we saw real quick is they banned the Slepnir, um, and the, the two Slepnir or three Gila core is actually really popular. But instead, they took a what did they take? They took an Orthrus a, mm. and a, a Claymore for the link. Right. So the Claymore mm. had the missiles and also mm-hmm. um, the Orthrus. Yeah. So it's pretty pretty interesting take on it. Just these small tweaks to these common teams. Do you think like from here on out? Do you think and tomorrow even? Do you think we'll see more of this like Gila two command ship or command ship and Kite Cruiser core? Like, is that going to be, like, the new hotness? I mean, or? it looks very appealing, at least. Yeah. I, think, I think it will be for now, but I also think if it gets too um, popular, like, mm-hmm. if, it, if it's so hot that, that it's, like, every match is healers, I think yeah. good teams will just start banning them because... Um, and this is an archetype that existed last year, too, so, like, yeah. the teams mm-hmm. that practiced against it, I you at least all hope. the ar- archetypes we have, it's the one with the biggest targets on its back. It's the one that's doing the best. It's the one where, the, realistically, we're seeing the most at the moment. So I think all yeah. the theory crafters, everyone is going, right, we have this setup that's really good, but we need to anticipate beating it, and we need to right. be able to beat it. Right, the two, the two things that kind of happen going forward are either people start beating it because it's too popular, or they start banning it to just yep. force people to do something else so which, that they're not as comfortable. Which sort of feeds into the next bands for the next match, which, which will be the Ronin versus Tactical Narcotics team. Hmm. Uh, the Ronin band, the Ishtar and the Dominics, hmm. and uh, TNT band, the Cerberus and the Orthrus. Oh, that's those interesting. Are, I would not those have guessed those bands. No. And <laughs> Cerberus is first today, at least. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Dominus is actually pretty weird as well. It yeah. seems like Dominus are not... It's like they've been available for plenty of teams and nobody's yeah. bringing them. They're a little too expensive, I think, to, to be worth it at this point. So that's a little strange as well. Maybe they found a way. I mean, they it, seem, it seems like they obviously really don't want sentries. Mm. Um, yeah. If possible. Because both those ships have tracking bonus mm. to sentries. But maybe, maybe that implies kind of slow moving cruisers almost like you that's the only thing that kind of really sentries really really scare these days you know that high volley damage that mm-hmm. you need kind of help tracking against so I yeah mean, 
I mean, with those bands, I'd almost anticipate Ronin bring like a battleship heavy team that's got smart bombs. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't deal with the sentries very well, but it deals with the very mobile uh -huh. drones. Uh -huh. And again, the Hela slips through. So yeah, yeah. So. I do like smart bombs though. Yeah, they are yes. pretty. Uh, <laughs> who, who doesn't want to fight Orthruses and Cerberuses though? Yeah. Yes. That's very uh, interesting. That's a very specific. Maybe uh, they target. really want to win the support war. Maybe yeah. they really want. Maybe they have some assault frigates, or I don't know. There's something they really want to protect that's small. But I think then you'd ban out like heretics instead of the Serb. Like the Serb costs so much points for for what it does. Yeah, that's a pretty strange one. Maybe, maybe they have Frig Logi. Yeah, that could be it. That could that would, I guess could make sense. Maybe they're just doing this so that we can talk about it. Maybe they're yeah. like super well, polite. Yeah. One of the things <laughs> we have nothing else to talk is, about. Um, a, a comp with a lot of AFs like we saw, you know, last year. Yeah. And the big ships died, and we thought they were in trouble, mm -hmm. but their strong frigate wing really came through for them and you know really turned around the match and gave them a lot more hope so maybe yeah. it's like something like that that they're worried of happening could be we want to know yet the match isn't ready but oh i mean and here i was trying to like feed into it yeah. that's my that's my job like, let's be done so we talked about ronin being like a really story team they're very um, history they team. went very far last year they're historically always going far um they actually have the they won the Tribal Tempest or something. I think that's the Alliance Tournament 4 prize they got. They got second place or something. Yeah. Um, but TNT sort of kind of bumbled their way into the winner's bracket, but they're winning. Like, you can't really say, oh, they just got lucky three yeah. times in a row. Like, Do you remember specifics from their last matches? Because I don't. Uh, they had, like, these weird undermanned teams, and it seems like they're about to lose, but then they kind of... Huh. The other team doesn't quite shoot themselves in the foot, but they kind of do. But TNT, like, hold on and make good decisions throughout. Like, that's the thing that I was really surprised by uh, this TNT team because they're not generally a team that you see in the tournament going very far. But uh, this year, they, they're they doing pretty good. Yeah. Like, I think Ronin should be on upset alert here. I mean, you look at it and say, oh, TNT, they've never done anything good. Mm. Uh, Ronin will just coast in here. But I think I would be kind of afraid if I was the Ronin right now. Mm. TNT would make me take probably a better team than I would normally field in this position. I think anyone in the winner's bracket this far, really, you have to you know, pay attention to, because they've already won two matches, right? Yeah. So they have already put on two solid performances, or at least one if they got lucky set up. So uh, to stop the um, amount of words that are not PG-13 stream capable, I will uh, stop you right there. And we have uh, the matches ready before I start filtering out, or filter, so acting as a, the voice is messing with my head. We're going to the come me Wow. Commentator booth. That last malediction is at about half armor, and uh, this match will be over before too long, so he's got a raptor right on his tail. Right, the malediction dying. Which side, which side? I just grabbed 250 million. Sorry, I think I got both. Again, everyone, welcome back to this next match in AT12. Uh, this is the Ronin versus TNT, and I'm CCB Fozzy, joined by Bakken Alien. We have two of these kind of uh, arc core archetypes we've seen repeated a couple of times coming up against each other. The Ronin bringing Gila's or Lorenzo's, with Slepnir's and Scimitar <laughs> and uh, Damp support, while TNT br is bringing double Armageddon, double Eos, Aneros, and then all the frig killers you could ever hope for, with uh, Heretics, Talwars, and Kestrels. Uh, so they obviously want to make sure frigs die. Yeah, lucky for them, there are frigates to kill. We have a Harpy, two Mollus, Crow, and two Merlins on the Ronin side that I have a feeling will not last very long in this match. 
Uh, they are really not threatened. They got rid of that Cerberus and Orthrus that scared them. I guess we looked up some of the previous matches, and the uh, the uh, Tactical Narcotics team had used an Orthrus setup. Was that uh, right? The Ronin had. The Ronin's last setup was uh, Orthrus's and Cerberus. Got so, it. so that kind of makes sense with the bands, then, if they're trying yeah. to block out that particular setup. Um, the teams did uh, come in at quite a bit of range from each other. Ronin at max range, and then TNT bringing their Armageddon's and Eos's in close and everything else further back. And there's bouncers and infiltrators and geckos dropped mm. from the drone ships. We haven't seen a whole heck of a lot of sentry drones, so this mm -hmm. is interesting. But I mean, at this point, that range, well, there goes Mollus. Look at that. It is low structure and yeah. just one go. I mean, just everything vaporized off of that. There's a lot of light missiles heading towards it. Interestingly, him. it didn't even have the target painter on it. Target painter mm -hmm. went on something else, and there come its shields. The scimitar finally got a rep on it. I guess that is the drawback of target painting, is the scimitar gets to lock faster, too. Yep. Heretic and Talwar both uh, losing shields there uh, on the other side. Uh, but they are armor tank with that Oneros on the field, and the Talwar and Heretic both receiving remote reps. So, really, right now, a little bit of a stalemate. Nothing. Uh, Nothing definitive happening on either side. There is a the control bar for tactical narcotics team is is huge, but, but they're not, not applying full. it. Yeah, I think it's because the molluses for the Ronin were able to apply the damps early on. So not only did they save themselves, as I say, I say that as one of them dies, uh, they delayed their death by yep. uh, preventing some of the heretics and towers and kestrels from locking. But uh, they also prevented some of the counter damage. Uh, that being said, now with one of them off the field, that's going to make it a lot easier for TNT to lock. Well, I think a lot of that's probably going to be from the Armageddon's newts mm -hmm. as well, but uh, and they're just not in range. Yeah. I mean, the, a smart team's going to avoid those newts. You do not want anything to do with those Armageddon newts, on, like, unless you're a bunch of frigates on the team we saw earlier who decided to just motor in and die. Scimitar just lost its shields from their own inside, though, and that's uh, that's serious trouble. He just got hit pretty hard. The Oneros yep. on TNT is starting to rep, and here we go. The control bar for Tactical Narcotics team just jumped. Because that's the newts on a Slepnir. The yep. Geddens got on top of one of the Slepnirs, or within range at least, and uh, applied all of their newts to him. And uh, that means he's going to be out of cap fast, and without hardeners, he could drop very quickly. And he's really not moving anywhere. Shut off that MWD of his. Scimitar into armor. That's a problem for him. The Oneros, uh, meanwhile, holding on. Look, I guess he's an ASB Oneros, because yep. he's pulling back quite a bit of shields. Scimitar for Ronan now into very low armor. This Aneros is still is now tackled, quite a though. match. This is going to be really close. I think the Scimitar and Oneros are going to go down really, really close to one another. The Slipner is starting to take damage of Garga's uh, V for the Ronan, the team there. Both logistics in structure. Yep. There goes there the Oneros the first. Aneros, and the Scimitar, I'm sure, is going to fall. He's still painted. He's still taking damage from these sentries and these light missiles. And uh, it's just going to be a matter of time for him. Um, but meanwhile, a bunch of damage is applied to the Slipner. The Slipner just erased. I mean, his shields yep. are gone. His ASP is pulsing. But the DPS is just way too much. He's gonna. He's lost his hardeners here, so he's 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 boosting unhardened shields. He's in armor. Gets another boost yeah. off. Eos, meanwhile, in, in armor. Haka, Haka wow. That Eos is dropping pretty quickly, though. I mean, every boost that Gargaris gets is another boost that he stays alive and keeps applying damage to the Eos. But I think there he goes. Mm -hmm. He is off the field. That is a, a fair bit of DPS gone from the Ronin team, and uh, the Ronin team look like they're a little bit in trouble now. The second Slipner is also webbed down, which is not where Slipner wants to be. No, uh, taking, not at all. Taking not damage. Yet, though. Although he's within range to be neutered, so I'm sure it's only a matter of time before they get the nudes applied to him. Uh, yeah, he's already are. taken a ton of damage. Uh, that Eos is holding on pretty well now. He and is. Uh, yeah, with these Slepners down, that's going to leave the three Lorenzos almost by themselves. Yeah, I mean, really, the heretics are going to still do a fair bit of damage, even if they're not attacking, uh, you know, you know, something small. But uh, it could just be that they're picking off drones. I haven't looked to see that. Uh, the harpy uh, dropping there, that's another yep. one of those targets. It's a great uh, target for those light missiles. And the Mollus yeah. is in pretty low armor mm -hmm. as well. Slepner's still pulling back ASB boosts, but it's like a little less every time. That Eos now, Hakawao, is starting to drop. He's he's low armor, and pulling back Talwar for uh, Nil Desperandum mm -hmm. is, is very low. Here he goes. He was a sliver structure off the field. So this is a bit of a match. Back and forth, a lot of stuff exploding. TNT definitely have an advantage now, especially with that Slepner down. TNT have a huge advantage, I Ooh, think. Yeah. yeah. Um, the Eos is just holding on so well, and now that there's one less, that Slepner was on top of him and applying most of the damage to him, and now that that one's off the field, he actually, uh, he's got a swarm of Valkyries from the uh, healers around him too, but uh, these healers are probably going to drop once they get tackled. Too. Can you see what those uh, Heretics and Towers are shooting? What are, they, mm -hmm. what are they focused on right now? Because I'm going to see if they're, maybe they're trying to pick off drones, or are they working on this Mollus Crow on the Merlin? Right now they're on the cast, they're on uh, sorry a Merlin. Yep. 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 Okay. So they're they're working on the frigs. They're trying to clear those off the field. And once they get into that position, there's nothing to stop them from taking out these helas or from taking out the drones. I mean, right. there's a lot of things that these uh, utility ships can do with the light missiles as the fight goes further on. And but just another Talwar lost there. So we have two heretics in armor for technical narcotics. And Eos is still holding on. That's really Eos is surviving for an incredibly long time. Uh, he still has uh, drones on him, but not a lot at this point. Uh, there's, uh, I think, looks like, well, yeah, 
two and a half heal is worth of drones <laughs> on him. Uh, and uh, another drone coming soon. He's going to go down, but him surviving that long has meant that he's traded for a slap near a bunch of frigates and like a third of a healer. Yeah, there was a point where at which, you know, he looked like he was going to go down before even that first slap near, and he just damage stopped on him. Uh, Heretic uh, for Tactical Narcotics team is going to go down. I don't think it's going to matter a whole lot. We have a Lorenzo for a name I'm not even going to try to pronounce. About to go into armor. Uh, really, at this point, I think TNT just have to execute and clean up. That Their EOS mm -hmm. just got stripped of its shield, so we can see what the next primary is going to be. But, I mean, I guess if somehow Ronan clear that EOS off the field, they have a shot to get back in this, but it's a, it's a long shot. It is a very long shot. The Armageddon still do a lot of damage. They have the ability to project range with sentries. The Heretics and Talwars and Kestrel I can project range very well as well, and that Gila is dropping pretty yeah, quickly. Yeah, he will go yeah. down, yeah. So, uh, two frigates still alive yeah. on their own inside. I think for most people, uh, this is a pretty big upset. Uh, TNT was not really expected to mm -hmm. uh, come out over Ronin, who were a real tournament heavyweight. And uh, this obviously is going to, even if they lose here, this isn't the end of the line for Ronin in this tournament. Uh, but uh, TNT managing to, uh, I think, uh, surprise a lot of people and really uh, prove uh, their naysayers wrong. Yeah, I w I'm, I'm surprised by this for sure. I'd selected Ronin on my little uh, bracket here of yep. fail because I'm really bad today. <laughs> but uh, Maul is taking some damage. He might go down as well. The EOS is pulling back some armor, hanging in there. But yeah, TNT have a, have a pretty solid grasp on this match. Their control bar is, uh, I think, well, partly what won them the match. They really did execute, though. Their anti-frigate uh, strategy was not exactly as effective as they'd like, but they did well enough, I guess. I mean, Well, it got them what they needed, because remember, they lost the initial damp war. So yeah, well. they actually lost the first damp war, but then they managed to get a kill on Amalus, and that's what started to swing that control bar, uh, well, the non-newt parts of the control bar up a lot. Right. Of course, those newts would have applied once they got within range no matter what. But uh, being able to kill off Mollusses and uh, Harpies and Merlins is always very powerful. Yeah. And we're seeing really the, the Heretic and Talwar wing of this fleet acting in almost complete independence from the larger ships. Sure. So they're off doing their own thing. They're just killing the frigs. And they probably have a separate FC. There's probably someone in charge of organizing Generally, they're, yeah. what they're doing. Um, and uh, that's something we see a lot of good teams do, where they split up the uh, whole team into different groups that are w working independently, but still towards the same uh, Yeah, typically goal. you can have like yeah. an E-War FC, you'll have the actual damage FC, and then you've got the support work, you know, the guys, the, yep. the frigate pilots or, or what have you. Uh, we have that Mollus clinging to structure, buzzing around at 3,800 meters a second. He's going awfully fast. Uh, Heretic of Shaz uh, just picked up speed again. He's running away from some of his damage, but he's in low structure. The Eos of Lord Carvajal. Yeah, yeah, he I is. Get that one. Uh, he's, 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 he's still he's holding, holding on. on. <laughs> Those Eoses are actually surprisingly tough. I, I'm really Delente impressed with the way they're doing it. Yeah. Uh, lasted him a long time. He, I think he is going to go down. He does still have uh, some drones on him from a heal. Actually, though, the last drone, I think, may have just died that was on him. Uh, so it's possible he He's just not taking any damage, and we might see him uh, hold on for the rest of the match. That heretic goes uh, <laughs> slowly but surely getting whittled down little by little. That Mollus now from Morgul is uh, clinging to desperately clinging to life, and he, he is gone. Yeah. So the uh, heretic of Shaz, I think, is going to go down shortly after. Actually, the Tauar and Lidanio is, I mean, Ronan are still trying. They have not yep. thrown in the towel here, but uh, there's not much hope left for them. I, I really don't see a way back, so... Uh, I guess Tactile Narcotics team, after losing a Nyx, got uh, a little fire lit under the rear ends and came out to avenge themselves somebody how on somebody. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this is a very convincing victory, too. I mean, they, they came up against what we had just been talking about uh, as the uh, kind of setup of the moment. This is the this, this uh, command ship and Gila setup is something that we're seeing a lot of good teams use. It's sort of the, uh, the most talked about uh, comp out there. And TNT comes in with uh, lots of newts, lots of anti-frigate, yep. and uh, manages to... Oh, very convincingly it defeat it, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's interesting to see the two Armageddons. We were talking about this earlier at the desk in between matches, that two Armageddons isn't a lot of points to invest. It's, it really is. The ship's not like, overwhelming DPS. It does reasonable damage, but uh, it's just such an awful lot of points to put into two ships mm -hmm. and, and questioning whether that's effective, but it obviously was in this case. Even against Slepners, which, uh, you know, as people, most people probably know, is auto cannons don't require capacitor to fire, or no to artillery, so, so any guns that are put on a Slepner are still going to fire. You're still going to do the damage, but what you do shut off is the micro warp drive and the hardeners, so you make it a, yep. a softer target. And crucially, the links. So even before you awesome. kill it, you're actually reducing the effectiveness of the entire rest of the team yep. as well. Uh, and uh, as that next healer dropping off the field, it's just going to be a crow left for the Ronin. And uh, yeah, this is, I think, a very a very convincing victory for uh, for TNT. Uh, the uh, Eos of uh, Lord Carvajal there holding on in structure, and so is the Heretic of Shaz there. And uh, they just now have one target left, which uh, the heretic is going to probably try to 
pick off with his uh, light missiles. Yeah, Although he only gonna, has 25 seconds to do he's so. He's going to boundary violator. He's yeah. just going to run around in circles, it looks like. And mm -hmm. Save the crow for the loser's bracket where they are headed and will uh, they have a match tomorrow then, huh? Yes, yes. yes. Okay. Uh, so. They're going to be uh, into the loser's bracket where they have to face many more matches to make it to the finals than if they kind of advance further to the winner's bracket. That's, of course, one of the big penalties for getting knocked in the loser's bracket is it means you have to fight more matches. Awful which lot is, more. Which means uh, more money you have to spend on your ships. It means you have to give away more of your secret setups uh, and give more time for people to kind of feel out mm -hmm. what and type of team you are. More pilot fatigue. Mm -hmm. so. Especially on those final days. Well, congratulations to Ronan, or sorry, to Tackle and the Narcotics <laughs> team who knocked Ronan down into the loser's bracket. Yeah, we'll move on in the winner's bracket and have a much easier road from here. Uh, with that, I guess we'll toss it back over to the guys in the other room. And, uh, yeah. Welcome back to the other room. Uh, I think that with this victory, TNT proves that they haven't been stumbling yeah, around no, this in the was, winner's bracket. This was definitely a good showing by them that uh, I predicted, actually. We have some local scoop, uh, and I actually mean from local in-game, that uh, the Ronin team claims that their uh, logistics pilot disconnected, which is terribly unfortunate, but uh, there's little we can do about that. Uh, we haven't uh, confirmed it yet, but if that's the case, Again, that's very yeah, unfortunate. I mean, even if the Logi did disconnect, I think it would have died anyways. I mean, Ronan actually won the Logi trade. They killed the Onerios <laughs> and, um, <laughs> uh, before their own scimitar died. And at the same time, they actually had their Slepnirs nudied by the Gedans. And later on in the match, we saw the Gedans pilot somehow out of their minds and get newts and tackle on the Healers that were going... Yeah. Three times faster than them, I'd say. Yeah, yeah. In the middle of the match, you said that it seemed like they still had a chance with the Helis. Ronan did, even after they'd lost their Slipners and their Lodgy. And my first reaction was like, nope, like it, it's over. And then we started looking, and it seemed like, actually, there's really no reason that the Helis should die. They're so much faster than the, the only thing left was the Eos and the two Geddens, and they should have been fairly safe just running away. But somehow one got caught by neutralizers on one of the Geddens, and then, of course, he dies. But... Mm -hmm. And the second one as well, they just kind of seem to be skirting around, trying to keep range well, but they managed to get themselves neat tackled by the Geddens, and you know, that's it, no MWD, no kite. So yeah. do we think that the TNT team, like the Geddon EOS core, is the counter to the Slepnir Helahor, or whoops, um, core, or not? <laughs> I think when piloted well, um, I think I think the Gilas will have a really tough time killing the Geddens when they've got smart yeah. bombs in the hand. Yeah, so they did have smart bombs actually, which is pretty neat. Um, I think that's sort of an adapted that or adaption that they did because they saw all the sentry drone boats were kind of banned out. They threw a bunch of smart bombs on their uh, Geddens. Didn't really help too much against the Gila drones. We were talking but, about the yeah the uh, smart bombs. Definitely have a place. They're good against uh, certain things, like really good against Vexers and Navy Vexers yeah. and um, some other ships, but they're actually really bad against the Hela Jones. Hela Jones are incredibly tough and hard to kill, so it takes like a billion cycles to do it, and then yeah. they actually have uh, a lot of them as well, so they just send out a new flight. There probably is ways to counter Hela Jones if you want to, but the smart bombs are probably not the best way to do it. But still, a really well thought out uh, team by TNT. Mm -hmm. Like, it yeah. doesn't look flashy i don't think anyone's gonna like copy their team and, and run it again but it's well thought out well executed and mm -hmm. they win again mm -hmm. they uh put a large red x in, on all of our papers and we're pretty happy about it yeah mm -hmm. except for mine <laughs> <laughs> damn tnt are one of those teams that have definitely kind of come almost out of nowhere i'm really impressed with. So i think each year we get kind of one or two amazing miracle run stories and i think mm -hmm. tnt are looking to be 
our kind of big new team onto the AT scene this year. Yeah, gonna... you, you actually are right in that. Like in previous years, we've seen like RVB do really well, come out of nowhere. Agony is one of those teams that came out of nowhere and kind of have proven themselves. Uh, TNT, I guess they're here for now. They're staying in the winner's bracket, sending Ronin down to the elimination bracket. They're the new team to be annoyed by the Cinderella stamp. Indeed. I think so. It's also nice, a lot of time those stories, like, I, you know, I still think they might just lose because that, that's how it works, I guess, with these teams a lot of time. But it's, it's funny how a lot of time as teams, like, make their way from being new to being, like, kind of established, it seems like they're bumbling. Like, you know, it kind of seems like they're, they don't totally know what's, what they're doing or that their execution isn't perfect or something, but then they sort of manage to get there anyway. It's, I don't know. I yeah. feel like that's common with teams that, that and, do this. And sometimes Cinderella just catches on fire. Uh, the next match, however, is uh, going to be a good one because we have the Camel Empire versus MIF. Mm -hmm. uh, the Camel Empire, of course, consisting of the, of the pilots who flew as the thingy team in the mm -hmm. Neo 2, mm -hmm. uh, New Eden Open 2. And they uh, got second place there and they are not to be trifled with, as in they're not to be underestimated, should mm -hmm. we say. Uh, and the bands for these, this match are a little curious. So the Camel Empire have banned out the Varker and the Golem with MIF banning out the Heretic and the Rattlesnake. <laughs> All right, that actually, that was actually kind of makes sense. What I, when I see those bands, I would expect that the Camel Empire is going to bring a lot of damps, a lot of huge damps mm -hmm. uh, in the form of Celestises or Mollus, mm -hmm. or maybe even like damp armor Merlins or something crazy like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, MIF, I don't know. Well, the, the Rattleship's a great ship to, to ban out, like it's a strong ship. But again, Gila slides through, so yeah, kind of dangerous. The Gailas are usually the core of any team, so... Yeah, especially in the last couple of matches. And Camel Empire, a lot of their members came from Exodus last year, um, and they actually flew that very setup last year, the, the two Claymore, three Gila setup, so... Mm. I think coming into this tournament, everyone regarded the Camel Empire after that great showing um, as kind of the new hope to kind of kill, I suppose, going continuing the Star, the Star Wars analogy, the kind of the Darth Vader of... of um, Hydra and the Emperor of Pandemic Legion, like they're the guys everyone's thinking these are the guys that have a really g legitimate shot of making it not a PL Hydra final. Mm -hmm. I read some things that like they're like super legit. I read mm. that they're like the number one team. I believe one of the ex commentators has very strong views on this. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So um, let's look at you accusing me. <laughs> <laughs> Me? Uh, um, I don't know. No. I, don't know I think, I think Camel Different Empire will probably just run over MIF in this one. I don't want to take anything away from MIF. Mm. They're in the, the winner's bracket, so they've done something right. But Definitely. I think the Camel Empire is just going to just crush them. There's also, with the ban system, there's the other fact to consider that the Varger Golem ban might actually be a bait. Could be. That, that they're, they're sort of uh, posturing to say, oh, we're bringing a lot of ECM. And if the other team like reads it and mm. believes it, what then? Yeah, you can do a lot of mind games with banning. Like, uh, I've had like a terrible time. I was captain of like the PL Neo team. And I was like, oh, I'm gonna play some great mind games with these bands. But uh, the other team were just like, okay, well, we didn't want those ships anyway. I'm not reading into anything you're saying. Mm -hmm. We don't have enough time to actually adapt to that. So you can right. really shoot yourself in the foot if you try and play, mm -hmm. if you get too, too creative, I, I guess is the way to call it. Hmm. We're saying MIF, the underdogs here, but I think this is kind of a really cool opportunity for them. They've got a, a awesome shot at coming at one of the teams. As we said before, everyone considers the best. If they take these teams down, MIF is suddenly massively on the map for everyone. And even if they do lose, which you kind of expect they will, they've still got the lower bracket, you know, they've still got that cushion to fall upon. Even if they yeah. lose again, they can do a good showing, they can learn a lot from the map. So like, I think MIF should still be going to this with a really positive attitude. Yeah, I agree. Definitely. Is it true that Thingy was uh, like uh, practice partners or worked, worked really closely with Hydra? Uh, yeah. Okay. I was just curious. They sort of spar sometimes. Okay. Uh, they don't like share all their setups and stuff. Yeah, yeah. But they are very familiar with one another. Okay. At least their early round setups. I thought uh, even though the, the ex-commentator speech you, you're uh, sort of referring to have, you know, had kind of a lot of stuff going on. One thing that was really interesting that came up through that was the idea of uh, teams getting good through association with good teams. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, I was wondering kind of your, your opinions about that since you've been part of PL. Like, do you see teams that like spin off from from practicing with you or from being in any way associated? I don't know, maybe uh, you guys don't need to rely on anyone else because well, you're bigger. Well, like, people are super paranoid, right? And we don't like sharing anything at all. Like, okay. we restrict every, every little bit of information uh, because our sort of best tactic is just to take really good setups. 
maybe they're not flown like perfectly. We're not like accused of being the best pilots ever, but we can take <laughs> some really, really creative setups. And um, so that's how PL wins tournaments. So, or through setups. so we don't want right. to give anything away. So you're more than more than teaching people how to execute. You you're just like protecting. Yeah, like exactly. good information. Yeah. So I mean. Waffles are a team that Peel is associated with a lot on TQ, but during testing, like everything's cut yeah. off. We use separate forms, separate everything, mm -hmm. and we never even spar with Waffles. No, I mean there is also a, a bad reputation from previous tournaments to uh, share tournament information too. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I mean, I don't even mean like within one tournament per se. More no. that, more that, like you know, the kind of environment around good teams. How how likely is that to create some? you know, new team after that one divides or after, uh, like, they pass off information to some team, like, between years or something yeah, like Yeah, well, that. a lot of it has, has to do... Oh, go. Well, Waffles have been practicing with some really strong teams this year. Like, we were practicing with SSC for a while. And at the beginning, they, they kind of had a bit of the advantage in practice. But by going against a team that is very, very strong, it really gave us the opportunity that they would just destroy all our setups that just weren't right where they needed to be. Mm -hmm. So I think that having those strong practice partners, yeah. even if you don't copy anything they do, I think that they really show you what is good and what is bad, which is so important. So the match is ready. Uh, what are your predictions for it? Um, camel. Yeah, I think Camel's gonna take this, and they're gonna have like a really damp team, really strong damp team. A wet team, if you would say. Yeah. Uh, their their ad that they uh, the the ad that they submitted for this weekend. Wow, English is really hard. Uh, really convinced me. So <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm going with Camel as well. Welcome back, everyone, to this next match of the 12th Alliance Tournament. This is CCP Fozzie, joined once again by Bacchanalian. And we have one of our most anticipated matches of the day, because it's Camel Empire, who a lot of people are expecting to be extreme contenders here, versus MIF. And Camel Empire has brought an almost exact copy of the Hydra setup from the first two weekends, uh, which isn't too surprising. Uh, as Elise said, when you ban out the Vargren Gold, it probably means lots of damps, and this team has about as many damps as you can fit. It's a triple Slepnir. They are artillery fit, with Scimitar, Kitsune, Double Slepnir, this triple fly catcher, double mollus. Why don't you tell us a bit about the MIF team? Max? Well, the MIF team has come with, as you might expect, a triple Lorenzo team. Uh, two Slepnares, which I believe you said are auto cannon fit, scimitar, mm -hmm. saber, three worms, which is actually an awful lot of DPS from some frigates, and a, and a thrasher, which is kind of arbitrary. Yep. I guess you used to a couple points there, but uh, I, MIF does come in one point uh, up because uh, Camel Empire, I guess, brought a 99-point team. But I don't think it's going to matter a whole heck of a lot. I think those Slepners are going to light things up. Yeah, so we're about to see. The match has now begun. Uh, MIF, of course, has a much larger attack bar with other DPS, but Camel Empire's control bar is huge, and MIF's is tiny. And we see that control applied right away as all the damps hit. And uh, Camel Empire trying to alpha some sabers. They actually uh, didn't successfully alpha that saber in the first hit, but uh, we'll see if they can really, uh, pick uh, it up before really the Really good job by that Scimitar to lock up the saber right away. There were reps on at the moment he took his first volley, but it looks like the Damps have finally uh, broken his lock as he is no longer repping that saber, and the saber is in low armor. Uh, Celestis for Nier Gun is getting repped. Okay. Yep. I guess he's uh, taking th a there bit was of a web now. on him, okay. so he was taking a bit of damage for <laughs> it was a moment. Just a there. preemptive rep. Yeah. Um, but the web it cleared off pretty quickly. It looks like he got, managed to get out of range of the worm that was tackling him. Uh, and of course, that saber is taking damage, but this is uh, very different than what we've been seeing from when Hydra flew this setup. Uh, ships were dying much more quickly there. Here, MIF has been able to keep them alive. And this is actually, I think, a pretty good setup to bring against this kind of already Slepnir team, because you're very mobile. It's very easy to get transversal up. It's very easy to get on top of these Slepnirs and start causing them big problems. Yeah, I'm curious to see how this. 
uh, this Larry or Lorenzo of mm -hmm. Farag uh, goes. He is in fairly low shields now. It looks like the Slipners have changed damage to him, but he's not getting any reps yet. Scimitar may not be able to lock him, but uh, he's not going down as fast as you might expect. Uh, Kitsune for Zabos uh, taking a little bit of damage as well, but the, the Lorenzo is into armor now, and that's going to be a big, big loss for him, I have. Yep, and he's not getting reps right now. So, I mean, uh, the... <laughs> Damps on the Scimitar have completely blocked out any reps on him, and there he is he down. That being said, one Mollus off the field uh, from uh, Cam Empire, and that is a boundary vi violation. Lord Relos has flown out of the arena in his Mollus, and that might start re relieving a bit of the damp pressure off of MIF. Yeah, I mean, that, that's a bit of a throw from Lord Carlos, given the Cam Empire had not lost a ship yet, and that was the <laughs> argument for them being the top team in the tournament. Uh, that is no longer the case. They have thrown a ship out. Uh, so we have a, a, a Saber and a Gila down on the MIF side, Mollus down on the Cam Empire side, and looks like damage coming across on the Worm of Nipik now. Draylar in his Scimitar for uh, the thingy, uh, Cam Empire team, oh, taking a take good amount of damage. And Kitsune, so Kitsune just got volleyed into armor, it looks mm -hmm. like, and he is off the yep. field, so that's one less Ewar ship on the Cam Empire side. Control bar, though, is still huge, and it's yep. still completely getting used. Right I mean, now. there's a lot of great damps here. It's stopping the Scimitar from being useful, but it isn't stopping the damage, because the damage coming from drones and shorter range auto cannons. The Scimitar of uh, Draylar there is taking damage still. He's uh, hovering at about half shields. He's dropping below that, boosting up, but he's ASB tanking, so once he goes into reload, he might be in a bit of trouble. Yeah, I mean, the, the MIF still definitely have a shot to get back in this. If they can mm -hmm. get through that scimitar, then they can start clearing off other ships. Camel Empire need to get more ships down before that happens, because I think yep. inevitably, like you say, it's going to happen. They lost a worm there just a second ago, another worm in low shields, but the, the scimitar is managing to rep it, so doing a good job there and keeping up what they can, oh. buying time. So Draenor is outrunning a lot of the medium shield uh, or medium drones that are following him, but he's also outrunning his own team's medium shield bots. They've now got on top of him, so now he's going to be taking more damage, but also repping more, and we'll have to see whether that's enough to keep him alive. Right, it looks like he decided to let himself get within range of those drones. Well, it looks like uh, Apollo Balthar is slipping there, starting to take some damage. There's a web now on that scimitar. Mm -hmm. That's going to be serious trouble for him. Yep. Those uh, auto cannon Slepners are going to do a lot of damage. One of them, Corvin 1, is taking an awful lot of damage into low, very low shields. So it looks like uh, the Cam Empire did a quick switch of primary and just volley his shields there. That we'll could see be if he trouble. boosts. I'm not seeing any boosts from him. It looks like they may have been relying entirely on the scimitar. Always dangerous when you're up against damps because uh, the Slepner is dropping without getting any reps on him at all. Yeah, that's going to be an incredibly bad turn of events. And mm -hmm. there he goes. He's off the field. Camel Empire managed to squeeze out that. But they're not looking as convincing as you might expect here. I mean, I, I feel like there was a good long while there where MIF had a chance to get back in this match. Right now, that doesn't seem to be the case anymore. Another volley takes a good chunk of half the shields now for BSL Slepner down on the MIF side. Mm -hmm. and, and meanwhile, the worm, worm off the field. Well. Two worms yep. off the field. Okay. So the, the, the support war has been completely won now by Campbell Empire, really. Just a thrasher mm -hmm. on the field. One of the fly catchers on the Campbell Empire team is webbed down. But Slipner for BSL, low armor. There he did pull some shields back, so he has ASB fit. I don't know if Corvin just didn't, I don't know what. Didn't I mean, run it, maybe I'm not he sure. Yeah. Maybe he accidentally reloaded it, but uh, there we go. At Slipner, lower, lower armor even now. What did we lose there? A fly catcher. Fly, a fly catcher, catcher died. That one, one was wet. not a boundary violation. Even though he died fast, he actually died uh, to the damage that hit him. Uh, and we're seeing a Thrasher and a Slepner dying around the same time frame. It's really just Camel Empire yeah. cleaning up right now. As long as once that, the Slepner goes into reload, that's going to be over. The yeah. Scimitar still not landing reps on it. Camel Empire again demonstrating the power of these dams. We've seen these super damp teams, and another fly catcher drops off the field, uh, work very effectively. Um, in this case, they didn't actually reduce the damage incoming very much, but what they have done is effectively neutralize the Scimitar. The Scimitar has not been able to rep anyone because his lock range, I'm sure, is like 10 kilometers. Right, and the Slepner is now off the field. The Scimitar has a natively pretty short lock range to begin with, and they're really, really susceptible to damps. So that was a you know unfortunate thing for them to have to run into. Mm -hmm. Uh, you, you start to wonder with a setup like this where you have fast ships that are going to be running around and you're running a scimitar if you want to consider banning out damp ships. There were no yep. damp ships banned. And that's really the biggest weakness of a scimitar are damps. And if you're not set up to win that support war early, then you're going to wind up with no logi. And essentially that's what happened there. So uh, looks like the logi pilot on Camel Empire got a little bored through some reps up there on the Slipners are taking a little bit of damage. But from two Lorenzos, not going to do a whole lot. Meanwhile, Zero uh, One is uh, losing his shields, probably going to die shortly. Yeah, so. So Haxer in the Scimitar has decided his way around the damps is to like orbit the Gila at 500. Uh, he has gotten right into his teammate to get the reps on him, but even that actually is not going to be enough to save him at this point. Yeah, it looks like he, there we go. Finally got the reps. Maybe he's also scan. I don't know. Maybe he's scan res damped once they got close and he couldn't lock. But uh, 
Yeah, pulling back a little bit of shields is not going to be enough. There he goes. It's not be against all this DPS and the right. alpha, too. And the alpha, yeah. exactly. You're going to volley in between in between uh, cycles there and get him. So looks like the scimitar hacker, hacker is going to be the next target for Camel. Uh, and because he was right there, why not just switch yep. damage to him? He's at the same spot. He's moving pretty quick, though. It's going to be a little harder for the, uh, the Slipners to track with his mm -hmm. low signature radius, though they do have a target painter on him. There go his shields. He's going to get a boost or two off. There goes his armor. <laughs> not much of a boost. And yeah. there it is. So of course, one of the downsides of a team like this Camel Empire one is you don't have a lot of tackle. Uh, there isn't a lot of webs you can apply to your uh, the other team because all of your small ships are focused on uh, anti-support uh, light missiles and on damps across the board. Um, but obviously they're still able to apply the damage well enough. Um, they've spread out the Slepnirs pretty effectively, so these already Slepnirs are uh, keeping themselves at different angles to the target, which makes yep. it very hard for their opponents to get up transversal against them. Right, I mean somebody somewhere is going to be able to track you of the three. You, know, you can get transversal on one or two, but not all of them. Uh, half shields now for Dimitri Craig and Camel Empire uh, just cleaning up here in a, in a solid and convincing victory, not yep. an absolute wipe, but uh, they did a good job here. So uh, that'll drop MIF into the loser's bracket on a much tougher road, as we've said. Camel will continue in the winner's bracket. And Camel actually are lucky on the side of the bracket they're on comparatively... I, I think they have the easier run here. They, they don't face a, a PL or a Hydra. I mean, just looking at Ro Capel's run, because it's my team. Um, if they win this next match, they go up against Pandemic Legion. And if they win that match, then they go up against Hydra. <laughs> And it's like yeah. Camel wouldn't face one of those teams until the semifinal. So they're, they're in pretty good shape after this. They just, I mean, they have to keep, keep performing like this, and they're going to go a long way. And I mean, there is, are still a lot yeah. of tough teams in their bracket. They've got sure. Exodus or Tusker is the, the winner of that. Their next match against TNT. There is still some tough matches, but you're right. It's not quite the same as facing yeah. uh, the defending champions. PL and Hydra back to back. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so that is the end of the match. Camel Empire winning with a convincing victory, but of course losing five ships, which is going to drop them to like, yeah, like eighth, eighth place, place or something, or something yeah. like that. Jeez. Yeah, but well, I'm sure they'll get over it. And and uh, we'll send you back to the analysis desk. Okay. Align, align. The clock bomb, via, ragazzi, tutto, 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 e via il jump bridge. Do you like spaceships? Do you like explosions? Airwalk Media. We make your corporation look good. Welcome back to the desk. Joining me is Apothni, Elise Rantov, and Kill2. Uh, I myself and CCP Gargant. So, gentlemen, what did you think? Called it again. I'm two for two in the last couple matches. So, um, Camel took a, a basically the Hydra team. Lots of damps. They banned out the shield marauders, which would kind of screw their damps over. And um, they looked a little shaky. They weren't like boom headshotting everyone. But um, it was convincing to you me. You could still make a music video out of yeah, what just happened. I guess. Yeah, I guess. Yes. Yeah. They'll get there. Yep. Yeah. But uh, MIF took the, the Slepnir Gila core again. They didn't really look too comfortable with the setup. It's a setup that looks like they kind of borrowed or they said, hey, this looks really good. We're just going to take it and fly it. Um, Which is actually, it's worth mentioning, is perfectly valid. But I do agree with you. It, it requires not only that you copy the comp, but yeah. that you spend a lot of time with it. A lot yeah. of time. I think if they could run this match ten times, and then they would probably win eventually. Like, they'd get really good at it. Um, they had the chance to win, I should say. Um, the Worms did a really good tactic when the uh, Camel Scimitar was kind of kiting, going overload his micro warp drive, or overloading his micro warp drive, and outrunning the Gila drones. The uh, yeah, MIF uh, worms just kind of zoomed at the uh, scimitar and just like suicide tackled him. Uh, unfortunately, the healers had already pulled their drones at that point and were going on someone else. Uh, so the suicide was just pure suicide. It had no good things uh, coming out of it. But um, still, convincing win for Camel. Very. One of the things I like about this kind of new RT Slepner thing we're seeing become more and more popular is that if we look at medium RTs on um, Tranquility, for example, mm. Um, with the exception of the ever popularity, rupture fleets, kind of artilleries and, and projectiles in general are kind of in a bit of a lull. 
we've kind of got you know hybrids kind of reigning king with alongside drones so it's nice to see them being used you know, in a different settings seeing where you know they do have their advantages they're not just a weapon system you can forget about yeah that's a good point so like uh, on TQ there's a group called Black Legion they used to fly munins all the time and just blap 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 now they're kind of flying Ishtars um, for now but yeah you're right like it is neat to see uh, RDs and 720s having a, a place in the tournament. Um, that's one of the coolest things about the tournament is things that work on TQ don't really wor work too well in the tournament setting mm -hmm. and things that work in the tournament setting don't really work too well on TQ. Like if you ever had like a, a five-man gang going out with like a tinker setup, they get completely <laughs> trashed yeah. on TQ and like low sec. Um, so yeah, it is kind of fun in that regards. Yeah, we have to remember that. This is not actually what uh, TQ PvP looks yeah. like, but it's still great. It's a mm -hmm. great showcase for pilot skill and uh, the, the different synergy, synergy of comps. Yes, compo absolutely. Compositions that we can see. It's a great new way to have all these tools we have on Tranquility get used in, in a different way. Mm. Or used at all, in the case of artillery. <laughs> when you said when you look at uh, artillery on TQ, my first question was, what artillery on TQ? Because, yeah, Black Legion was really the last group I remember using those consistently. Do you really block love cool. their RT ruptures? Yeah. As do uh, Gimu, I think, use them quite a bit. No. Oh. So, well, there you go. Uh, the next match, we have two matches left, mm. and both of them are rather uh, big, should yes. we say. Yes. Uh, Road Capel versus Ministry of Inappropriate Footwork. Mm. Uh, and the last match of the day will be Pandemic Legion versus the Gorgon Empire. I think we're all, I think we're all pretty hyped for that match. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but the next match uh, shouldn't be left out. Like, right. we're, we're saving the best to last. Like, Rope Ministry is going to be a really cool match because they're both teams that do have like, good showings before, but again, they're not Hydra, they're not PL. Like, uh, Rope, known for heavy mutant teams, Ministry, doing um, a great showing this year, even if purely just by taking out waffles. Um, and then last year they had a great run as well. I mean, like Ministry, you know, they are a strong, scary team. Roque Capel, very history team, very strong as well. Like, I think we've got a very kind of close match in teams that are kind of roughly equally paired. So it should be really, really good, I think. Yeah, I think it is kind of interesting. I feel like Roque Capel and Footwork are crossing paths in a lot of ways, and that Roque Capel has a much longer history, but they're they're slowly, They've lost some members, and they're not as—they're not expected to do as well as they have been in previous tournaments. Quite frankly, um, footwork is kind of up and coming, so it's an interesting dynamic. I think footwork are the second best team at flying tinkers. Like, mm. I think they're better than Hydra at tinkers. They're better than Camel at tinkers. They're second only to PL in, in terms of tinkers, but that's sort of their downfall too. Because when you see footwork team, you know they're going to take a tinker. Mm. Yes, so the bands uh, have been out already, and Road Capel banned the Tenko and the Eos, and Ministry banned the Guardian and the Oneros. Oneros, let's say it all together. <laughs> oh, no, I, I think that uh, by banning an armor team, they're kind of trying to stop Road from bringing their kind of signature heavy muting. Because again, if you do bring a tinker, muting is one of the things that can really, really do a lot of damage to you if you screw up the tra cap transfers at all. If you've got heavy newts on the field, you can be in a lot of trouble. So I think that removing armor, mute ships are, are typically stronger in the armor. It is a pr pretty clever way of going about it. Um, still, I don't know. I, like, I don't know whose mind game is stronger here. Is Footwork trying to mind game Rote out of taking newts? Or is Rote trying to mind game Footwork into taking a Loki shield tinker, which is significantly worse? Uh, I think that that is pretty obvious that uh, at least that would have that effect on me. Yeah. Mm. If I'd see those bands come out and I, was, uh, I favored tinkers, uh, that would be the thought that came into my head. Yeah, so it'll be interesting to see what happens. The heal is still there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like both teams just let it yeah. slip through. We're gonna see a Gila two command ship core, guarantee it from someone. Uh, yeah. Probably Rhodes gonna take it, and if we're just guessing, I think Footwork will probably take like an armor Tinker team. That's what I expect. It's a good. That's what they used to uh, kill Waffles. They have that Proteus Tinker with VNIs and EOS. Yeah. Really, really strong. Well, the EOS is gone, but yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I really just hope somebody uses a mobile micro drone drive. That's yeah. that's what I'm after. I mean, you know, all but of the the mind games. Aside. That has been another another symbol of uh, 
of the winner's bracket. Nobody touches them. <laughs> yeah, I know, and I think we need to break that. They are dangerous. Somebody needs to step outside the box and say, look, we're here, and we're going to use mobile micro jump They drives. may literally go outside the box, though. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, wow, that was good. That is, the di that is the difficulty. We've seen more matches thrown because of these things, though, <laughs> than any other decisions. Yeah. That is true. But throwing matches is fun. It's good. It's great for the viewer. <laughs> throwing matches is fun. For us. Gonna, for us. Yeah, well, okay. Fair. Uh, I, I enjoy carnage and explosions and uh, decisions that might not seem tactically sound. Yeah. Like flying both of your logistics outside uh, the edge of glory. I mean, the game is pretty hard. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> the game is pretty hard. Yeah. Yeah. Eve Online e is e as e hard is not as... for casuals. <laughs> yeah, Eve Online is as hard as English. <laughs> it can be a little hard. Mm. Yeah. Fair. But, uh, Road Capel, have you on the new thing? I'm not certain. Maybe it's time for them to surprise everybody and bring something mm. that they've never brought before. Yeah, I, I mean, that's they're what definitely... I expect them to bring. Like that, that Gila slept near team. I think it's something that they's, they would have practiced. Um, and I think it's something they would have felt very comfortable with. And, uh, yeah, I mean, hardly anybody's used it at this point, yeah. so it would be a bit of a shock. Yeah, um, to slide yeah, under the radar. That, that's that what I mean, I guess, in terms of it being the new Slepnir Rush, and mm -hmm. that it's a comp that you have to understand so well, and you have to fly it so much to understand it, that you get to a point where when something does get banned out, like the Tengu, which mm -hmm. was, yeah, definitely don't want to get pushed in the Loki if you feel like that's <laughs> the trap. Mm -hmm. um, it's just the comp that comes to mind. You know, mm -hmm. while everybody's hovering over their hangar and says, oh, what should we fly? If you have the Gulas open, they're consistently good. The problem comes down to, can you win the support war? And mm. do you know what you're doing with piloting like the DPS hulls? So, so there's like sort of one sort of like tricky thing when it comes to the bans. Uh, you don't have that much time from when you ban to when you get in. Right. So like you can't really overthink it too much. Mm -hmm. You just go with your first gut instinct and then go. Yeah. What? What? I, I can't remember. Can you guys remember what the flagships are for each of these teams? Because that might be something that. You know, could, could Ooh, come into play. I'm pretty sure Road have a Balgorn. That's a Do safe they? bet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's what it is. I don't know what footwork has. Uh, yeah. That's something that we should uh, know. Maybe a rattlesnake. Ooh. I mean, that's not far from a safe bet with this year's tournament. But that would be yeah. smart. So we, smart. Yeah. We shouldn't be overthinking shit either. Uh, oh. <laughs> uh, so the match is ready and we're ready to go into the field. So your predictions, yeah. please. Mm. Uh, I'm going to go with footwork. They beat Waffles, therefore they can beat anyone. I mean, really. Yeah, that is true. Wow. I don't know. I'm 50-50 on this one. I'm not really confident in either team. I guess I'll go with Rote. Yeah, I, I still want to be friends with uh, Bach after this, so I'm going to go Rote. Yeah. Uh, I heard uh, somewhere, or read somewhere on the internet that shortening Rote Capel's name into Rote was like shortening, I don't know, the Gorgon Empire's name into The, so I'm going to go with Capel. <laughs> Let's see what happens. So, do we have any setups that aren't a tinker? Oh no, I bombed. You bombed us. So... I'm sorry guys. Welcome back, Space Sports fans. This is CCP Fozzie, joined by a very nervous Bacchanalian, and we have Rote Capel versus Ministry of Inappropriate Footwork. There are Lorenzos on the field, as expected, but they're actually with Ministry of Inappropriate Footwork, not with uh, Rote Capel, as some of our uh, uh, analysts had predicted. Uh, Rote Capel, why don't you tell us a bit about this Rote setup? Uh, back this is an interesting Rote setup. This is uh, actually not what I expected to see uh, from them. Uh, they were really discussing the heavy cap warfare stuff, and I guess last minute decided to get away from it. So we have two rattlesnakes. A Claymore, Basilisk, Triple Worm, Triple Harpy, Vigil, and Stiletto. So a huge support wing from mm -hmm. Rokapel. Lots of support frigates. 
But Ministry of Inappropriate Footwork has an answer to that. Yeah. So they've got uh, double Slepner, the uh, their auto cannon Slepner, Scimitar, double Gila, Celestuses, triple Heretic for killing those frigates, and triple Molluses. That's a lot of damps as well, and damps are bad for rattlesnakes. So we're going to have to see as the match begins now. Both teams came in at long range from fairly far apart beacons, so they are a long way from each other. And the initial damp war is won by Ministry of Inappropriate yeah, Footwork. straight away on the rattlesnakes, followed by mm -hmm. the Basilisk and Claymore. And uh, a target painter going down on the Heretic of Koreshkin, thinking that's going to be the first primary. But then the vigil gets damped, and now and it's immediate, gone. Yeah, immediately yeah. gone. So this is, I mean, Rokabel came in with one point. Maybe they just uh, run in circles and hope they don't lose a ship. I don't <laughs> so, uh, yeah, Rokabel is uh, playing it pretty cautiously movement-wise. They're pulling away from the center of the beacon uh, slowly, uh, kind of trying to keep themselves together. Uh, meanwhile, we've got the Ministry of Purpose Footwork team slowly moving towards the center. So neither team is trying to overcommit here. Uh, both teams are trying to be careful with how they spread out, but uh, they are uh, basically with that kind of formation. It's the right. uh, Ministry Appropriate guys moving in, trying to actually get the I kills. will say, having flown under Tyrus, actually, in the first New Eden Open, he's very, very conscious about ranges and positioning, and this is this is exactly kind of what I would expect from him. He's in a setup that relies on projecting damage, but he's facing a lot of damps, so he can't really project that damage. Meanwhile, he's facing a setup that has short-range damage, so don't be short range, you know. Let them come to you. Let them make a mistake. See what you can bait them into doing. And that seems what they're doing. Uh, Ministry of Inappropriate Footwork, meanwhile, just keeping damps on those rattlesnakes. They don't want to yep. deal with those cruise missiles. So what both teams have done here is they've picked a micro jump unit beacon <laughs> and decided to hover around that. Oh so dear. they have the option, if they decide to, to uh, bounce at 100 kilometers in any direction. Of course, since neither of these are the center beacon, it's very easy to go in the wrong direction and bounce out of the arena with these. So they have to be yeah. careful. There's no guarantee they're going to use it. Uh, um, the last time we saw two teams do this, it was... Uh, we waited until yeah, 10 minutes yes. passed. It was Noir and somebody, and yeah. it was just my eye bleeding match to watch. So uh, Noir and Scum, I believe. Yeah, yeah. and that, <laughs> uh, I think these two teams are experienced enough to know that that's bad for both of them, really. Um, yeah. It's not something that they're going to want to do. It's too unpredictable once you get that uh, deep into sped up time. Uh, so they're gonna, they would prefer to have the match get engaged earlier. And it looks like some of the um, footwork team are starting to drift toward the mm -hmm. Rokepel team. We have some of the smaller ships coming across across that field. So maybe they've decided uh, maybe time to commit. I don't know. Yeah, they've got some frigs in. The heretics uh, leading the way. They might try to use those heretics to blast through some frigs before the basilisk can wrap That's, you know, that's a lots dangerous, of on the bassy. dangerous thing to try to do. Mm -hmm. I mean, if because if the whole Rokepel team is sitting together, those heretics come into range of those uh, rattlesnakes and suddenly they're in trouble too. So mm -hmm. uh, we'll see what's happening. The heretic target painted is already getting reps. Just They, they expect that yeah. to happen. So uh, Damp's still on that vigil. They don't want those target painters. I mean, immediately the target it's smart. The vigil did, or someone with a painter now is a lock, though, because that heretic is uh, now painted. Uh, we don't see any drones dropped by oh, the uh, rattlesnakes coming yet. From the claymore. There's missiles coming from the claymore. It is a heavy missile fit, and one gecko, a lone gecko, is charging <laughs> across the field for Rogue Capel. I have a feeling they got, they didn't, haven't gotten the order to send drones in. That guy just sent him in early, and that's going to lose him a gecko. Oh, that's bad. What are you doing, guys? Come on. So yeah, the a gecko is in. It looks like he's coming after one of the. He was, uh, I don't see where the damage is applying yet, but he now is swarmed with light drones and uh, medium uh, drones. I mean, the good news is a gecko will take a long time to die. The bad news mm -hmm. is you're not costing footwork anything by yeah. giving them that gecko. He's right, going to pull so it the back. The gecko's pulling back, and actually, now this has kind of triggered the teams to come in a bit closer to each other. Now, uh, the uh, Rote team, the Claymore of Tyrus, the captain for Rote, is moving forward. He is well ahead of the rest of his team. Uh, he might be trying to get uh, some. Uh, tackle on an opponent. I'm not sure. The Claymore can pretty easily be used as a heavy tackler. Yeah, it's definitely a tanky ship. Definitely uh, can do that. It's pretty fast as well. But uh, then they, they both teams have kind of pulled back after that. So uh, the drones moved across the field, and now they're now the uh, road guys are shooting at the, M the Ministry of Inappropriate Footwork drones. And it's sure, why not? The gecko. There's something to shoot at, right? And uh, oh, and now there is they're charging in. So we're seeing Cryus in the uh, Heretic for a Ministry of Inappropriate Footwork charging across the field. He is swinging around to the other side of Tyrus's Claymore, and he is now target painted. So mm -hmm. it looks like they're going to try to apply some damage here. The drones going to come out, hopefully, hopefully. So there's isn't aren't drones heading towards him yet? The drones are still heading towards other drones, uh, but Cryus's heretic is, he do, he like dived in, looks like he was trying to get a lock on one of these frigs. Looks like he's uh, taking a tiny bit of damage. Yeah, took some heavy missile damage, but he's moving too fast for that to do too much to him, I think. Uh, they need to get the drones on him. There we go. So now there's augmented warriors and augmented hobgoblins coming after him, and we're going to have to see how well he tanks. Yeah, this is uh, almost five minutes gone. This mm -hmm. is one of these matches where you start to wonder if letting this much time go by is going to bite somebody Celestis in the butt afterwards. 
he got way ahead of the Ministry of Inappropriate Footwork team and is now being pounced on. So it looks like Ministry of Inappropriate Footwork got themselves out of position first with that Celestis. He got about like 10 kilometers ahead of the rest of his team. And, and the damage coming down. He is webbed. He is yep. NOS now. Uh, looks like he is going to be tackled, held, and the reps aren't keeping up. Maybe no, Rogue not is going to break through. These worms. There's this ton of damage in the worms at Harpies, and the Rogue Harpies were just waiting for a mistake like this. They saw the opening, they saw the Celestis coming in, and they dived on him. It's possible the Celestis might just be oh, basically a sacrificial armor is gone. Land, though. Because now there's now we have a worm taking the damage, down. fatal aid. Yep. Good to see him back. The Celestis is off the field first, blood for Rogue Capel. Worm taking some damage, but not substantial. Rorishino is managing to uh, keep keep reps on him. <laughs> I'm getting a little excited losing the my words is, here. The worm is going at full speed away from the battle now, trying to get some range. So and now a web on a heretic yeah. of Sirius Logic, so mm -hmm. Rogue Capel going on for their next target. Looks like the match has opened up here. Sakura Nihil now taking shield damage. So let's see if Ruri gets reps on him quickly enough. He's about to go into armor. Yep, the there come the The are now charging in, so now the Ministry of Appropriate Footwork Slapnears have decided to charge into the aid of their heretic. They're going to be within range to deal damage to these ships soon. Okay, so we'll see what their first primary yeah, is. Yeah, worm down for Sakura yep. Nihil, but a heretic goes with him, so it's a fairly good trade for Rote Capel. Mm -hmm. We'll see what they can turn their damage onto next. Interestingly, there's no damp supply to the Rattlesnakes right now. The only thing damped, in fact, is the Basilisk. So I think they're just trying to shut down the reps and not yep. allow reps, and here we go. Now a harp going down, too. the painter on the slap here, that's, that's going to be the new damage. primary. That's a big, big yep. problem. It's going to be big damage on him if those rattlesnakes can start putting damage and pounding on him. Mm -hmm. So... So we're going to have to see what those Slepners deal their damage to now. They're kind of moving across the field, uh, trying to get on top of targets, but uh, they're tackled by the Frigs. is it moving. Caliotrus is at zero MS. Mm -hmm. uh, it makes me wonder if Caliotrus is connected. Uh, that's uh, It's usually a sign of somebody who's not. I mean, just sitting there is really not a good thing. But and Ace Fire is getting reps, of the formation taking too. damage. Yeah, that's really scary for, for them. The Slepner of Ace Fire taking quite a bit of damage. Meanwhile, they seem to be holding the reps for now. But eventually, you got to imagine the ASB. He's got keeping up. Oh. Is, oh, the scimitar is now so webbed. Grim 996 is webbed. The Grim moved his scimitar in right up beside the slap near of Ace Fire. Got him right on top of him. I'm not sure if it was because of the damp pressure or what, but he got right in there and wrote, saw the opportunity, switched and right onto the scimitar. Meanwhile, Lucky CCS them. just died, but that's not going to matter. Another worm trading for a scimitar. It's mm -hmm. absolutely the worst thing footwork could have had this happen is a there. Great, great part. Like. Basically, stage <sighs> the match for Rogue Capel. They managed to take down the Scimitar. They're going to switch right back to Ace Fire's Slepner, Slepner take now. Him out. I guess maybe they're just ignoring the Slepner that's not moving. So, well, he's not a threat at the moment. Mm -hmm. Let's take down some of the other ships. No reason to put the damage into it. It does appear that this Slepner is probably disconnected. He's I mean, not, he's he not. Local? He's, he's out of the. Uh, he uh, will stay. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, he's, he's way away from the fight. Uh, he's not shooting anything. That's really uh, unfortunate. It looks like he's still in local, but hmm. uh, that may not necessarily mean anything. Maybe he just we'll froze up with yeah. that. Uh, Ace Fire now into armor. He He's still boosting it with his ASB. Another worm down a Rogue Capel, so three worms down, but Slepnir through armor into structure. Yep. ASB boost one more time, Calatris but it's not enough. is now moving. There so we maybe, go. Maybe, he was got his, maybe he logged back <laughs> in, got his machine working again, uh, yeah. but one way or another, it's a bad, bad place for them. The worms are now down off the field. There's webs on two harpies, but uh, with a Slepnir scimitar, Celestis and Heretic down, and now a Gila tackled immediately. Again, great work by these uh, Assault Frigs for Rogue Capel, getting webs on the secondaries immediately as soon as the team is ready yeah, to It looks like them. they have the Basilisk of Rui Hoshino webbed down mm -hmm. and taking quite a bit of damage, so they may actually break through him. It looks like they are going to, but I think it's too little too late. There's a minute 46 left in the in the match. There's yep. going to be 25 points for Ministry of Footwork. Uh, meanwhile, they're about to lose a Lorenzo. Stormwind Bloodfeather is tackled and through shields now into armor. Rui's still ASB boosting, so there goes the Lorenzo, yeah, yeah. and I yeah. think Rocapella Capella this pretty well if wrapped Caliatris up. If Caliatris there had been here for the whole match, this might have been a much closer match. Could I agree. gone the other way. Uh, this is definitely a team from Ministry of Appropriate Footwork that, other than the uh, slap you're not moving for half the fight, uh, flew it very well. They flew very cautiously. They uh, uh, got their damage onto the targets, uh, but uh, Road also performing extremely well. They managed to get that switch primaries at just the right times. Instead of getting tunnel vision on the slept near base fire, they switched to the scimitar when they yep. saw that it open up, saw a higher priority target. Uh, good target calling and good flying. Yeah, Rhodes going to lose another frigate here. It looks like Ripper Tag, the XCSM, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, that's really not going to matter at this point. They're just cleaning up. 55 seconds left, a substantial lead that slept near of Cali Trust probably going to go down. Maybe not. Not sure it really matters. They're not going to break through the two rattlesnakes into Claymore in yeah. the time they have left. So this so. is going to be a, a pretty convincing points victory for Rogue Capel, and uh, that means they are going to be uh, on to play the uh, winner of our next match, which is Pandemic Legion Gorgon Empire. That's a scary road still ahead of Rogue Capel, I, I'm not going to lie. But uh, Fifth Dimension now, Rogue Capel also going down. So Footwork still picking off some frigates, mm -hmm. but... Uh 
Uh, yeah, these footwork heretics, seconds. obviously, like once right. the Basilisk goes down, there's a lot that they can do. The heretics sure. are a great core for killing frigates. Uh, this team is uh, built around being able to uh, apply damage to small targets very effectively. The Healers, the Slepnirs, the heretics can all do Definitely. it. Definitely, and it really made me nervous. I mean, they did the right thing. If they tried to go into the support war, it would have been a really bloody exchange. Three worms, three harpies, you figure they probably take down the heretics, but you lose most of your frigates in the process yeah. of doing that. And instead, they opted to pull back wait for a mistake to happen. Mistakes were made and Roque Capel capitalized on them. So yep. the match is over. Congratulations to Roque Capel. Uh, very well executed and get a Slepner after time. Yeah, Calatris' uh, Slepner will be uh, reimbursed because it died after time and uh, Roque Capel with a uh, victory and will be moving on through the winner's bracket. Oh, so Ministry of Inappropriate Footwork is still in it. They're not eliminated. They're just going to be knocked into elimination right. brackets. So we later. can send it back to bring your son to work day. With day four, uh, that means that pretty much only the good teams and test alliance are left. Uh, test alliance, please ignore. Worst of the best. Delicious spaghetti you eat while waiting for a play to put its shiny board into a history. Some always let them jump and let the body hit the floor and that is how the room comes from. Welcome back to the Bridge of the Hyperion. I f hope you guys are ready. I'm I'm super excited. I'm, I'm super ready. excited. Super mega ready. <laughs> super mega ready. All right, let's talk a little bit about this match before we go on. Uh, Rod Capel showed that they are really really good at posturing. Should we say? Mm. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Like uh, the setup they took was so smart. Like it was super super smart. Really smart setup. Um, Ministry of Inappropriate Footwork. They didn't take a tinker like I s uh, assumed they would. And I think if they did take a tinker, they would have won. So, like, there were some crazy mind games going on in this whole thing. Rote was like, oh, you can't take a tinker. Maybe I want you to take a tinker. Oh, oh, oh. But nope. Uh, they took a kind of like the setup of the day, I guess. Um, though Footwork's modifications to the Slepnir, uh, Slepnir Helicor was actually really nice. They had the Celestis in there and the Mollusks in there. And they were doing really good for about five minutes of the match. Um, they had a disconnect. I don't think the disconnect played into p any part of it. But as soon as the uh, Celestis got out of position, as the commentators pointed out, just the worms just jumped in on him, ripped him apart, and the Celestis, it can't really tank. It, like, Shield Celestis doesn't tank any of that DPS, and it was just all down from there. And to, to the point about they were doing well for five minutes, there was really no damage that went out for five minutes, but mm -hmm. there was still a lot going on. Yeah, uh, that's the thing, like, all the positioning they did, you saw them go to the beacons, which is a pretty dangerous but clever move, I'd I was say. so excited, I was so excited. Uh, yeah, I don't think game. anyone actually blinked using the beacons, no. but they could have. No. Well, and I think you see that a lot with, with the other higher tier teams, is mm -hmm. that it's not necessarily instantaneous action. Most of the teams, I dare say, though you're better qualified for it, um, they don't like those setups which require them to immediately get right in the middle of everything and commit right off the bat. Mm -hmm. Um, you do land on grid and have time to discuss it, and these guys are, are really sharp, and they know their setups, but you still would like a little bit of time, a little bit of breathing room, because when you back up, it gives space for the other person to make a mistake, which is something that's been said several times today, and it's exactly what happened there. And uh, it wasn't a tremendous mistake, but it was a losing mistake. Yeah, so the Rattlesnake team that we saw, it's, uh, it's actually what won the Alliance tournament last year. Um, it's very, very good at punishing when a team gets out of position. So the ones that come in first and start running in first, the, those worms just go in, hold one down, maybe one slips by, and um, then, it, then it just gets ripped apart. Yeah, do you have anything to add to that? That was excellent. I, I mean, I just, on the analysis desk, I just kind of sit here and listen to Elise, and I feel like I, I'm at university and I should be like taking notes, <laughs> learning. Like, it's, 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 it's awesome being that, that next to you. It's a good thing that you're learning something here. So. I am. <laughs> so, I am. Next I'm glad up. you want me to work today. <laughs> <laughs> next up in this uh, 
roller coaster of a day mm. is uh, Pandemic Legion versus the Gorgon Empire. And I'm going to go straight into the bands. Uh, Pandemic Legion banned out the Scimitar and the Merlin, with uh, the Gorgon Empire taking out the Armageddon and Ishtar. All right. So here we are. Are we going to go through the same uh, grievous experience like last, last weekend? I don't know. Like, I don't, I'm going to have a heart attack if they do. Like, I don't want to die here. Like, there's a volcano. Don't let me die here, no. please. I, uh, please, no. Um, no, but I don't know. Gorgon Empire banning the Geddon Ishtar. That's sort of interesting. I don't think the Ishtar is all that great as we saw today, even though we did win some matches. Um, doesn't really give anything away for the Gorgon Empire side. PL is banning uh, Scimitar Merlin, was it? Yep. Um, okay, that's kind of weird, but whatever. <laughs> well, whatever. We can yeah. make it work. Yeah, I was going to ask, is that a style ban? Is there some inside joke we're not um, privy to? Or? I don't they think only so. need one. <laughs> Gorgon Empire and D Dark Side have historically used the uh, like damp Merlins, mm -hmm. and they're very good chips, but they can just be replaced by like a Kestrel or something. So, mm -hmm. I, I also know. I think they're also competing on an advertisement level. <laughs> Again, PL has a great history of player advertisements, you know, over several tournaments. Gorgon Empire kind of up and coming in the advertisement scene. Mm -hmm. um, it's pretty creepy, really yeah. creeps me out. Like I wake up in a cold sweat <laughs> thinking about a bowl of spaghetti. It's it's strange. So, I love that advert. I sing along every time. Right. So like you saw me singing along this time. I'm going to watch the match, but then immediately after, I'm going to hope to see the ads, mm -hmm. and that'll really sell me on, on how, how it turned mm -hmm. out. I'll I mean, let you do the PvP. I'll take care <laughs> of the spaghetti related advertising. That is so. good. I'm I bad with spaghetti. PL have had a rough road. Like each time, they, they fought someone kind of stronger, and each time, they've upped their game to kind of bring it and pull out the win, but it's been so close. It's been so dangerous. And I think that this is the point where it is make or break for PL. If PL screw up, if they hurt themselves and they have before, Dark Side combined with the Orgon are the team that can and will punish them horrifically. PL need to bring like their their reputation to full bear to win here. Yeah, I don't think PL will bring a slip near Healy team. Like I don't expect that to happen. I don't necessarily think Gorgon Empire will bring one of those either. Um, really? The Gorgon Empire team, even though healers are here, we're probably going to see a healer. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I'm going to say there's, there's going to yeah, be a there's a good chance. It's a great ship. Um, so, but, yeah, the, both the Gila and the, uh, the Rattlesnake are open. Mm -hmm. so, and PL have a flagship Rattlesnake, so even if it was banned, mm -hmm. they could still bring like a blinged out one. And uh, all of the components of a Tinker team are also open. So, uh, yeah. this is a wide I'm open sure. match. So, so I think it it's all the more exciting. Really, really dangerous to bring a Tinker against PL as their first match showed it. Like, PL invented the entire tactic. Um, they really know how to deconstruct it. They really know how to punish people who bring it. And, I don't know, PL haven't really liked Tinkers this year, it seems. Like, hmm. they haven't fielded any. I don't think they'll field any today. Maybe I'm wrong. Who knows? Hmm. We'll see. We'll see. Uh, but, like, in the other bands, we were able to kind of guess what we think were, was, would happen. Hmm. Um, with these bands, this doesn't give anything away. Yeah. So you can like rack your head about these bands for 20, 30 minutes and you won't have any insights on it. So I do think the Ishtar is interesting though because we saw even, I believe it was last weekend, uh, PL likes to break their comps down into a bunch of cruiser sized mm -hmm. hulls. Like yeah. They like bite sized pieces on the field. So I wonder if, although that Ishtar was Ishtar just, just, and just, just PVP, keep talking. This is it's just mesmerizing the water, right? though. Normally it just spontaneously appears. Yeah, well, Ishtar, it's really neat to note <laughs> that um, Ishtar has actually gotten nerfed in um, the last, between like week two and week three. Mm -hmm. Very good. Oh, Somebody's oh. messing around with the broadcast button. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I can, yeah. They were also mesmerized by the drinks, the magic <laughs> drinks. Yes. Yeah, yeah, probably, yeah. Someone was monkeying <laughs> oh, around no. with the control oh, board. No. Look at him go, look at him go. This is not going to end well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so this is what it's devolved into. <laughs> it has. Uh, yeah. I am still super excited, and I hope I'm you guys are too. I'm incredibly excited. Yeah. I think yeah. this is like the prize fight of the day. No offense to the other teams, and obviously, like, I'm incredibly biased here because PL's like my team. My heart's on the line here, and I don't want to. I don't want to yeah. have my heart broken. Yeah, the reigning champions in PL versus the Gorgon Empire. I'm not sure. Uh, as you mentioned before, the Gorgon Empire now consists of members of Dark Side, mm -hmm. the tournament team from previous years, and. Um, they are strong, so but I'm not sure what they're bringing by banning the Geddon, but they don't want Newt, or maybe they just I don't mean, like the... When it comes to banning the Geddon, my, my policy is, why not? 
Why not? Just ban I guess it. so. It's a pretty good utility ship. Like the newts are really strong. Well, it, it does fit anyone. into so many comps. And uh, it's not something that you can blend with anything. Mm -hmm. Now, like, hey guys, you want a Gila core? Let's uh, and yes, Gila, Gila. Uh, but we're gonna throw a Geddon in, you know, just to zest things up. It's it's not like that. It's definitely a comp that you have to plan around if you're gonna include yeah. that Geddon. But it applies well to so many situations. Um, you don't see the Geddon brought just to counter a tanker, you know. And with how few blaster rushes we see, it's not really counter to that either. So. It's kind of this interesting ship that's all about applying pressure, mm. and then the comp is actually about what follows. So I totally agree. You really have to know what you're doing when you ban the Geddon, and you also have to be very aware of your opponents, because the Geddon was the most chosen ship to be a flagship this year. So even if you ban the Geddon, it may very well still come. If you ban the Geddon and think, okay, they're not bringing a Geddon team, and you forgot to check what your opponent's flagship yeah. was, you will just be in a world of hurt. That's actually well, a really good point. When yeah. you're theory crafting a setup, like this isn't something that they would have done today, but mm. in the last month or something, if Gorgon Empire was theory crafting a setup, they would have to be hyper aware that, hey, if anything that we have is really, really vulnerable to damps, they could just have one that goes in. Yeah. I just got word that the match is ready, uh, so it's time for this Hyperion to fly off into space. I want to hear your predictions before, before it takes off. I think that PL lets players not in Sniggeredly or Habit on their team, so I'm going to go with Dark Side Gorgon Empire. I think PL is going to win, and it's going to be like a crazy setup that we haven't seen before. Uh, again, it's going to be really awkward if I don't say this, because he'll throw weird glances at me and makes yep. me uncomfortable. So I'm going to go Pandemic Legion of my own will, not because he told me to before this. And I just got purged. <laughs> yes, you did. <laughs> I'm going with PL as well, because... Uh, really? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Welcome back, everyone, to this much-anticipated final match of the day. This is Pandemic Legion versus the Gorgon Empire, which includes the former Dark Side members. So in a lot of ways, this is a rematch of PL getting knocked out of 89. This is CSP Fozzy and Back in Alien bringing you the match. PL has brought exactly what Elise said they probably wouldn't bring, a shield tinker with a golem and shield eoses, something that we haven't seen yet uh, in a tinker format. Um, <laughs> and then uh, Gorgon Empire, why don't you tell us a little bit about this setup, because it's pretty awesome. It is a really interesting setup. They have brought an artillery slept two Orthrus, three Cerberus, three Caracol, and three Slasher with uh, just rapid light missiles coming out of mm -hmm. every, well, you know what I'm saying. <laughs> that <laughs> is a lot of burst damage. It is a lot of burst damage. Yeah. The question is, do they have enough burst damage to break through the Tengu, break through the yep. MOA? What do they go through? Go for first? I'd say the MOA, um, because uh, the a lot of these uh, ships have uh, good kinetic resist, and your Serbs, of course, are going to be doing mostly kinetic damage. So uh, we'll see. The match has now begun. Of course, the uh, whole team from um, Gorgon came in at about uh, 20 kilometers, 30 kilometers, and they are s sending their drones in right away to start doing some damage. Uh, the goal Golem is actually a little ways away from the rest of the PLT. for an EOS. Yeah, I'm, I'm a little bit surprised. They, they might right through shields on a shield, shield EOS. Wow. Wow, that The artillery, I think, helped a lot. Man, that is, is he's losing armor. Caracol, wow. Sam, and Garino starting to lose shields in the meantime, but this if EOS, this EOS is low drops, armor. that's going to be links off the field, a bunch of damage off the field, a cap transfer off the field. That would be a huge loss for They're PL. about to lose Whoa. a Caracol, though, but that, that EOS. That EOS is going down. The he's EOS is breaking. Now. The EOS is breaking. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. That is that is half structure now. They got, that Caracol is going to drop, and I don't think that's enough Caracol's DPS. going to go down wrong. before the EOS, but I don't think it's going to be enough. Yeah, it's the, I'm sure that the tangle Ooh, of Linda Kwan there is overheating. A little, little bit more structure. Little bit more structure. Just EOS a sliver of structure. EOS is going down. He's in tiny amounts of structure. He's pulling back shield now. Miraculously pulled back all of his shields suddenly. <laughs> the EOS survived, or survived for now, with a grand total of 16% structure. 
I am amazed. All right, so at the moment, the wow. Cerberus is the primary for Pandemic Legion. They're using the um, cruise missiles from the Golem. They're using the uh, drones from the Rattlesnake and the, from the EOS and taking down the ship. We knew that this Gorgon team was going to wow. be one that was vulnerable to the DPS from the PL Tinker. The PL Tinker can definitely kill stuff in this setup. What, what, I'm amazed at how, A, how quickly the EOS went down. I actually didn't expect them to go down, especially with uh, Cerberus is doing all their kinetic damage uh, so quickly. But also that he somehow got saved at such a tiny sliver of structure. It's now the Tengu is the primary. Boy. So now Gorgon is taking what they have left. They know that this is basically their only hope. They need to break this Tengu. If they want to win this fight, they're taking big chunks out of it. They still have an artillery Slepner and they still have a bunch of rapid light ships. They're probably going to yeah. have to wait for a reload. Well, it looks like they're going for the Tengu now. They've started yep. to try to get through Linda Kwan and, and who knows. Another Caracal is going to mm -hmm. go down here, though. Uh, every ship that drops Peel gets a bigger advantage. I really yep. think they break that EOS, Gorgon Empire wins the match. They didn't break that EOS, and I just don't see that they're not going to... They're not going to regain an advantage mm -hmm. in this match. I mean, it's just not going to happen now. So uh, the uh, Gorgon Empire Slepner is doing the right thing and standing still, so he gets the uh, biggest hits yep. possible. The um, Rapid Light missile ships, or a lot of them, they got a ton of damage on the EOS, but now they've gone into reload, so they're going to be getting that done and then applying their damage probably to the Tengu again. It's possible they could break this Tengu with everyone together. It looks like that they um, yeah, they're uh, had another split Cerberus up. before that if happens. They can keep him alive. Yeah, they need to keep the DPS alive as long as possible until they get the reload and then try to burst through this Tengu fast. The rapid light oh. missiles have that burst damage advantage, Fafi but if they Wafi keep losing, is down. Oh, and that's the captain of Gorgon Empire too, so that could potentially be one of their main target callers. Um, and uh, with two Cerberuses and two Caracals off the field, it's a pretty big chunk of damage down. The Eos, they're going for him again because they know if they can get him into low shields, they could even just bleed just through the bleed damage. Bleed through yeah. absolutely. So he did pull back a little armor from somewhere, which is interesting. Uh, I'm not sure how that happened. He is pulling back some armor. I'm, I'm going to take a quick look and see. He has armor maintenance armor bots maintenance on him. Bots. So it looks like these are probably dual tanked Eoses. We saw that actually from the Eos in the Shadow Cartel match. PL's yeah. uh, last Eos that survived in just a sliver of structure at the end of the match had uh, armor plates as well as shield extenders. Another Caracal down. That Eos is I don't, it's not going to break. You know, I, yep. I, I think, God, they almost volleyed an Eos. Why not start off on the MOA? You're going to get the MOA down. I, it's just some points. I don't know. But Eos, I guess you want those links off the field, but oh If they could have killed that Eos, that would have won them the fight, I think. It's, it's pretty clear that with, with an EOS off the oh. field with that much damage, one of the uh, remote rappers, the links from the EOS, would have like would have been absolutely a massive, massive victory for them. Um, but uh, the EOS of Paik... Now, keep in mind, this is also... This is the same EOS pilot that survived in the sliver of structure in the Shadow Cartel match. So this is... I wonder if it's even the same EOS. <laughs> like, uh, it's just amazing. It's, it's heartbreaking for Gorgon Empire, who were that close. How many hit mm -hmm. points in structure does he have left? I'm curious. Exactly. Uh, so he, uh, he has 16%. So so whatever oh, you, you don't have the okay. No, I don't have the the number. The, the, the raw number on there. Oh well, with 16%. I'm sure someone in the stream chat mm -hmm. will figure that out yeah. and post it before too long. Uh -huh. But uh, yeah, that EOS is not going to die now, and it's just a matter of PL cleaning this up. Five minutes and 45 to go. They have plenty mm -hmm. of time to do that with no logistics on the Gorgon Empire side. It's just a matter of picking them apart. Yeah. So. Uh, so Gorgon Empire came in with a very bold setup. Um, Orthruses are a ship that we've actually been seeing a lot of good teams using. And a yeah. lot of the winners bracket teams have been using these ships, combining it with Cerberus's Caracals. That is a ton of rapid light missiles launchers. Uh, the Slepnir, wow. we kind of uh, poo-pooed the um, artillery Slepnir when we yeah. saw it on the field, but uh, it actually, it helped a lot, I think. It, it's possible the, the sustained damage from autocannons would have helped even more, but uh, I think that it probably surprised PL with the alpha added I to think that so. burst well, damage. I mean, that EOS lost shields before the Tango even got reps on it. It yeah. was already taking armor damage by the time you mm -hmm. saw shield reps land, and then it was a matter of that they were so far ahead that they were able to just volley through the rest of the armor, volley through the structure, mm -hmm. And we're probably one volley from yep. winning this fight. And that's just, oh, that's heartbreaking. Another Orthrus is going to go down for Gorgon Empire. Pandemic Legion has clung <laughs> to this. I mean, it's amazing. They, they haven't had right on a the convincing edge. win yet. I mean, this, this is, is pretty okay, convincing. This is pretty convincing. But it's also but it's so like, close to being the other way. It's, right. it, it was on a knife's edge, and then it swung very heavily towards and it's, PL. And that's what's yeah. happened. I mean, it did swing very heavily. But it, it's they haven't had a match yet where they just were completely 100% in control from the mm -hmm. get-go, which is what you would expect out of a Pandemic Legion. Out of a, out of a team of their caliber, you would not expect them to kind of look like they're struggling that yeah. much. And I, I really thought this was going to be a defining moment for PL, where they're either going to just you know, be the old PL we expect, or they were going to completely fall apart. They didn't either. Well, they <laughs> haven't had any easy opponents either. So, like, That's we true. shouldn't take anything. We shouldn't say, like, oh, this is the, it's because their opponents, like, were so terrible that, like, PL had to, like, stumble to be challenged against them. These right. are good teams. And Gorgon Empire, of course, is includes a lot of the members that knocked 
EPL out from their last run of a uh, string right. of tournament victories. Um, and uh, so this is not a team that anyone sh should be taking lightly. And of course, it's going to be a team that a lot of people are going to be afraid to face in the loser's bracket. Uh, another um, one of the harder teams yeah. that's going to be down there. Um, so we talked, or uh, the analysis guys talked a little bit about how uh, PL has a lot of experience with these Tinker teams. Uh, they're obviously a team that has used them very heavily in recent years. They actually didn't really invent them. The We've seen similar setups that, like even the version that had the uh, Tech 3 ship was mm -hmm. used by Agony before PL used it. Um, but like many things, PL uh, took it, uh, popularized it a bit more, and added a, a fancier name to it, right. and uh, then that stuck. Uh, and uh, um, this is a, a situation where they're actually innovating uh, quite a bit on the formula. Seeing the EOS with a shield tinker, but an obviously dual tank EOS. They've got armor, rep bots. Um, they almost definitely, we're not going to be able to find out because he didn't die, but almost definitely have plates on him as well so that he can sure. handle this alpha. Um, this is actually a pretty clever innovation on the tinker, something we haven't seen other teams do yet. Uh, and it'll be interesting to see whether that's something other teams start like practicing really hard this week if they make it through tomorrow to get ready for the final weekend. Yeah, I'm curious uh, what role the MOA really plays in that. I don't know, maybe something Elise can shed some light on, but it feels like they've got a bunch of really beefy ships that you know wouldn't die at Alpha, and then they got this MOA. So the MOA fits really well in the points, and probably has some remote assistance. So like he has the resist bonus. So like for that points, he's the sturdiest thing you can get. And then he's going to likely have some remote ECM and some remote sensor boosters right. to help I out the rest of the team. I'm using any of that, but I guess it's a matter of you he don't need really the remote need to right ECM, now. so save yeah. the cap. So um, that's but the I, that's thing. what I would expect this MOA sure. to be doing, which is another reason that uh, knocking him down is uh, going to be helpful. But uh, but yeah, it obviously actually not cap transferring though. No, it's. Uh, that's why I was wondering. I figured that's what he'd be doing. You know, it's one thing to, to point out, you know, I was saying that he's not running any of the remote stuff right now, but if Pandemic Legion doesn't need the remote ECCM, they don't need the remote sensor boosting, whatever it may be that he's trying to do, and Seamus isn't running those modules, so he's saving, it seems like, an insignificant amount of cap, but over the course of time, if you suddenly mm -hmm. need cap, suddenly get neutered, something like that, you want every last little shred of cap you can. So a good pilot even sometimes will, uh, in a situation where they don't expect to be taking damage, they're not even locked up by anybody, they may not even turn on their you know, you, you will conserve cap anywhere you can in a fight where it may be necessary, and that's just good practice and good piloting. So, yeah, the other thing is that because of our Crest API, um, we can look at the effects here, but also everything, every module you turn on, mm -hmm. that gets broadcast out that's to the world for them to see. Intel, sure. And so, if we don't know whether he, what he has is remote ECCM, remote sensor boosters, or both, uh, and now yeah. and neither does anyone else because he hasn't turned yep, them on. Makes it a lot fight. harder to reverse engineer the uh, mm -hmm. the setups, and that is something that I, I don't know. A lot of teams are using it. A lot, all the better teams that I've talked to, um, they're using that Crest data. They are picking it apart. They're going into the code behind it yep. to find out exactly what effects they see so they can reverse engineer the fits. I mean, I had I had uh, an ex-Alliance uh, member of mine who's doing that uh, send me, basically, I think it was the Footworks uh, Tinker setup. He sent me the exact uh, setup that they used. Didn't die, but he could figure out everything yep. that was active on there and down to like two modules. So it, it is another thing to mention, definitely. Yep. If you and don't activate it, no one knows you've got it. And it's important to note for all our viewers, it's this isn't a tool that's just useful for the ter like tournament pros. It's mm -hmm. also something Something that's fed into a lot of really great third-party tools, including yep. a website that everyone should know about if you're a fan of the tournament. Null-sec.com yep. has created a great 3D tournament viewer. You can look at all the bands, you can look at the setups that everyone brought, and you can watch the matches back uh, and with the ability to like actually look around and see where every ship yep. moves and watch every detail. It's a great, great tool, Absolutely. and I highly yes. recommend it. Well, with that, uh, congratulations to Pandemic Legion, who uh, stay in the winner's bracket, mm -hmm. and we'll move on to fight Roe Capel. Uh, Gorgon Empire will drop into a loser's bracket that is inc becoming increasingly tougher as the the tournament goes on, and uh, with that, we will sign out and pass you back over to the desk. A match to end the day. <laughs>
For a second there, I thought uh, you were about to. I may have died. You may have died. But yeah. I came back. I yeah. came back to life, just like Manny's uh, EOS. That's the second time that <laughs> Pig's EOS has survived in less than 20% structure and lived to tell the tale. I, uh, I saw all seven stages of grief on Elisa's face <laughs> within about 60 seconds. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, I just hear the word baited. And then I look <laughs> over. And he's smiling from ear to ear, and for wow. some reason I felt really bad. I don't know what it is, <laughs> but when you're happy, you exude this weird thing that makes the people near you unhappy. Yeah, I suck everyone's happiness out. Yeah, like, that's how yeah. happy I am. I'm so happy I broke my mic. Yeah, but, I noticed man, it. Man, that was, that was great. I mean, we can talk about the setup, but it was kind of great. <laughs> uh, it was really weird setup from PL. It's a, it's a tinker with a golem, so the golem is in bastion mode. It's really immune to, to damps which are a very popular thing in the tournament, PL hate dams. This time we did ban um, the dams, so we took a setup that was immune to dams. And it's very good damage projection across the entire arena. The rattlesnake, I don't know if it was our flag rattlesnake or not, but if it was, that thing can pump out like 1400 deeps. The golem does like 500 or something, but it's got crew, so it can hit everywhere. It's got bonus uh, painters and stuff, so it's good. We, uh, on a scale of one to Gucci, we Gucci. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I can't believe you've done this. The Gorgon Empire did bring a team that was, uh, it looked like it was a force to be reckoned with. And it was. Mm. It definitely was. And the thing is, it was piloted really competently. Yes. I mean, even something as simple as the Slepmere sitting perfectly still. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this is what I've been dealing with, by the way, and I feel like I've been dealing with it alone for the past, like, eight minutes. But, um, yeah, Gorgon Empire actually piloted really well. Mm. Uh, they were pretty patient. And they knew with no logistics, I mean, not even free Logi, that it was just a matter of time. If they didn't get that first ship, if they didn't get a ship before the reload hit, it was over. Um, they were talking about the, uh, the MOA being a good primary pick. You look at him and you say, oh, we could break him. I actually, I think that Yos was a really good pick. Um, it almost worked for them, which the word almost is not what you want to hear when you're in the yeah. loser's bracket. But um, they got so close, so, so close. And it would have been such a major blow to that tinker. Uh, whereas the MOA is going to have a healthy tank despite being T1 and it doesn't really add much and then you're forced into a reload before you go to that next target, which yeah, is a long I think time. the MOA actually has a better shield tank than EOS does because EOS isn't like... Depending on how he's fit, right. Yeah. I mean, you, you really, in a good tinker, obviously you emphasize resist over buffer. Mm -hmm. So he could get away with overheated hardeners and even though he might die and he probably would have died, it would have cost a 40 second reload off the RLMLs, which is just mm -hmm. crushing, especially if you have no Logi to sustain. So. To, I mean, credit to Gorgon on that. That was as good as could have been done, I think, with what they brought. Yeah. In fairness, it was a bit of a strange thing to bring with the rapid lights in my mind, but... Yeah, I was kind of mystified by their setup a little bit. They had two slashers, and I think if you replace those slashers with bursts, the forget Lodges, mm. maybe the setup's a little bit stronger. Um, because the, the Serbs and the Caracols and the Orthrus, they can like shoot pretty much all over the place. They're very fast. As long as they don't get damped, they're, they're really strong. You don't really need that suicide tackle in the slasher. But um, I guess Gorgon Empire, like, they, had, they needed it for something. I don't know. Mm. Mm. And it's uh, important to remember that the Gorgon Empire are not out. They're just into the elimination yes. bracket. Yeah, now. exactly. And we've got uh, two more matches in this round of winner's bracket, which will happen uh, tomorrow. Mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. first two matches that happen. Uh, we got Red versus Blue going up against Nelly Secunda. That'll That's be good. Be really great, I, always, I always love RVB matches. Yes, no they are yes. great. And the second match of the day will be CVA versus Hydra Lord. That's also going to be, gonna really be really awesome. Fun. That's yeah. going to be cool. CVA they, always bring a cool setup. Yeah. People always use the word wild card, and it's not wrong, but like CVA is a wild card. Yeah. They're so weird, but effectively weird. It's not quite like the Quebec, <laughs> like, let's see how many billions we can lose sorts of weird. It's like the. Forcing an FC to call a damnation primary. Who brings sort of three sacrilegious and three damnations? It, yeah. yeah, it's it's very like psychological warfare sort of weird, and so that that's going to be an awesome match. That'll yeah. be a really good way to wake up. It's a good up. way to start off the day. Yes, yes. Sure. Uh, we start again at two UTC time, which is uh, either around coffee time or uh, <laughs> really, really, really early. Right. But it'll be a Sunday morning, so waking up early and uh, maybe grabbing an ice cream will be great. That's. Uh, we don't do that in America. We, Only you here. should. You uh, really should. I mean, I'm not saying it's a bad practice. It's just, I don't know if any ice cream places open in America. I'm sorry, that wasn't relevant. But Starbucks is kind of like ice cream if you get an ice yeah, cream. Yeah, it is You are from Bourbon country, so... From Bourbon. Like, you usually yeah. start the day with that. It yeah. doesn't really matter uh, what the weather is here. We go out for ice cream. That they do. Yeah, they really do. So, uh, thank you for the first day of Studio 
weekend. This was day five of Alliance Tournament 12. Um, I am CCP Gargant. I will return here tomorrow at 2 p.m. UTC time. Uh, we have yet to decide who will be sitting with me. It all depends on how I like you, how much I like you. Like, I so I'll, I'll be the one pouring drinks. <laughs> Probably. Yeah. But uh, to everyone viewing, thank you. And I'll, we'll see you happy and alert tomorrow.